Section 1 of A History of the Great War Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued and The Great Sallies This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Paul Lawley-Jones A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan Chapter 53 the British Line in the West, February 8th to June 18th, 1916, Part 1 When the Imperial Crown Prince unleashed his attack on Verdun, one part of his purpose was to induce a British counter-offensive. Hence the German lines were not thinned elsewhere, least of all on the British front, where the chief danger was anticipated. The citadel on the Meuse soon became a maelstrom which sucked in all free strategic reserves and demanded the complete attention of the German staff. Elsewhere the war seemed to stand still, while the world watched the most heroic and skilful defence that history had known. Verdun was France's exclusive business, and her generals chose to hold the line there with their own troops, and to ask for no reinforcements from the British front. Kitchener at once offered British divisions for the Meurs, but Joffre gratefully declined them. Help, however, was given in another way. The British armies took over the whole line from Ypres to the Somme, and the French Tenth Army, which had held the line from Luz to a point south of Arras, was released for the main battleground. This was not the only contribution made by the Allies during that long struggle. On the 20th of April, a contingent of Russian troops, some 8,000 strong, landed at Marseille. They had been brought across Siberia, and then by sea from Dalny, by way of the Suez Canal. Their number could represent no great accession to the French field force, but their presence was a proof of the new attempt at a unification of command among all the Allies which was needed to give effect to their unity of purpose. To the spectator, it appeared that during the first half of 1916 the British army was stagnant in the West. The judgment was in error. Its duty was the hard one of waiting, long months of desultory trench fighting with no concerted movement, no great offensive purpose to quicken the spirit. It was a costly duty. Frequently the daily toll was over 1,000, and if we take only an average daily loss of 500, that gives a total in six months of 90,000 men. From it all there came, apparently, no military result of any consequence. The British army was neither attacking nor seriously on the defence, and those indeterminate weeks were, for officers and men, among the hardest to bear in the whole campaign. Apart from the steady normal bombardment, the main activities were mining, and the enterprises which were known as, quote, cutting out parties, end quote. Both had been going on all winter, but in the new year they became a formula and a habit. Their chief use was to keep the spirit of the offensive alive in our men, to harass the enemy, and to provide information as to the exact German dispositions. Everywhere from Ypres to the Somme such raids were attempted, and on the whole we, who were the initiators of the adventures, kept the lead in them but the Germans retaliated with various raids which, after their fashion, were more elaborately organised than ours. Mobile batteries toured along their front, and at different places opened a bombardment, under cover of which their infantry raided our front line and carried off prisoners. It was remarked that these attempts were specially common south of Arras. Places like Gomcourt, La Boiselle and Carnoy were frequently selected, as if the enemy had grown suspicious of that section of front which had never yet been the theatre of any great attack. The only serious fighting in the first half of the year took place in and around the Ypres salient. There was no new Battle of Ypres, as many expected, but there was a long-drawn struggle for certain points, which, in the total wastage, produced the results of a great action. In that ill-omened salient, the Germans held all the higher and better ground, and especially all the points which gave direct observation for artillery. Our trenches were for the most part in waterlogged flats, and when we reached dry ground we were, as a rule, 
command it from elevations in front and flank. Further, all our communications were at the mercy of the enemy's shell fire. The trouble began on the 8th of February, when the German guns opened a heavy bombardment, which endured for several days. On the 12th, early in the morning, an infantry attack was delivered at the extreme left of our line, near the point of junction with the French on the canal. Next day, the centre of interest moved to the other side of the salient. At Hooge, the Germans had sapped out, and linked up their sap heads into a connected line 150 yards from our front. On the 13th, their guns obliterated our front trenches. On the 14th, in the afternoon, the whole section was under an intense bombardment. A series of mines were exploded, and infantry attacks were launched against our positions at Hooge and at the north and south ends of Sanctuary Wood. They failed, being checked by our rifle and machine gun fire long before they reached their objective. Farther south, the enemy had better fortune. On the north bank of the Ypres Commune Canal was a ridge, 30 to 40 feet high, which owed its existence largely to the excavations for the channel. It was part of that horseshoe of shallow upland which separated the Ypres Basin from the Vale of Lys, and connected, in the south, with the ridge of Messine. This particular hillock was covered with trees and was held by both sides and to that eastern part of it over which our line passed, we gave the name of the Bluff. A bombardment on the afternoon of the 14th all but obliterated our trenches there, and the infantry rush which followed captured them and their continuation to the north, in all about 600 yards. It was an awkward piece of ground to lose, and after two fruitless attempts to recover it, we were compelled to sit down and wait for a better chance. The opportunity came on the 2nd of March, after the enemy had been in possession for 17 days. To the 3rd Division was entrusted the task of winning the ground back. For several days we bombarded steadily, and at 4.30 on the morning of the 2nd of March our infantry, wearing for the first time their new steel helmets, effected a complete surprise. They rushed the German trenches and found the enemy with bayonets unfixed, and many of them without rifles or equipment. The British right carried the bluff with ease. The centre pushed through the German front and took the third line, which they held long enough to enable the main ground to be consolidated. The left was delayed at first, but since those on its right could bring an enfilading fire to bear on the enemy, it presently was able to advance to its objective. At the end of the month, the British again attacked. The Ypres salient now represented a shallow semicircle, beginning in the north at Berzinga on the Ypres de Mood Canal and ending in the south at saint eloi At the latter point, a small German salient had encroached on our line to the depth of about 100 yards on a front of 600. It was resolved to get rid of this and straighten our front, the place being roughly defined by the crossroads south of saint eloi where the Messines and Warneton roads branched off. The first step was the exploding, on the 27th of March, of six large mines within the salient, a shock so colossal that it was felt in villages far behind the battleground. Half a minute later, the infantry, a brigade from the 1st Division, were racing across the open to the German trenches. Inside the salient, there was nothing but death and destruction, but machine guns were busy on the flanks, and the left of the attack did not reach its objective so that a way was left for the Germans to occupy one of the mine craters. The next few days were spent in repelling counterattacks and endeavouring to oust the enemy from the crater which he held. This was successfully accomplished on the 3rd of April, and we thus gained the whole of our original objective, the German first and second lines on a front of 600 yards. Then followed some weeks of confused and difficult fighting. The 3rd Division was relieved by the 2nd Canadian Division, whose task was to consolidate the ground won. Little of the work had been done. Little could have been done owing to the weariness of the troops which had made the attack, and the waterlogged soil, now churned into glutinous mire by the shelling and the mine explosions. The communication trenches had all been obliterated, and the German 2nd line beyond the crater, which we nominally held, had never been properly converted and was in any case practically destroyed by our own artillery fire. 
there was a very general doubt as to where exactly was the British front line, and where was the German. In such conditions it was not difficult for the enemy to push us out of his old second line. The Canadians, especially the 6th Brigade, were now holding isolated craters with no good communications between them. The near side of each crater was under direct enemy observation and constant fire, so that supplies and reliefs could only come up at night, and it was all but impossible to evacuate the wounded. At any one moment, it was difficult to say what craters were held, and this uncertainty led to mistakes in sending up reliefs and considerable losses. Meantime, an incessant bombardment went on, and some of the craters were reduced to mere mud holes in no man's land, incapable of being held by either side. The Canadians occupied a demolished and much inferior position against greatly superior artillery, with few chances of communication, and no cover for approach except the darkness of the night. The general result was that we found the gains of March the 27th and the 3rd of April untenable, and gradually loosened our hold on them. April and May saw various local attacks in the Ypres salient, at Luz and on the Vimy Ridge, and in June these scattered activities drew to a head in one section, as if to anticipate the great Allied offensive now looming in the near future. The place was once again the salient, that section of it from Hooge to the Ypres Comines Railway. It was held at the moment by the Canadians, the 3rd Division under Major General Mercer. South of Hooge lay the collection of broken tree trunks called Sanctuary Wood, then the flat watery fields around Zwartelen, where the household cavalry made their dismounted charge at the First Battle of Ypres. Then, just north of the Ypres Menin Railway, the mound which was famous as Hill 60. Behind, between the British front and Ypres, was the hamlet of Zelbeck, with its melancholy pond. The area of the attack was nearly two miles in width, and being the apex of a salient, the Germans were able to concentrate their fire from three sides. At nine o'clock on the morning of the 2nd of June, a bombardment was loosed on the British front trenches, and a barrage was placed over the whole hinterland. The infantry attack, in spite of heavy losses, had, by the evening, won the whole of our old first line on a front of a mile and three quarters, and during the night pushed through our centre towards Zelbeck to a depth of 700 yards. General Mercer was killed early in the day by shell fire, and General Williams of the 7th Canadian Brigade was wounded and made prisoner. At seven o'clock on the morning of the next day, the 3rd of June, the Canadians counterattacked. They pressed on most gallantly and won back much of the lost ground. But they could not stay in it, owing to the intensity of the German artillery fire, and they were compelled to fall back from most of that shell-swept area, which became a kind of extended no-man's land. For two days the battle was stationary, and then at midday on the 6th of June the German guns opened again, concentrating on the front south and north of the shattered village of Hooge. North of that place, they exploded a series of mines between three and four in the afternoon, and presently their infantry had penetrated our first-line trenches. This meant that the extreme point of the Ypres salient had been flattened in, that our front now ran behind what had once been Hooge village, and that the enemy had advanced as far as the Belloir de Brook. For a week, the battle declined to an intermittent bombardment, for infantry raids were impossible owing to the downpour of rain. Then, at 1.30 on the morning of the 13th of June, a fresh Canadian division, the first under Major General Curry, attacked on a front of 500 yards, extending from the south end of Sanctuary Wood to a point 1,000 yards north of Hill 60. They found that the enemy had not gone far in consolidating his gains, and they found, too, that our previous bombardments had done great execution. They occupied all his advance line, and regained their original front trenches in the most important part of the section, inflicting heavy losses. Such gains in the marshes of the salient were of little serious value, but they were a proof that the enemy could not take positions there in which he could abide. In spite of these episodes, the first half of 1916 was, for the British Field Army, a season of comparative quiet, a fortunate circumstance, for it enabled Haig to complete his command and perfect its training. Before midsummer, 
the total of the British army at home and abroad was nearly five million. The nation was so prone to self-criticism that few realised, and fewer admitted, the stupendous and unparalleled character of this military achievement. There had been nothing like it in the history of any nation. With the possible exception of France, Britain had mobilised for the direct and indirect purpose of war a larger proportion of her population than any belligerent country. Moreover, while engaged in also supplying her allies, she had furnished this vast levy with its necessary equipment. She had jettisoned all her old theories and calculations, and in a society which had not for a hundred years been called upon to make a great effort against any enemy, a society highly differentiated and industrialised, a society which lived by seaborne commerce, and so could not concentrate like certain other lands exclusively on military preparation, she had provided an army on the largest scale, and provided it out of next to nothing. She had to improvise officers and staff, auxiliary services, munitionment, everything. She had to do this in the face of an enemy already fully prepared. She had to do it, above all, at a time when war had become a desperately technical and scientific business, and improvisation was most difficult. It is impossible to assemble speedily hosts of spearmen and pikemen, but it seemed beyond human capacity to improvise men to use the bayonet and machine gun, the bomb and the rifle. But Britain had done it, and had done it for the most part by voluntary enlistment. It was easy to point out defects in her organisation. Some critics, notably Mr Churchill, argued that there was an undue proportion of ration strength to fighting strength, that half the total ration strength of the army was still at home, that of the half abroad, half fought and half did not fight. That of the half that fought, about three quarters were infantry in the trenches, on whom fell almost all the loss. That of every six men recruited at one end, only one infantry rifle appeared over the parapets at the other. And that some two million soldiers had never been under fire. Undoubtedly there was room for combing out, for the embusqué existed in the British as in other armies and the staff at home had grown to a preposterous size. But in modern war, with its intricate organisation, it was clear that an army must have a far greater proportion of men behind the line than in any former campaign. The apparatus was so vast that the operative point must seem small in contrast to the mechanism which produced it. Meantime, Haig was busy with the task for which he was qualified above almost all living soldiers, the training of troops. He had now received the balance of the new army divisions from home as well as various units released from Gallipoli, and to produce that homogeneity which is necessary in a field force, much thought and time had to be given to field training. The work was performed by the commander-in-chief and his generals with infinite care, enthusiasm and judgment. Quote, During the periods of relief, he wrote, all formations and especially the newly created ones are instructed and practised in all classes of the present and other phases of warfare. A large number of schools also exist for the instruction of individuals, especially in the use of theory of the less familiar weapons, such as bombs and grenades. There are schools for young staff officers and regimental officers, for candidates for commissions, etc. In short, every effort is made to take advantage of the closer contact with actual warfare and to put the finishing touches, often after actual experience in the trenches, to the training received at home. End quote. The British armies in the field during the first half of 1916 were one great training school. In these months, the mind of the High Command was facing a problem for the solution of which little data existed in past history. A great attack was in prospect, the greatest effort as yet made by the Allies in the campaign and it must be made with a new type of army. The old regular was a known quantity, the new soldier, representing every rank of life and variety of mind and temperament, was still to be assessed. He had physique, brains, energy and devotion, but he could not, in the nature of things, have that instinctive discipline which is the product only of years of service. Hence, the effect of the new battle conditions upon the morale of the fighting man became a question of extreme practical urgency. In the last resort, 
All wars depend upon the resisting power of five or six feet of shrinking human flesh. The men who fought at Marathon were not greatly different in physique and temperament from those who fought in Champagne and Poland. A pressure too great will overpower body and spirit, but whether it be produced by clouds of arrows, by the swords of the legionaries, or by the shells of great guns, it must at all times in history have been approximately the same in quantity. There is always a breaking point for the mortal soldier. End of chapter 53 part 1 End of section 1「Section 2 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 53. The British Line in the West, February 8th to June 18th, 1916, Part 2. The psychology of the fighting man in war had never as yet been made the subject of a professorial treatise. It was a work which might have been expected from the Teutonic genius, but it may be that the difficulty of making laboratory experiments stood in the way. Consequently, the task had been left to the romancers, who usually argued without data. But since mankind will always speculate upon a matter which so vitally concerns it, there was a variety of working rules which every soldier knew, but which he rarely formulated. The chief concerned the difficulty of sitting still under heavy fire. That was why the men in the support trenches which the enemy was shelling had a more difficult task than the attack. The chance of movement was a relief, and the fact that a definite job was before a man gave him something better to think about than expectations of a speedy decease. That was why, too, the officer, who had the problem of keeping his men together and getting them somewhere, was less likely to be troubled with nerves than the man whose business was merely to follow. To keep the mind engrossed was the great prophylactic against fear. The practical question was when the breaking point would be reached after what proportion of losses the defensive or the offensive would crumble. The question was really twofold, for the problem in defence was different in kind from the problem in attack. In the latter, to continue required a certain modicum of hope and mental energy. In the former, there need be no hope, but only a passive and fatalistic resistance. It was useless to speculate about the breaking point in a defence. Against savage enemies, when there was no hope of quarter, even ordinary troops would resist desperately. Again, if men from pride of honour or from any other cause were wholly resolved not to surrender, they would perish to the last man. There was no man left of the Spartans at Thermopylae, or Roland's paladins at Ronceval, or the steel circle of the Scots nobles at Flodden. Jakub and the defenders of the Black Flag were utterly destroyed at Omdurman. There were no survivors of that portion of the 3rd Canadian Brigade at the Second Battle of Ypres which held Saint-Julien. The men, too, who found themselves in the last extremity, and were supported by a shining faith, would wait on death as on a bridle. Gordon, in his last days, could write, quote, I would that all could look on death as a cheerful friend who takes us from a world of trial to our true home. End quote. Or in another mood, with the exaltation of the mystic on the threshold of immortality. Quote, Look at me now, with small armies to command and no cities to govern. I hope that death will set me free from pain, and that great armies will be given me, and that I shall have vast cities under my command. End quote. But in attack, the question of the breaking point was pertinent. After what losses would a unit lose its coherence and dissolve? The question, of course, only applied to corporate things like a company, a squadron or a battalion, which depend for their military effect on training and discipline. A surge of individuals vowed to death will perish to the last man. A rush of Ghazis, determined to enter paradise, 
will not cease so long as any are alive. Take the charge of Ali Wad Helu's horsemen against the left of MacDonald's brigade at Omdurman. Mr. Churchill has described it, quote, Many carrying no weapon in their hand, all urging their horses to their utmost speed, they rode unflinchingly to certain death. All were killed and fell as they entered the zone of fire. Three, twenty, fifty, two hundred, sixty, thirty, five, and one out beyond them all, a brown smear across the sandy plain. A few riderless horses alone broke through the ranks of the infantry. End quote. There was no rule for such berserker courage. The question was how far discipline would carry men who had no hankering for paradise. In the 18th century, it carried them very far. Those were the days of a rigid and elaborate drill, and a discipline observed with the punctiliousness of a ritual. It may have been inelastic and preposterous, and destined to go down before a less mechanical battle order, but it achieved miracles all the same. Military records from Blenheim to Jena are starred with examples of the most conspicuous fortitude. Napoleon and the armies of the Revolution largely upset the old regime, but they, too, could achieve the impossible, and the last charge of the French guard at Waterloo is among the classic feats of history. In the latter half of the 19th century, when human life began to be more highly valued, and philosophers looked forward to the decline of war, there was a tendency to underestimate the power of human endurance. Theorists took to fixing a maximum loss in attack beyond which civilized troops could not keep cohesion. The favorite figure was 25%. But as a matter of fact, this was exceeded in many contemporary instances, such as the charge of Pickett's Virginians at Gettysburg and Bredow's Toddenrit at Mar Tour, when, of the 7th Madgeburg cuirassiers, only 104 returned and of the 16th Lancers, only 90. This maximum, whatever justification it may have once possessed, ceased to have much meaning as the conditions of fighting changed, and it was altogether exploded by the performance of the Japanese at Port Arthur. The truth is that no such figures could mean much, for the power of a unit to advance after losses depended entirely upon circumstances. For one thing, a cavalry charge was different from an infantry attack. The swift, headlong movement of the former deadened consciousness and the faculty of introspection, and a mounted remnant might go on where foot soldiers would slacken. Again, much depended upon the casualties among the officers. Normally, if a high proportion of officers fell, the unit would go to pieces, even though its total losses were not extravagant. But even this rule had striking exceptions, such as the achievement of the 7th Gloucesters at Gallipoli, who fought from midday to sunset on the 8th of August without any officer, and the 19th London at Lewes, who, with their commissioned ranks practically out of action, carried out their part in the advance without a hitch. Again, the sense of winning, of being the spearhead of a successful thrust, might add to corporate discipline the complete fearlessness of the fanatic. The human spirit might be keyed up to such a point that each man acquired a separate purpose distinct from the purpose of his unit, and would go on, however badly his unit were mauled. The Ninth Black Watch at Luz, and more than one regiment in Champagne, provided instances where a battalion continued to advance successfully when it was little more than a company strong or pride in a glorious record might, in exceptional cases, inspire the wildest heroism, even when there was no hope of a victory, as was proved by the performance of Ermanov's Third Caucasians in their great fight at Yaswo in the retreat from the Dunayets. At first sight it seems safe to say that most modern conditions of war must weaken the nerve power for an attack. The shattering percussion of the great shells, the curtain of shrapnel, the malign chatter of the machine guns, the heavy fumes of high explosives, the deadly effect of trench mortars, and such extra tortures as gas, asphyxiating shells, and lacrimatory bombs, seem to make up an inferno too awful for man to endure. Besides, there was the maddening slowness of it all. In the old days, battles were over in a few hours or, at the most, a day. 
an attack succeeded or failed, but did not stretch into endless stages, each involving a new effort and, in the intervals, the grimmest discomfort. Much can be done if there is good hope that it will soon be over. But if the gain of one position only paved the way for an attack upon a second, the nervous tension would not be relieved by any such expectation. A man could not tell himself, quote, If I live through the next half hour, I will be safe. End quote. For he knew that even if he lived through the next half hour, there was every chance that he would fall five minutes later. A modern attack was of necessity lengthy, dogged, and sullen. Yet it was doubtful if this increase in the terror of war had lowered the breaking point. To meet it, modern armies seem to have attained an increase in nerve power. The explanation, perhaps, was that the carnival of violence carried with it its own cure. After a little experience of it, the senses and imagination were deadened. The soldier revised his outlook, and the new terror became part of the background, and so was half forgotten. If the tension at any one time lasted too long, the deadening might stop, and the tortured nerves be exposed again. But if the senses were once blunted, and no opportunity was given for that weakening when the wheel came full circle, the human soul would adapt itself to the strangest conditions. That seemed to be one moral of the campaign. There were certain prophylactics against fear. The bellicosity of the natural man stopped short at the modern apparatus of combat. No sane man was born with a love of shellfire, and few sane men have ever acquired a complete impassivity in face of it. Certainly not the best soldiers. The first fact to be recognised was that the ordinary man, however stout his patriotism, would want to run away. The confession of the New York private in the American Civil War was true of all wars and of the raw material of all armies. Quote, we heard all through the war that the army was eager to be led against the enemy. It must have been so, for truthful correspondents said so, and editors confirmed it. But when you come to hunt for this particular itch, it was always the next regiment that had it. The truth is, when bullets were whacking against tree trunks and solid shot are cracking skulls like eggshells, the consuming passion in the heart of the average man is to get out of the way. Between the physical fear of going forward and the moral fear of turning back, there is a predicament of exceptional awkwardness from which a hidden hole in the ground would be a wonderfully welcome outlet. End quote. The first safeguard against fear was the sense of community. That was the meaning of discipline, that the individual lost himself in the unit, that he acquired the instinct to act in a certain way, even when a fluttering heart and a shrinking body bade him refrain. The man who, with tight lips and a pale face, advanced and held his ground under fire, might be acting from a sense of duty or honour, but most commonly he was simply following an acquired instinct. But to give this instinct full play, there must be a sense of companionship, and this was apt to be lost if the individual were too isolated. That was why the Germans, who used open order in 1870, had so many stragglers, and consequently in later years tended to adopt mass formations, having to incorporate in their ranks many partially trained and unwilling elements. That was why a thin skirmishing line always demanded a fairly high degree of training. In any case, whatever the experience of the troops, to preserve the sense of community, it was necessary that they should have the consciousness that supports were not far off. They should be aware that behind them there were other troops to reinforce them, and to profit by their efforts. This precept was recognised in the disposition of the Roman legions, and it was one of Napoleon's chief maxims. We find it in the French regulations of 1875, which provided for renfort to fill up the gaps in the firing line, and soutien, who were meant to remain in the rear and produce a moral effect on the striking force. An officer of the 1870 war, quoted by Colonel Collin, wrote, quote, Every man should be able to see a little way behind him a body of troops which is following him and backing up his movements. He gets great confidence in that way, 
and will be brave far more readily. In several critical situations, I have heard the following reflection in the mouth of the men. There is no one behind us. The words circulated from one to another, anxious heads were turning back, almost inevitably, dash faded away. End quote. A second safeguard was action. Quote, Immobility, physical, moral and intellectual stagnation, surrender a man unreservedly to his emotions, whereas movement, work of any kind, tends to deliver him from them. End quote. Movement was not always possible, but whenever it could be permitted, it was a great security against fear. The Japanese knew this, and in the Manchurian War their speed of advance was amazing. The latter part of the 1870 war was fought by the French mainly with untrained troops, and whenever they did well, it was because they were taken forward at a brisk pace. If movement was out of the question, shooting was a relief even when it was ineffective. A famous student of the psychology of war has called it, quote, the safety valve of fear, end quote. But the greatest of all safeguards was simply custom. It was the end to which the other safeguards were ancillary. Human nature becomes case-hardened under the sternest trials. If troops were entered skillfully to the terrors of war, it was amazing what a protective sheath formed over the soldiers' nerves. A new battalion during its first day in the trenches might be restless and jumpy. In a week, it was at ease and most probably too callous to the risks of the business. All men employed in dangerous trades, fishermen, sailors, miners, railwaymen, have this happy faculty. It is a Western form of kismet, a belief that, till their hour comes, they are safe. If death at any moment may appear out of the void, it is useless to fuss about it, for nothing that they do can prevent it. Once this stoicism was attained, the men were seasoned. War, instead of being a season of horrid tremors, became a routine, even a dull routine. It seems strange to use the word dull in connection with so hazardous a game, but such was the fact. Seasoned troops adjusted themselves to their novel environment, and for one man who found it too nerve-wracking, ten would find it monotonous. With due preparation and careful treatment, it seems certain that even in modern war the breaking point could be postponed very far. The callous sheath, once it had formed, was hardy enough, but it was important to make sure that it was given a chance of forming. To use raw troops in a serious movement before they had been broken to war was to court disaster, and to be cruelly unfair to the troops themselves. And even with seasoned men, it had to be remembered that there was always a breaking point. Armies are delicate things, and the finer their temper, the more readily will they be ruined by clumsy handling. The best force in the world can be tried too high. A battalion which was left too long in, or returned too often to, a bad section of trench line was apt to lose heart. So with the use of troops in action. It was a mistake to send in a unit too often and at too short intervals, more especially if it was seriously depleted in strength. The vigour of the offensive departed, and at the best was replaced by the fatalism of the defensive. The matter had a special urgency in relation to the future offensive which occupied the minds of the Allies during the winter of 1915-16. It was becoming clear that every artillery preparation must be limited in range, and that troops which advanced too far under its cover would, sooner or later, be brought up against unbroken defences. The natural conclusion was that any advance must be by way of stages, the capture of one position by infantry, and then an artillery concentration against the next position, followed by a second infantry attack. But it was certain that troops which were checked in their first impetus and compelled to consolidate the ground won and beat off counterattacks, would be tried too high if, some days later, they were given the task of assaulting the next position. In such tactics we might at any moment stumble upon the breaking point. The remedy was, obviously, 
the use of fresh troops for each stage of the advance, a constant chain of reserves passing up for each movement. By such a method, every stage would have the advantage of a fresh impetus, and the supreme trial of modern war, recurrent efforts in which the spirit of the offensive must flag from sheer exhaustion, be avoided save in the last necessity. This note would be incomplete without a reference to that high and sublimated battle spirit which is rare at the best of times, but in all armies is possessed by the fortunate few. Joy of battle is a phrase too lightly used, and may well seem to most men a grim misnomer. Yet it is a reality, a thing which comes not from the deadening of feeling, but from its quickening and transmutation. It belongs especially to youth, which finds in the colossal hazards of war an enlarged vitality. It is not pugnacity, for there is no rancour in it. The happy warrior fights not because he has much to hate, but because he has much to love. The true type is the minstrel Volker of Alsace, in the Lay of the Nibelung, whose weapon was a sword fiddle-bow. Every blow he struck went home, but every blow was also a note of music. Such souls have won not relief only, but joy, not merely serenity, but exultation. The glory of life is never felt more keenly than when the next moment may see it quenched, for the greatest of its glories is to be armed and mailed for the fray. In the ascending scale of battle tempers, we may place first acquiescence, then peace, and last this positive glow and welcome. It found perfect expression in the verses which Captain Julian Grenfell wrote before his death at the Second Ypres, when spring was flushing the Flanders meadows, verses which may well come to be regarded as the chief of the war's bequests to poetry. On the 18th of June, the younger Molka died, at the age of 68. As chief of the German staff at the opening of the war, he had been responsible for taking from its pigeonhole the famous plan which Germany had been working at for so many years. That plan failed utterly at the Marne and Ypres, and Moltke was succeeded by the younger and abler Falkenhayn, to whom fell the difficult task of revising the whole German scheme and organising his country for that war of endurance of which she had never dreamed. The death of this bearer of a famous name, an exponent of the traditional German strategy, had at the moment a dramatic significance. It marked the end of the long second stage of the war in the West, the stage in which Germany had held her lines by virtue of a superior machine. For while the Canadians were struggling at Ypres for a few hundred yards of swamp, and the tide of the assault at Verdun was breaking on the bastion of the French defence, in Picardy the Allied guns were massing, and the great armies were making ready for an implacable offensive. End of chapter 53. End of section 2. Section 3 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook A History of the Great War, Volume 3 By John Buchan Chapter 54 The Political Situation February 10th to June 24th, 1916 Part 1 During the early months of 1916, there was a more optimistic temper abroad in the West than had been known since the preceding spring. Even the fall of Cut had failed to shake this composure, perhaps because the disasters of the second half of 1915 had driven most men to write off from the Allied assets the various divergent operations in the East. The desperation of Germany's offensives, her boasting, so loud that it suggested an uneasy mind, her summons to her opponents to look at the map and admit her victory, seemed to argue some loss of grip on the situation. Public cheerfulness was increased by the superb French dad of Verdun. Here was a case of Germany using all her peculiar strength on one narrow section and failing to force it. Her losses 
even in the eyes of the most skeptical, were not far short of those of the defense. If the mighty machine which had blown up the Russian front and the Donajets a year before could do no better than this, it looked as if its days were numbered. The Allies were now on a level with their enemy in materiel, and they had the greater total number of men. They believed that the fighting quality of their infantry was at least as good, and it appeared that they had the saner strategical plan. Part of the restored confidence, in Britain at any rate, was due to a better feeling towards the much-criticized civil government. The cabinet had taken certain steps, long overdue, towards making the nation a true partner in the war. Policy, so far as it concerned the blockade, the war in the air, and the conduct of the navy, had been debated frankly in Parliament, and criticism, since it was given a fair outlet, lost its danger and gained in practical value. The passing of the new Military Service Act had satisfied the national conscience, though it was clear that its imperfections would have to be remedied by a more comprehensive measure. The worst difficulties with labor seemed to be over, and, broadly speaking, the mind of the nation was occupied with certain definite points of administrative reform rather than with a general feeling of satiety towards its governors. Critics, to be sure, remained who pounced upon the foibles of politicians and pleaded for a clean sweep. Their devotion to some strong, simple savior of his country made them dredge deep in political and non-political life to find their ideal. But such an attitude was in reality a form of mysticism, analogous to the old quest for a panacea. It was a mood of imaginative rhetoric rather than of common sense. In the name of practical politics, they sought something which was notably unpractical. For the man of destiny is the gift of God, and is not to be found by painful seeking. When he comes, it is silently and without advertisement, and his own people commonly know him not. So far as the fighting services were concerned, the nation at large looked with composure and confidence on the admirals at sea and the generals in the field. It recognized the staff work had, at last, been rated at its proper value, and the stalwart figure of Sir William Robertson was a guarantee that empiricism should no more rule our general strategy. But it was also becoming widely felt that staff work was necessary, too, for civilian administration, and was especially needful for those intricate problems which would face the country at the conclusion of peace. The principles with which the war had been entered upon were still unshaken in esteem. Clamorous events had not yet called for revision of war ideals. The interest of the Allies was still centered upon practical needs, but they now envisaged these needs as extending beyond hostilities. One section in Britain seemed to hold the schoolboy view that all that was required was to give Germany a beating, shake hands, and live happily with her ever afterwards. That was not the view of those most familiar with German methods, and it was certainly not the view of the French. They knew that Germany would never be so dangerous as in that period of apparent acquiescence produced by her defeat, and that much that was gained by war might be lost to the Allies in the first twelve months after peace. It was known that she had made far-reaching plans after her patient fashion, to meet the financial, economic, and political difficulties that would confront her, and it was very certain that Britain, absorbed in departmental activities, had no scheme to counter these. Lord Haldane raised the question in the House of Lords, and the Prime Minister promised that a peace book, on the analogy of the war book of a general staff, would be prepared but no adequate machinery was provided for its preparation. And if the matter was to be left to the odd man and the scanty leisure of the various departments, it was clear that the result would be farcical. There was a real national anxiety that our unreadiness for war should not be matched by a like unreadiness for peace. 
a certain impulse in the direction of forethought and organization was given by the visit of mr hughes the prime minister of the australian commonwealth and the most prominent leader of labor in the empire in a series of speeches he warned his countrymen to take heed that what was won by the valor of the fleets and armies did not slip from slack civilian hands the warning was opportune and effective for this was a fresh voice speaking an honest message very different from the plangent commonplaces of its later manner Britain was weary of the kind of thinking which is done only under the goad of an unlooked-for necessity. The coming into operation of the Military Service Act on February 10, 1916, did not end the recruiting difficulties. The work of granting exemptions lay with the local tribunals, and they showed a wide latitude in the interpretation of their duties. In some rural districts, the able-bodied sons of farmers suddenly appeared as shepherds and cowmen, demanding and receiving exemption. The War Office was compelled to press for revision of the list of reserved occupations, and new instructions had to be issued to the tribunals. There was trouble, too, with that typical British product, the conscientious objector. Logically, his position was impossible. He claimed the rights and declined the most urgent duty, of citizenship, and chose, in effect, to declare himself an outlaw from the commonweal. Repugnance to military service was to be expected for many, but in order to provide a respectable cloak for such shrinking, the obscure side chapels of religion and politics suddenly found their votaries many times multiplied. It was no easy task to separate from such claimants the bona fide objectors and the charlatans and blunders and hardships were inevitable. The brazen shirker often emerged triumphant, while the man of honest, if invalidish, conscience was penalized. The thing was presently to become a scandal, which, because it affected the very few, was unrealized by the nation. The genuine conscientious objector was, in many cases, denied even his legal rights, and a number of sincere and honorable, if abnormal, beings were subjected to a persecution which could be justified on no conceivable grounds of law, ethics, or public policy. But at the moment, the main trouble arose from the position of the married men, who had registered in the Darby scheme under the impression that no married man would be called up so long as any single man remained unattested. In the rush and confusion of that campaign, which had something of the old electioneering business about it, wild promises had been made by canvassers which now recoiled on the government's head. Lord Darby was justified in claiming that his pledge to the married men had been strictly fulfilled. The Military Service Act had been passed to bring in the single men, and the married men who had tested had done so with full knowledge that they would be called up. But it was difficult for a married man to see hordes of the single creeping into reserved occupations, while he, owing to his patriotism, was being put to a serious economic loss. The discontent became so grave that the calling up of the married groups was postponed, and the cabinet was forced to find some other way out of the difficulty. There was the further fact that even the Military Service Act would scarcely provide the numbers needed to raise our field force to the desired level and to keep it there. The military authorities furnished a note of their requirements and declined to depart from it. There was obviously no way of getting rid of the practical injustice caused by the various tentatives of the past months except by an impartial conscription of all men of military age, whether married or single. But the cabinet was slow to come to this decision. They agreed upon a scheme of contingent compulsion, which meant that if after certain periods sufficient men were not recruited by ordinary enlistment, Parliament would be asked for compulsory powers. They also proposed to prolong the service of time-expired men till the end of the war, to bring all youths under the Military Service Act as soon as they reached the age of 18, 
and to transfer men enlisted for territorial battalions to any unit where they might be needed. At a two days secret session of the House of Commons, these projects were submitted, and confidential information was given to members as to the exact military requirements of the nation. But when, on 22nd April, leave to introduce the bill was asked for, the scheme was promptly rejected. The Labour members themselves disowned it as unjust and feeble, and demanded, now that the necessity had arisen, the straight course of equal sacrifice. On 3rd May, the Prime Minister introduced a bill to extend, as from 24th June, the provisions of the Military Service Act to all unattested married men. From that date, every male British subject ordinarily resident in Great Britain, and between the ages of 18 and 41, was to be deemed duly enlisted in the regular army for the duration of the war. The third reading of the bill was carried by a majority of 250 to 35, and received the royal assent on 25th May. In a message issued on that day, the king expressed to his people his recognition of the patriotism and self-sacrifice which had raised already by voluntary enlistments no less than 5,041,000 men, Quote, an effort far surpassing that of any other nation in similar circumstances recorded in history, and one to which will be a lasting source of pride to future generations, End quote. Voluntary enlistment had, indeed, done marvels, and it was well that the world should have seen so notable a proof of the British temper. But its work was done, and, unless endless hardships were to be caused, it must be replaced by a different system. The long controversy was over, conscription was the law of the land, and the sum total of British manhood was at the disposal of the state. Moreover, the revolution was wholehearted, and met with only the slenderest opposition. Such a change, it was probable, could not have been wrought by any sweeping or heroic measures in the early days of the war. It needed time for opinion to ripen, and the necessities of the case to force themselves upon the public mind. But it is very certain that the country was ready for the step long before the cabinet had screwed up its courage. In this matter, the leaders lagged behind their followers in nerve and seriousness. The people of Britain surrendered what some chose to call their birthright, voluntarism, not because the government demanded the sacrifice, but because they forced it on the government. Had the rulers been a little closer to the nation, many heartbreaking delays would have been saved, and much needless waste in money and men. The budget, which was introduced by the British Chancellor of the Exchequer on 4th April, was mainly an increase in existing taxes, a series of fresh cuts from the old joints. The expenditure for the year 1915-16 had been 1,559 millions, 31 millions less than the estimate. The revenue was 337 millions, 32 millions in excess of the estimate. This left a deficit of 1,022 millions, which had been made good for the present by the various war loans, the sale of exchequer bonds and treasury bills, and the Anglo-French American loan. For the coming year, Mr. McKenna estimated the total expenditures at 1,825 millions the total revenue at 502 millions, leaving a deficit to be met by borrowing of 1,325 millions. The new taxes included an impost on tickets of admission to various amusements and taxes on matches and mineral waters. The rate of income tax for earned and unearned incomes was increased, the duties on sugar, cocoa, and coffee were raised, and the excess profits tax was advanced from 50% to 60%. This enlarged taxation was boldly, but not very scientifically conceived, since it laid too great a share of the extra burden on the professional and middle classes. There was justice in the complaint that 
more of the revenue might have been raised by indirect taxation. But a time of war allows small leisure for fiscal reform, and statesmen not unnaturally tend to follow what, for the moment, is the line of least resistance. The Chancellor of the Exchequer permitted himself a forecast of the situation at the end of 1916-17. Our permanent revenue, leaving out the temporary yield of the excess profits tax, would then be 423 millions. Our total indebtedness, 3,440 millions, which, deducting the 800 millions advanced to the Allies and Dominions, left a net debt of 2,640 millions. Allowing for a sinking fund, this meant an annual debt charge of 145 millions. These enormous sums dazzled the eyes of the ordinary man and left him giddy. It was impossible to base any reasoned view of the financial position on figures which so far transcended all past experience and calculation. But it was none the less true that, in comparison with former crises, and taking into account the total wealth and earning capacity of the nation, the colossal expenditure was still within our means. We were conducting our war finance generally on sound principles. While Germany proposed to raise, at the outside, 24 millions by special taxation, we had obtained from the same source, in the first 20 months of war, over 146 millions, and in 1916-17 we were raising over 300 millions. Our system of credit had stood the unparalleled strain, and our banking methods were vindicated beyond question in the eyes of the most querulous critic. The balance against us in foreign trade remained our chief difficulty, but we had done something in the past year to adjust it. One remarkable phenomenon was the revival of our export trade. In spite of the fact that our internal industries were being carried on with less than half of their normal manpower, the economic position of Britain, when it was remembered to how large an extent she bore also the burdens of her allies, was in many ways not the least of the surprises of the war. The student who turned to Germany found a very different state of affairs. Her pre-war organization had made her financial problems simple, but nothing could make the simplicity sound. Her four ingeniously manipulated loans had raised a large sum on paper, but she had provided scarcely any additional annual revenue to meet the enormous debt charge. She had increased her paper circulation by over 700 millions, while Britain had only found it necessary to increase hers by 100 millions. She was importing from neutrals, but she had few exports with which to pay for imports. The decline in the value of the mark in neutral markets, an average depreciation of 29%, showed that her industrial output was shrinking as more and more men were taken for the field. The German Minister of Finance, Dr. Helferich, made a speech in the Reichstag on 16th March in which he endeavored to justify German methods. He took credit that his country had not imitated the British practice of new taxation, but had followed the principles of orderly imperial housekeeping, whatever these might be. But in the next breath he pleaded for new taxes, since we cannot demand or accept millions from a people which for the fourth time in ardent patriotism and confidence offers its savings to the empire unless we assure the due payment of interest. On this it might have been observed that the amount of new taxation proposed did not come within measurable distance of paying that interest. He criticized the British fashion of short-term debts, which he estimated at nearly 750 millions, including in this sum exchequer bonds, which had a five-year currency, as well as the American loan. But Germany's own short-term debt at the end of February exceeded 800 millions. Moreover, the British system of continuous loans by bill or bond was a sound one. It represented a real subscription of existing funds whereas the big German long-term loan was largely a creation of artificial bank credits. Finally, he boasted, that Germany was only spending half the sum that Britain spent daily on the war. 
In 1916, our daily expenditure was close on five millions, that of France about two and a half millions, that of Russia just over three millions, and that of Italy something under one million. But he omitted to mention the fact that the British figures included separation allowances and loans to the Allies, which the German did not, and these items between them came to a little less than one and a half millions per day. Germany had to carry Austria, Bulgaria, and Turkey on her shoulders, and it was probable that her daily outlay, direct and indirect, was nearly equal to that of Britain. End of chapter 41 Part 1《Section 4 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 54, The Political Situation, February 10th to June 24th, 1916, Part 2. The spring months of 1916 saw changes in the personnel of various governments. In Russia, Paul Ivanov, whose liberal views offended the autocracy, was succeeded as Minister of War by General Shuviev. Mr. Goromikin, the Premier, resigned, and his place was filled by a comparatively unknown man, Mr. Boris Sturmer. The Duma was reopened by the Emperor on 22nd February after its long prorogation, and the occasion was remarkable for a review of the situation in foreign affairs by Mr. Sazanov, and eloquent expressions of the national resolution by the President, Mr. Rodzianko, and the new Prime Minister. In these speeches, an appeal was made to the different schools of politics to let disputable questions of internal reform sleep for the moment and close their ranks against the common enemy. But there was something academic in the eloquence. National unity was spoken of as a thing substantially in existence, and national strength as that which might be impaired but could never be broken. There were few to read the omens right and to dread, like Napoleon, the crows around the Kremlin. In France, Gallieni was compelled by ill health to leave the Ministry of War. On 27th May he died, and was mourned by his country as Britain had mourned for Lord Roberts. He was preeminently the veteran soldier of France, whose career made a continuous link between her deepest humiliation and her greatest glory. He had fought in the War of 1870, and as the maker of French West Africa, Tonkin, and Madagascar, had won high honor during the decades before 1914. When the great struggle came, his health kept him back from the actual battlefront, but as governor of Paris in that hectic first week of September 1914, he had done much to make possible the victory of the Marne, and his grave and single-hearted courage had been an inspiration to his people. In the early part of March, there had been remarkable changes at the German Marineamt. Tirpitz resigned on the nominal plea of ill health and was succeeded by his former subordinate, Admiral von Capel. The news caused a sensation, not only throughout the rest of Europe, but in Germany itself. To the ordinary German, Tirpitz was the author and conductor of that submarine campaign which atoned in the popular mind for the inertia of the high sea fleet and the exponent of that ruthlessness in maritime warfare which must some day shatter the naval pride of Britain. The reason for his fall was the character of the man. He was obstinate and short-sighted, a hopeless colleague for a politique like the imperial chancellor. He was a confirmed intriguer and like some distinguished sailors elsewhere, had at his bidding an obedient clack of journalists. As the situation with America grew more difficult and delicate, it was clearly impossible to have so reckless and headstrong an administrator at the head of the most controversial department in the service. The fall of Tirpitz 
was a triumph for the more cautious Beth Menhalweg. But as has happened before in history, while the minister went, his policy remained. The importance of submarine ruthlessness was so deeply set in the popular mind that the government dared not slacken in their efforts. Two Dutch liners, the Tubantia and the Palembang, were torpedoed without warning. Finally, on 24th March came, as we have already seen, one of the most flagrant outrages in the history of the war, the sinking by a submarine of the channel steamer Sussex. A number of American citizens were among the victims, and Washington asked Berlin for explanations. The German government replied by casting doubt upon the origin of the disaster, a doubt which America was soon in a position by indisputable evidence to dispel. On 19th April, President Wilson made a speech in Congress which trenchantly indicted the whole German policy of submarine warfare. He returned to the thesis laid down in the first Lusitania note, and since then overlaid by special pleas that the submarine was not an admissible weapon for commerce destruction. It was, quote, grossly evident that warfare of such a sort, if warfare it be, cannot be carried on without the most palpable violation of the dictates alike of right and humanity. The use of submarines for the destruction of an enemy's commerce is of a necessity because of the very character of the vessels employed and the very methods of attack which their employment as of course involves. Incompatible with the principles of humanity, the long-established and incontrovertible rights of neutrals and the sacred immunities of non-combatants, end quote. He ended by declaring that he considered it his duty to inform Germany that, quote, unless the imperial German government should now immediately declare and effect an abandonment of its present methods of warfare against passenger and freight vessels, the government can have no choice but to sever diplomatic relations with the government of the German Empire altogether, end quote. The night before, a note in these terms had been sent by Mr. Lansing to Berlin. Here was at last the true ultimatum, which admitted of no misinterpreting. The Tirpitz policy of ruthlessness must be relinquished in theory and practice, or America would join the belligerent allies. The German reply, published on 4th May, was of the familiar type, a plea in confession and avoidance. It claimed that Germany had exercised a quote-unquote far-reaching restraint on her submarine warfare solely in the interests of neutrals. It declared that this warfare could not be dispensed with since it had been undertaken quote, in self-defense against the illegal conduct of Britain while fighting a bitter struggle for national existence, end quote. But it announced a concession the German naval force was to, quote, receive the following orders for submarine warfare in accordance with the general principle of visit, search, and destruction of merchant vessels recognized by international law. Such vessels, both within and without the area declared as a naval war zone, shall not be sunk without warning and without saving human life unless the ship attempts to escape and offer resistance, end quote. In return for this favor, Germany expected that America, quote, will now consider all impediments removed which may have lain in the way of neutral cooperation towards the restoration of the freedom of the seas, and will now demand and insist that the British government shall forthwith observe the rules of international law universally recognized before the war, end quote, in the matter of interference with seaborne commerce. In the connection in which it was delivered, the reply could only be construed as a specific abandonment of the policy of quote-unquote ruthlessness. It was so interpreted by the United States. In his reply of 8th May, Mr. Wilson accepted the quote, imperial government's abandonment of a policy which had so seriously menaced the good relations of the two countries, end quote and added that he relied upon its, quote-unquote, scrupulous execution. As for Germany's attempt to acquire something in return for her concession, 
The president did not mince matters. Quote, the government of the United States notifies the imperial government that it cannot for a moment entertain, much less discuss, the suggestion that respect by German naval authorities for the right of citizens of the United States upon the high seas should in any way, or in the slightest degree, be made contingent upon the conduct of any other government as affecting the rights of neutrals and non-combatants. The responsibility in such matters is single, not joint, absolute, not relative. End quote. Footnote. The same principle had been laid down in the American reply to the German note of July 8, 1915. End footnote. A diplomatic correspondence is to be read in the light of its attendant circumstances. Germany's reply and America's counter-reply, made in a time of great international strain and in precise language, constituted something very different from the looser discussions of the previous year. The belief seemed to be justified that the American president had spoken his last word and that, if his conditions were not fulfilled, a breach between the two powers would follow without further poor parleys. That Germany would be willing to relinquish a policy so loudly proclaimed and so popular with the nation at large argued that the influence of the imperial chancellor and the politiques was for the moment predominant and that he and his friends were beginning to envisage the future with a certain sobriety. But when we turn to the speeches of Bethman Holweg during these months, we shall find no abatement of intransigence nor any just appraisement of the situation. He shrilly upbraided the Allies for refusing to recognize when they were beaten. He implored them to look at the map as if the extent of occupied territory constituted a decision. The more far flung the lines of an army, the greater its ultimate destruction if its strength fails. He repeated the legend about Germany having entered upon war solely for the protection of her unity and freedom. All she sought, he said, was a Germany so strong that no one in the future would be tempted to seek to destroy her. And then he preached his own doctrine of nationality. Did anyone suppose that Germany would ever surrender to the rule of reactionary Russia, the peoples she had liberated, quote, between the Baltic Sea and the Volinian swamps? As for Belgium, there could be no status quo ante. Quote, Germany cannot again give over to Latinization the long-oppressed Flemish race, end quote. The British Prime Minister had declared that the first condition of peace was the complete and final destruction of the military power of Prussia. But that, said Bethman Holweg, is the same thing as our unity and freedom. The confession was significant. It was precisely because Germany defined that unity and freedom in terms of Prussian militarism that peace could only come with the latter's destruction. Some weeks later, Sir Edward Grey, in an interview with an American journalist, sketched another kind of freedom. Quote, what we and our allies are fighting for is a free Europe. We want a Europe free, not only from the domination of one nationality by another, but free from hectoring diplomacy and the peril of war. Free from the constant rattling of the sword in the scabbard, from perpetual talk of shining armor and warlords. What Prussia proposes is Prussian supremacy. She proposes a Europe modeled and ruled by Prussia. She is to dispose of the liberties of her neighbors and of us all. We say that life on those terms is intolerable. Herr von Bethmann Hallweg affirms that Great Britain wants to destroy, quote unquote, united and free Germany. We never were smitten with any such madness. We should be glad to see the German people free as we ourselves want to be free and as we want the other nationalities of Europe and of the world to be free. It belongs to the rudiments of political science. It is abundantly taught by history that you cannot enslave a people and make a success of the job, that you cannot kill a people's soul by foreign despotism and brutality. We aspire to embark upon no such course of folly and futility towards another nation. We believe that the German people, when once the dreams of world empire cherished by pan-Germanism are brought to naught, 
will insist upon the control of its government, and in this lies the hope of secure freedom and national independence in Europe. The Prussian authorities have apparently but one idea of peace, an iron peace imposed upon other nations by German supremacy. They do not understand that free men and free nations will rather die than submit to that ambition, and that there can be no end to war till it is defeated and renounced. End quote. In a chronicle of war, domestic politics are only to be touched on in so far as they have a bearing on the campaign. But it is necessary to devote a short space to one episode, the roots of which lay deep in old political controversies, an adventure which, as it happened, ended in a fiasco, but which in its inception was definitely linked to the main struggle. Fruitless volumes might be written in an endeavor to trace the full historical origin of the Irish Rebellion of Easter Week, 1916. So far, 500 years of experiments had failed to make Ireland an integral part of Britain. There had been opportunities, golden opportunities, some of them, but they had been missed or declined. Till half a century ago, Ireland had been penalized. Since then, she had been partly scolded and partly coddled, but the treatment had always been differential. No opportunity had been given for the land to grow up into that equal and like-minded partnership, which means unity as well as union. As a consequence, Britain had grown weary of the subject and had almost relinquished the attempt in despair. The air had become thick with paradox and sentiment. The Irishmen whom Britain despaired of, the Englishmen whom Ireland detested, were alike creatures of an imaginative convention. The realities of national character could not be discerned through the mist of propaganda. Sane men had reached the conclusion that any course would be better than to leave Ireland to be angled for by British political parties and made the gambling counter in a worthless game. If an incorporating union had failed, there might remain the chance of a looser federal tie under which the Irish people could attain that national maturity which had hitherto been denied them. But while it is hard to unite, it is often not less difficult to disentangle, and with the first talk of a separatist policy, it became clear that Ireland was not, strictly speaking, a unit at all. If three-fourths of the land were ready to renounce the incorporating union, the strong and serious Scoto-Irish stock of the North was not less resolved to cling to it. As we have seen, the outbreak of the war with Germany called a truce between the official combatants, a truce honorably observed by the respective leaders. Sir Edward Carson and Mr. Redmond flung themselves into the work of recruiting, and Ireland's well-wishers hoped that the partnership of North and South in the field might bring about a sense of common nationality. Germany had counted much on Irish disloyalty and disunion. Her merchants had supplied arms on the most moderate terms to Ulstermen and nationalists alike, and when, at the end of July 1914, a riot broke out in Dublin and British troops came into conflict with the mob, one of her principal agents had telegraphed that the hour had struck. As matters shaped themselves, her anticipation was falsified. But as the months passed, it became apparent that there were certain smoldering ashes in Ireland which, judiciously fanned, might kindle into a blaze. Treason was preached openly by word and pen, and little notice was taken of it by the authorities. Recruiting was obstructed with impunity to the obstructors. German money was spent freely, and a nucleus of disaffection was found in the organization called Sinn Féin, which owed no allegiance to any of the recognized Irish parties. Sinn Féin, which means ourselves, was a body founded some 16 years before by a section of extreme nationalists who had lost faith in the Irish Parliamentary Party. It advocated as its aim something not unlike Austro-Hungarian dualism and as means passive resistance to all British interference, a boycott of British goods, and, with a wiser inspiration, the development of Irish crafts and industries 
and a distinctive Irish literature. For long, it was a harmless academic movement, much frowned on by the politicians, and drawing its strength chiefly from the enthusiasts of Irish art and poetry. In a loose and incoherent way, it stood for the same ideal as Sir Horace Plunkett, who urged his countrymen to find salvation in their own efforts rather than in the caprices of the parliamentary game. But after the outbreak of war, it took to itself sinister allies. The extremists came to the top, and the spirit of the organization became definitely anti-British. The Irish government, in spite of repeated warnings, did little or nothing to check the movement. Mr. Burrell, the chief secretary, had consistently adopted the principle that till home rule arrived, no rule was the best substitute, and his undersecretary shared these enlightened views. Sir Roger Casement, formerly a British consular officer, who had before the war identified himself with the extreme nationalist party, presently left for Germany, where he hotly espoused the German cause. He was given the task of going round the prisoners' camps in the attempt to form an Irish brigade, but to the eternal glory of the Irish soldier, his overtures met, for the most part, with scorn and derision. Ultimately, Germany grew tired of her ally and called on him to make good his promise of raising an Irish revolt. She had no confidence in the success of the adventure, but she hoped that sufficient din would be raised to attract a number of British troops to Ireland, and she was prepared to support the gambler's throw with a bombardment by her battle cruiser squadron at some point on the East Anglian coast. Casement was in a tragic quandary. Futile and suspect, he was forced by his cynical employers into an enterprise which he knew must fail, and in the failure of which he would assuredly find his death. Late on the evening of 20th April, a German vessel, disguised as a Dutch trader and laden with arms, together with a German submarine, arrived off the Kerry coast, not far from Trelly. Every detail of their voyage from the day they left Germany was known to our Naval Intelligence Department. The vessel was stopped by a British patrol boat and ordered to follow to Queenstown Harbor. On the way, she hoisted the German flag and sank herself, her crew being taken prisoners. Meantime, Sir Roger Casement and two companions were put ashore from the submarine in a collapsible boat. The local Sinn Feiners failed to meet them, and Casement was arrested early on Good Friday morning, 21st April, and taken to England. Footnote. He was ultimately tried for high treason and condemned to death, and was hanged on 3rd of August. End footnote. The capture of their leader upset the plans of the rebels in Dublin. On the Saturday, the eastern maneuvers of the Sinn Féin volunteers were hastily cancelled, but so much incriminating evidence was abroad that they decided that the boldest game was the safest. On Easter Monday, while a half-hearted attack was made on the castle, armed bands seized St. Stephen's Green, the post office, the law courts, and part of Sackville Street. Troops were hastily brought in from the Curra. Field batteries shelled the rebel headquarters. A cordon of soldiers was stretched round the centre of the city, and martial law was proclaimed. On Wednesday, a territorial brigade, the 178, consisting of battalions of the Sherwood Foresters, arrived from England. And next day, Sir John Maxwell, who had returned from the command in Egypt, was given plenary power to deal with the situation. Bit by bit, the rebels were driven out of their strongholds, and by Saturday they were surrendering in batches. On Monday, 1st May, it was announced that the revolt in Dublin was crushed, and the outbreaks in Enniscorthy, Athenry, Clonmel, and other country districts were dying down. Fifteen of the leaders were tried by court-martial and shot, and a number of others condemned to varying terms of imprisonment. The military casualties were 521 of all ranks, including 17 officers killed. There were nearly 800 civilian casualties, many of them insurgents, including at least 180 dead. This tragic episode had small bearing on the war. 
From the start, it was what Horace Walpole called the most futile of things, a quote-unquote rebellion on the defensive. Wearers of the British uniform, some of them returning wounded from the front, were shot down in cold blood, and there were, unhappily, instances of the childish, light-hearted cruelty not unknown in Irish history in this tawdry commune. Not thus was the conduct of the wild geese who fought in Clare's brigade, or the Jacobites who followed the Chevalier to Culloden. Sympathy and respect must be denied to men who, however natural their estrangement from Britain, were fighting in virtual alliance with a power which had proclaimed herself the enemy of all liberty and all nationality. But unhappily, the barbarism was not wholly on one side. The British government dabbled alternately in mercy and severity. Either the law should have been strictly enforced, or, which would have been the wiser plan, so pitiful an escapade should have been followed by a generous amnesty, as in De Wet's rebellion. For the rising contained in its ranks a large number of febrile and perverted idealists, and it was partly the blame of Britain that such idealism was not turned to noble uses. The corner boy who sniped in the Dublin streets was of the same stock as the men who forced the Gallipoli landing. Owing partly to ancient and partly to recent blunders, there was little chance of honest idealism being awakened. While all the world was at war, Ireland alone stood aside, self-conscious and ashamed, and such a mood meant that the path was clear for the visionary and the knave. But while it is right to remember this plea in extenuation, it cannot be pushed too far. The Sinn Féinor was not, indeed, the whole of Ireland. Ulster was staunch as a rock, and there were many thousands drawn from every corner of the south and west who were true to their salt and fought in the British lines with a rare gallantry and resolution. Forty-eight hours after the Dublin Rising began, the German troops opposite certain Irish battalions in France exhibited notices announcing that the English were shooting down their wives and brothers and were answered with Rule Britannia. A company of the Munster Fusiliers crossed no man's land that night, cut the enemy's wire, and brought off the placard in triumph. It was the answer of the best of Ireland, not only to Germany, but to those traitors who would defile her honor at home. But that best was a minority. The bulk of the people stood sullenly aside. Ireland as a whole had dropped out of the Brotherhood of Nations. Those who would excuse her apathy are faced with a cruel dilemma. Either she approved the German creed and was at variance with the Allied principles, or... Possessed with hatred of England and lacking in political vision, she did not discern the meaning of those principles to which, had she grasped them, she would have assented. The first hypothesis is unthinkable, and the historian is forced back upon the second. The explanation of Ireland's action was not moral obliquity, but blinded eyes and a dulled mind. She was politically immature, and whether we seek the reason in racial character or historic mischance, in that fact lay her tragedy. She was at variance, not with Britain, but with civilization. End of chapter 54, part 2. Read by Jenny, 2023. Section 5 of A History of the Great War Volume 3. The Beleaguered Fortress Continued. And The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 55. The Battle of Jutland. May 30th to June 5th. 1916, Part 1 From the opening of the war, British seamen had been sustained by the hope that some day and somewhere they would meet the German high sea fleet in a battle in the open sea. It had been their hope since the hot August day when the great battleships disappeared from the eyes of watchers on the English shores. It had comforted them in the long months of waiting amid the winds and snows of the northern waters. 
Since the beginning of the year 1916, this hope had become a confident belief. There was no special ground for it, except the assumption that as the case of Germany became more difficult, she would be forced to use every asset in the struggle. As the onslaught on Verdun grew more costly and fruitless, and as the armies of Russia began to stir with the approach of summer, it seemed that the hour for the gambler's throw might soon arrive. The long vigil was trying to the nerve and temper of every sailor, and in especial to the battle cruiser fleet, which represented the first line of British sea strength. It was the business of the battle cruisers to make periodical sweeps through the North Sea, and to be first upon the scene should the enemy appear. They were the advance guard, the corps de choc of the Grand Fleet. They were the hounds which must close with the quarry and hold it till the hunters of the battle fleet arrived. Hence, the task of their commander was one of peculiar anxiety and strain. At any moment the chance might come, so he must be sleeplessly watchful. He would have to make sudden and grave decisions, for it was certain that the longed-for opportunity would have to be forced before it matured. The German hope was, by attrition or some happy accident, to wear down the superior British strength to an equality with their own. A rash act on the part of a British admiral might fulfil that hope, but on the other hand, without boldness, even rashness, Britain could not get to grips with her evasive foe. So far, Sir David Beatty and the battle cruisers had not been fortunate. From the shelter of the mine-strewn waters around Heligoland, Germany's warships made occasional excursions, for they could not rot for ever in harbour. Her battle cruisers had more than once raided the English coasts. Her battleships had made stately progresses in short circles in the vicinity of the Jutland and Schleswig shores. But so far, Sir David Beatty had been unlucky. At the Battle of the Bight of Heligoland on August the 28th, 1914, his great ships had encountered nothing more serious than enemy-like cruisers. At the time of the raid on Hartlepool in December of the same year, he had failed, owing to fog, to intercept the raiders. In the Battle of the Dogger Bank on January the 24th, 1915, the damage done to his flagship had prevented him destroying the whole German fleet of battle cruisers. It was clear that the enemy, if caught in one of his hurried sorties, would not fight unless he had a clear advantage. Hence, if the battle was to be joined at all, it looked as if the first stage, at all events, must be fought by Britain against odds. On Tuesday afternoon, the 30th of May, the bulk of the British Grand Fleet left its bases on one of its customary sweeps. On this occasion, it put to sea with hope, for the Admiralty had informed it that a large German movement was contemplated. It sailed in two sections. To the north were 24 dreadnoughts of the battle fleet under Sir John Jellicoe, the 1st, 2nd, and 4th battle squadrons, one battle cruiser squadron, the 3rd under Rear Admiral the Honourable Horace Hood, the 1st cruiser squadron under Rear Admiral Sir Robert Arbuthnot, the 2nd cruiser squadron under Rear Admiral Heath, the 4th light cruiser squadron under Commodore Le Mesurier, and the 4th, 11th and 12th destroyer flotillas. Farther south moved the battle cruiser fleet, under Sir David Beatty, the six vessels of the 1st and 2nd battle cruiser squadrons, under Rear Admiral Brock and Rear Admiral Pakenham, the 5th battle squadron, four vessels of the Queen Elizabeth class, under Rear Admiral Evan Thomas, the 1st, 2nd and 3rd light cruiser squadrons, and the 1st, 9th, 10th and 13th destroyer flotillas. It will be noticed that the two sections of the Grand Fleet were not sharply defined by battleships and battle cruisers, for Sir John Jellicoe had with him one squadron of battle cruisers, and Sir David Beatty had one squadron of the largest battleships. On the morning of the last day of May, the German high sea fleet also put to sea and sailed north a hundred miles or so from the Jutland coast. First went Admiral von Hipper's battle cruisers, five in number, with the usual complement of cruisers and destroyers. Following them came the battle fleet, under Admiral von Scheer, fifteen dreadnoughts and six older vessels, 
accompanied by three cruiser divisions and seven torpedo flotillas. With a few exceptions, all the capital ships of the German navy were present in this expedition. We know the purpose of Scheer from his own narrative. He hoped to engage and destroy a portion of the British fleet which might be isolated from the rest. Her German public opinion demanded some proof of naval activity now that the submarine campaign had languished. Sir John Jellicoe, as early as October 1914, had taken into review the new conditions of naval warfare and had worked out a plan to be adopted when he met the enemy's fleet, a plan approved not only by his flag officers but by successive admiralty boards. The German aim, as he forecast it, would be to fight a retreating action and lead him into an area where they could make the fullest use of mines, torpedoes and submarines. He was aware of the weakness of his own fleet in destroyers and cruisers and was resolved not to play the enemy's game. Hence, he might be forced to give the appearance of refusing battle and not closing with a retreating foe. Quote, I intend to pursue what is, in my considered opinion, the proper course to defeat and annihilate the enemy's battle fleet without regard to uninstructed opinion or criticism. The situation is a difficult one. It is quite within the bounds of possibility that half of our battle fleet might be disabled by underwater attack before the guns open fire at all if a false move is made, and I feel that I must constantly bear in mind the great probability of such an attack and be prepared tactically to prevent its success. End quote. The German methods had, therefore, from the start, a profound moral effect in determining the bias of the commander in chief's mind. A second principle was always in his thoughts, a principle derived from his view of the general strategy of the whole campaign, for Jellicoe had a wider survey than that of the professional sailor. It was no question of a partiality for the defensive rather than the offensive. The British Grand Fleet, in his view, was the pivot of the Allied strength. So long as it existed and kept the sea, it fulfilled its purpose, it had already achieved its main task. If it was seriously crippled, the result would be the loss of not one weapon among many, but of the main Allied armory. It was therefore the duty of a wise commander to bring the enemy to battle, but on his own terms. No consideration of purely naval results, no desire for personal glory, must be allowed to obscure the essential duty of his solemn trusteeship. The psychology of the commander-in-chief must be understood, for it played a vital part in the coming action. The fourth week of May had been hot and bright on shore, with low winds and clear heavens. But on the North Sea there lay a light summer haze, and on the last day of the month loose grey clouds were beginning to overspread the sky. Sir David Beatty, having completed his sweep to the south, had turned north about 2 p.m., according to instructions, to rejoin Jellicoe. The sea was dead calm, like a sheet of glass. His light cruiser squadrons formed a screen in front of him from east to west. But at 2.20 p.m., the Galatea, Commodore Alexander Sinclair, the flagship of the first light cruiser squadron, signalled enemy vessels to the east. Beatty at once altered course to the south-southeast, in the direction of the Horn Reef, in order to get between the enemy and his base. Five minutes later, the Galatea signalled again that the enemy was in force, and no mere handful of light cruisers. At 2.35, the watchers in the Lion saw a heavy pall of smoke to the eastward, and the course was accordingly altered to that direction, and presently to the northeast. The first and third light cruiser squadrons spread in a screen before the battle cruisers. A seaplane was sent up from the Engadine at 3.08, and at 3.30 its first report was received. Flying at a height of 900 feet, within two miles of hostile light cruisers, it was able to identify the enemy. Sir David Beatty promptly formed line of battle, and a minute later came in sight of Hipper's five battle cruisers. Evan Thomas and the 5th Battle Squadron were, at the time, more than five miles away, and, since their speed was less than that of the battle cruisers, would obviously be late for the fight. But Beatty did not wait, considering, not unnaturally, that his six battle cruisers were more than a match for Hipper. Stage 1 
Of all human contests, the naval battle makes the greatest demands upon the resolution and gallantry of the men and the skill and coolness of the commanders. In a land fight, the general may be thirty miles behind the line of battle, but the admiral is in the thick of it. He takes the same risks as the ordinary sailor and, as often as not, his flagship leads the fleet. For three hundred years, it had been the special pride of Britain that her ships were ready to meet any enemy at any time on any sea. If this proud boast were no longer hers, then her glory would indeed have departed. At three-thirty that afternoon Sir David Beatty had to make a momentous decision. The enemy was in all likelihood falling back upon his main battle fleet, and every mile the British admiral moved forward brought him nearer to an unequal combat. For the moment, the odds were in his favour, since he had six battle cruisers against Hipper's five, as well as the fifth battle squadron, but presently the odds might be heavily against him. He was faced with the alternative of conducting a half-hearted running fight with Hipper, to be broken off before the German battle fleet was reached, or of engaging closely and hanging on even after the junction with Shear had been made. In such a fight, the atmospheric conditions would compel him to close the range and so lose the advantage of his heavier guns, and his own battle cruisers, as regarded turret armour and deck plating, were far less stoutly protected than those of the enemy, which had the armour of a first-class battleship. Sir David Beatty was never for a moment in doubt. He chose the course which was not only heroic, but right on every ground of strategy. Twice already by a narrow margin he had missed bringing the German capital ships to action. He was resolved that now he would forego no chance which the fates might send. Hipper was steering east-southeast in the direction of his base. Beatty changed his course to conform, and the fleets were now some 23,000 yards apart. The second light cruiser squadron took station ahead with the destroyers of the 9th and 13th flotillas. Then came the first battle cruiser squadron, led by the Lion, then the second, and then Evan Thomas with the fifth battle squadron. Beatty formed his ships on a line of bearing to clear the smoke. That is, each ship took station on a compass bearing from the flagship, of which they were diagonally astern. At 3.48 the action began, both sides opening fire at the same moment. The range was 18,500 yards, the direction was generally south-southeast, and both fleets were moving at full speed, an average perhaps of 25 knots. The wind was from the southeast, the visibility for the British was good, and the sun was behind them. They had ten capital ships to the German five. The omens seemed propitious for victory. In all battles, there is a large element of sheer luck and naked caprice. In the first stage, when Beatty had the odds in his favour, he was destined to suffer his chief losses. A shot struck the indefatigable, Captain Sowerby, in a vital place. The magazine exploded, and in two minutes she turned over and sank. The German gunnery at the start was uncommonly good. It was only later when things went ill with them that their shooting fell off. Meantime, the 5th Battle Squadron had come into action at a range of 20,000 yards and engaged the rear enemy ships. From 4.15 onward for half an hour, the duel between the battle cruisers was intense, and the enemy fire gradually grew less rapid as hours increased. At 4.18, the German battle cruiser third in line was seen to be on fire. Presently, the Queen Mary, Captain Prowse, was hit and blew up. She had been at the Battle of the Bight on Heligoland. She was perhaps the best gunnery ship in the fleet, and her loss left Beatty with only four battle cruisers. Happily, she did not go down before her superb marksmanship had taken toll of the enemy. The haze was now settling on the waters, and all that could be seen of the foe was a blurred outline. Meantime, as the great vessels raced southwards, the lighter craft were fighting a battle of their own. Eight destroyers of the 13th Flotilla, the Nestor, Nomad, Nicator, Narborough, Pelican, Petard, 
obdurate, and Nerissa, together with the Morsum and Morris of the tenth, and the turbulent and Tarmagant of the ninth, moved out at 4.15 for a torpedo attack, at the same time as the enemy destroyers advanced for the same purpose. The British flotilla at once came into action at close quarters with fifteen destroyers and a light cruiser of the enemy, and beat them back with the loss of two destroyers. This combat had made some of them drop astern, so a full torpedo attack was impossible. The Nestor, Nomad and Nicator, under Commander the Honourable E.B.S. Bingham, fired two torpedoes at the German battlecruisers, and were sorely battered themselves by the German secondary armament. They clung to their task till the turning movement came which we shall presently record, and the result of it was to bring them within close range of many enemy battleships. Both the Nestor and the Nomad were sunk, and only the Nicator regained the flotilla. Some of the others fired their torpedoes, and apparently the rear German ship was struck. The gallantry of these smaller craft cannot be overpraised. That subsidiary battle fought under the canopy of the duel of the greater ships was one of the most heroic episodes of the action. We have seen that the second light cruiser squadron was scouting ahead of the battle cruisers. At 4.38, the Southampton, Commodore Goodenough, reported the German battle fleet ahead. Instantly, Beatty recalled the destroyers, and at 4.42, Shear was sighted to the southeast. Beatty put his helm to port and swung round to a northerly course. From the pursuer, he had now become the pursued, and his aim was to lead the combined enemy fleets towards Sir John Jellicoe. The 5th Battle Squadron, led by Evan Thomas in the Barham, now hard at it with the hipper, was ordered to follow suit. Meanwhile, the Southampton and the 2nd Light Cruiser Squadron continued forward to observe and did not turn till within 13,000 yards of Shear's battleship and under their fire. At five o'clock, Beatty's battle cruisers were steering north, the Fearless and the 1st Destroyer Flotilla leading, the 1st and 3rd Light Cruiser Squadrons on his starboard bow and the 2nd Light Cruiser Squadron on his port quarter. Behind him came Evan Thomas, attended by the champion and the destroyers of the 13th flotilla. It is not difficult to guess at the thoughts of Shear and Hipper. They had had the good fortune to destroy two of Beatty's battle cruisers, and now that their whole fleet was together, they hoped to destroy more. The weather conditions that afternoon made zeppelins useless, and accordingly they knew nothing of Jellicoe's presence in the north, though they must have surmised that he would appear sooner or later. They believed they had caught Beatty cruising on his own account, and that the gods had delivered him into their hands. From 4.45 till 6 o'clock, to the mind of the German admirals, the battle resolved itself into a British flight and a German pursuit. The case presented itself otherwise to Sir David Beatty, who knew that the British battle fleet was some fifty miles off, and that it was his business to coax the Germans towards it. He was now facing heavy odds eight capital ships as against at least nineteen, but he had certain real advantages. He had the pace of the enemy, and this enabled him to overlap their line and to get his battle cruisers on their bow. In the race southwards, he had driven his ships at full speed, and consequently his squadron had been in two divisions, for Evan Thomas's battleships had not the pace of the battle cruisers. But when he headed north, he reduced his pace, and there was no longer a tactical division of forces. The eight British ships were now one fighting unit. It was Beatty's intention to nurse his pursuers into the arms of Jellicoe, and for this his superior speed gave him a vital weapon. Once the northerly course had been entered upon, the enemy could not change direction, except in a very gradual curve, without exposing himself to enfilading fire from the British battlecruisers at the head of the line. Though in a sense he was the pursuer, and so had the initiative, yet as a matter of fact his movements were mainly controlled by Sir David Beatty's will. That the British Admiral should have seen and reckoned with this fact in the confusion of a battle against odds is not the least of the proofs of his sagacity and fortitude. Unfortunately the weather changed for the worse. The British ships were silhouetted against a clear western sky, but the enemy was shrouded in mist 
and only at rare intervals showed dim shapes through the gloom. The range was about 14,000 yards. The two leading ships of Evan Thomas's squadron were assisting the battle cruisers, while his two rear ships were engaged with the first vessels of the German 3rd Battle Squadron, which developed an unexpected speed. As before, the lesser craft played a gallant part. At 5.05, the Onslow and the Moresby, which had been helping the Engadine with the seaplane, took station on the engaged bow of the Lion, and the latter struck with a torpedo the sixth ship in the German line and set it on fire. She then passed south to clear the range of smoke, and took station on the 5th Battle Squadron. At 5.33 Sir David Beatty's course was north-northeast, and he was gradually hauling round to the northeastward. He knew that the battle fleet could not be far off, and he was heading the Germans on an easterly course so that Jellicoe should be able to strike to the best advantage. At 5.50 on his port bow he sighted British cruisers and six minutes later had a glimpse of the leading ships of the battle fleet five miles to the north. He at once changed course to east and increased speed, bringing the range down to 12,000 yards. He was forcing the enemy to a course on which Jellicoe might overwhelm him. End of chapter 55, part 1, end of section 5. Section 6 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 55 The Battle of Jutland. May 30th to June 5th, 1916, Part 2 Stage 2 The first stage was now over, the isolated fight of the battlecruisers, and we must turn to the doings of the battle fleet itself. When Sir John Jellicoe, at the same time as Beatty, took in the Galatea's signals, he was distant from the battlecruisers between fifty and sixty miles. He at once proceeded at full speed on a course southeast by south to join his colleague. The engine rooms made heroic efforts, and the whole fleet maintained a speed in excess of the trial speeds of some of the older vessels. It was no easy task to effect a junction at the proper moment, since there was an inevitable difference in estimating the rendezvous by reckoning, and some of Beatty's messages, dispatched in the stress of action, were obscure. Moreover, the thick weather made it hard to recognise which ships were enemy and which were British when the moment of meeting came. What a spectacle must that strange rendezvous have presented, had there been any eye to see it as a whole. Two great navies on opposite courses at high speeds driving towards each other. The German unaware of what was approaching. The British fleet, mile upon mile of steel giants whose van was far out of sight of its rear twelve miles wrong in its reckoning, and so making contact almost by accident in a drift of smoke and sea haze. The third battlecruiser squadron, under Rear Admiral Hood, led the battle fleet. At 5.30, Hood observed flashes of gunfire and heard the sound of guns to the southwestward. He sent the Chester, Captain Lawson, to investigate, and at 5.45, this ship engaged three or four enemy light cruisers, rejoining the third battlecruiser squadron at 6.05. Hood was too far to the south and east, so he turned northwest, and five minutes later sighted Beatty. At 6.11 he received orders to take station ahead, and at 6.22 he led the line, quote, bringing his squadron into action ahead in a most inspiring manner, worthy of his great naval ancestors, end quote. He was now only 8,000 yards from the enemy, and under a desperate fire. At 6.34 his flagship, the Invincible, was sunk, and with her perished an admiral who in faithfulness and courage must rank with the nobler figures of British naval history. This was at the end of the British line. Meantime, the first and second cruiser squadrons 
accompanying the battle fleet, had also come into action. The defence and the warrior had crippled an enemy-like cruiser, the Wiesbaden, about six o'clock. The Canterbury, which was in company with the 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron, had engaged enemy light cruisers and destroyers which were attacking the destroyers Shark, Acasta and Christopher, an engagement in which the Shark was sunk. At 6.16 the 1st Cruiser Squadron, driving in the enemy light cruisers, had got into a position between the German and British battle fleets. Since Sir Robert Abuthnot was not aware of the enemy's approach, owing to the mist, until he was in close proximity to them. The defence perished, and with it Arbuthnot. The warrior passed to the rear disabled, and the Black Prince received damage which led later to her destruction. Meantime, Beatty's lighter craft had also been hotly engaged. At 6.05 the Onslow sighted an enemy light cruiser 6,000 yards off, which was trying to attack the Lion with torpedoes, and at once closed and engaged at a range from 4,000 to 2,000 yards. She then closed the German battle cruisers, but after firing one torpedo, she was struck amidships by a heavy shell. Undefeated, she fired her remaining three torpedoes at the enemy battle fleet. She was taken in tow by the defender, who was herself damaged, and in spite of constant shelling by two gallant destroyers, managed to retire in safety. Again, the 3rd Light Cruiser Squadron under Rear Admiral Napier, which was well ahead of the enemy on Beatty's starboard bow, attacked with torpedoes at 6.25, the Falmouth and the Yarmouth especially distinguishing themselves. One German battlecruiser was observed to be hit and fall out of the line. The period between 6 o'clock and 6.40 saw the first crisis of the battle. The six divisions of the Grand Fleet had approached in six parallel columns, and it was Jellicoe's business to deploy as soon as he could locate the enemy. A few minutes after six, he realised that the Germans were on his starboard side, and in close proximity. He resolved to form line of battle on the port wing column on a course southeast by east, and the order went out at 6.16. His reasons were, to avoid danger in the mist from the German destroyers ahead of their battle fleet, to prevent the Marlborough's division on the starboard wing from receiving the concentrated fire of the German battle fleet before the remaining divisions came into line, and to obviate the necessity of turning again to port to avoid the overlap which formation on the starboard wing would give the enemy van. This decision had been vehemently criticised, but without justification. It may well be doubted whether to have formed line towards instead of away from the enemy would have substantially lessened the time of closing the enemy, and it would beyond doubt have exposed the British starboard division to a dangerous concentration of fire. As it was, the Hercules in the starboard division was in action within four minutes. The movement took twenty minutes to perform, and during that time the situation was highly delicate. But on the whole, it was brilliantly carried out, and by 6.38, Shear had given up his attempt to escape to the eastward and was bending due south. At 5.40, Hipper, under pressure from Evan Thomas and the destroyers, had turned six points to starboard. At 5.55, being now overlapped by Beatty, who had closed the range, he turned sharp east. At 6, he bent south. At 6.12, he went about on a north-northeast course, and about 6.15 he came in contact with Hood's battlecruisers and realised that Jellicoe had arrived. For a quarter of an hour there was heavy fighting, during which his flagship, the Lutzau, was badly damaged, and the Derflinger silenced. By 6.33 he was steering due south, followed by Shear. The turn on interior lines gave him the lead of Beatty, who bent southward on a parallel course. The first and second battlecruiser squadrons led, then the third battlecruiser squadron. There followed the six divisions of the battle fleet. First, the second battle squadron, under Vice Admiral Sir Thomas Jerome. Then the fourth, under Vice Admiral Sir Doveton Sturdy, containing Sir John Jellicoe's flagship, the Iron Duke. And finally the first, under Vice Admiral Sir Cecil Burney. Evan Thomas's 5th Battle Squadron, which had up to now been with Beatty, intended to form ahead of the battle fleet, 
but the nature of the deployment compelled it to form a stern. The war spite had her steering gear damaged and drifted towards the enemy's line under a furious cannonade. For a little, she involuntarily interposed herself between the warrior and the enemy's fire. She was presently extricated, but it is a curious proof of the caprices of fortune in battle that while a single shot at the beginning of the action sunk the indefatigable, this intense bombardment did the war spite little harm. Only one gun turret was hit, and her engines were uninjured. At 6.40, then, the two British fleets were united. The German line was headed off to the east, and Beatty and Jellicoe were working their way between the enemy and his home ports. Shear and Hipper were now greatly outnumbered, and it seemed as if the British admirals had won a complete strategic success. But the fog was deepening, and the night was falling and such conditions favoured the German tactics of retreat. Stage 3 The third stage of the battle, roughly two hours long, was an intermittent duel between the main fleets. Scheer had no wish to linger, and he moved southwards at his best speed, with the British line shepherding him on the east. He was definitely declining battle. Beatty had succeeded in crumpling up the head of the German line, and its battleships were now targets for the majority of his battlecruisers. The visibility was becoming greatly reduced. The mist no longer merely veiled the targets, but often shut them out altogether. This not only made gunnery extraordinarily difficult, but prevented the British from keeping proper contact with the enemy. At the same time, such light as there was was more favourable to Beatty and Jellicoe than to Shear. The German ships showed up at intervals against the sunset, as did Craddock's cruisers off Coronel, and gave the British gunners their chance. Hipper and his battle cruisers were in serious difficulties. At 6.15, he was compelled to leave the Lutzau, and since by this time neither the Durflinger nor the Seidlitz was fit for flag duties, he remained in a destroyer till a lull in the firing enabled him to board the Moltke. From seven o'clock onward, Beatty was steering south, and gradually bearing round to southwest and west, in order to get into touch with the enemy. At 7.15, Shear having ordered Hipper to close the British again, he sighted them at a range of 15,000 yards, three battlecruisers and two battleships of the Koenig class. The sun had now fallen behind the western clouds, and at 7.18, Beatty increased speed to 22 knots and re-engaged. The enemy showed signs of great distress, one ship being on fire and one dropping astern. The destroyers at the head of the line emitted volumes of smoke, which covered the ships behind with a pall, and enabled them, at 7.37, to turn away and pass out of Beatty's sight. At that moment he signalled Jellicoe, asking that the van of the battleships should follow the battlecruisers. At 7.58, the first and third light cruiser squadrons were ordered to sweep westward and locate the head of the enemy's line, and at 8.20 Beatty altered course to west to support. He located three battleships and engaged them at 10,000 yards range. The Lion repeatedly hit the leading ship, which turned away in flames with a heavy list to port, while the Princess Royal set fire to one battleship, and the third ship, under the attack of the New Zealand and the Indomitable, hauled out of line, heeling over and on fire. Once more, the mist descended and enveloped the enemy, who passed out of sight to the west. To turn to the battle fleet, which had become engaged during deployment with the leading German battleships, it first took course southeast by east, but as it endeavoured to close, it bore round to starboard. The aim of Scheer now was to escape, and nothing but escape, and every device was used to screen his ships from British sight. Owing partly to the smoke palls and the clouds emitted by the destroyers, but mainly to the mist, it was never possible to see more than four or five enemy ships at a time. The ranges were, roughly, from 9,000 to 12,000 yards, and the action began with the British battle fleet in divisions on the enemy's bow. Under the British attack, the enemy constantly turned away, and this had the effect of bringing Jellicoe to a position of less advantage on the enemy's quarter. At the same time, 
it put the British fleet between Scheer and his base. In the short periods, however, during which the Germans were visible, they received a heavy fire and were constantly hit. Some were observed to haul out of line, and at least one was seen to sink. The German return fire at this stage was poor, and the damage caused to our battleships was trifling. Scheer relied for defence chiefly on torpedo attacks, which were favoured by the weather and the British position. A following fleet can make small use of torpedoes, as the enemy is moving away from it, while the enemy, on the other hand, has the advantage in this weapon, since his targets are moving toward him. Many German torpedoes were fired, but the only battleship hit was the Marlborough, which was, happily, able to remain in line and continue the action. The first battle squadron under Sir Cecil Burney came into action at 6.17 with a third German battle squadron at a range of 11,000 yards. But as the fight continued, the range decreased to 9,000 yards. This squadron received most of the enemy's return fire, but it administered severe punishment. Take the case of the Marlborough, Captain George P. Ross. At 6.17, she began by firing seven salvos at a ship of the Kaiser class. She then engaged a cruiser and a battleship. At 6.54, she was hit by a torpedo. At 7.03, she reopened the action, and at 7.12, fired 14 salvos at a ship of the Koenig class, hitting her repeatedly till she turned out of line. The Colossus of the same squadron was hit, but only slightly damaged and several other ships were frequently straddled by the enemy's fire. The fourth battle squadron in the centre was engaged with ships of the Koenig and the Kaiser classes, as well as with battle cruisers and light cruisers. Sir John Jellicoe's flagship, the Iron Duke, engaged one of the Koenig class at 6.30 at a range of 12,000 yards, quickly straddled it, and hit it repeatedly from the second salvo onwards till it turned away. The second battle squadron in the van under Sir Thomas Jerome, was in action with German battleships from 6.30 to 7.20, and engaged also a damaged battlecruiser. At 7.15, when the range had been closed and line ahead finally formed, came the main torpedo attack by German destroyers. In order to frustrate what he regarded as the most serious danger, Jellicoe ordered a turn of two points to port, and presently a further two points opening the range by about 1,750 yards. This caused a certain loss of time, and Scheer seized the occasion to turn well to starboard, with the result that contact between the battle fleets was presently lost. Jellica received Beatty's appeal at 7.54, and ordered the second battle squadron to follow the battle cruisers. But mist and smoke screens and falling light were fatal hindrances to the pursuit and even Beatty had soon to give up hope of sinking Hipper's damaged remnant. By nine o'clock, the enemy had completely disappeared, and darkness was falling fast. He had been veering round to a westerly course, and the whole British fleet lay between him and his home ports. It was a strategic situation which, but for the fog and the coming of night, would have meant his complete destruction. Sir John Jellicoe had now to make a difficult decision. It was impossible for the British fleet to close in the darkness in a sea swarming with torpedo craft and possibly with submarines, and accordingly he was compelled to make dispositions for the night which would ensure the safety of his ships and provide for a renewal of the action at dawn. For a night action, the Germans were the better equipped as to their fire system, their recognition signals and their searchlights, and he did not feel justified in presenting the enemy with a needless advantage. On this point Beatty, to the south and westward, was in full agreement. In his own words, quote, I manoeuvred to remain between the enemy and his base, placing our flotillas in a position in which they would afford protection to the fleet from destroyer attack, and at the same time be favourably situated for attacking the enemy's heavier ships. End quote. He informed Jellicoe of his position and the bearing of the enemy, and turned to the course of the battle fleet. Stage 4. Jellicoe moved the battle fleet on a southerly course, with its four squadrons in parallel columns a mile apart, so as to keep in touch. 
the destroyer flotillas were disposed from west to east, five miles astern. The battle cruisers and the cruisers lay to the west of the battle fleet, the second light cruiser squadron north of it, and the fourth light cruiser squadron to the south. The main action was over, and Jellicoe was now wholly out of touch with the enemy. His light craft were ordered to attend the battle fleet and not to attempt to find touch. Hence, he was in the position of a warder in the centre of a very broad gate, and an alert enemy had many opportunities of slipping past his flanks. The night battle was waged on the British side entirely by the lighter craft. It began by an attack on our destroyers by German light cruisers. Then, at 10.20, an enemy cruiser and four light cruisers came into action with our second light cruiser squadron, losing the Frauenlob and severely handling the Southampton and the Dublin. The fourth destroyer flotilla, about 11.30, lost the Sparrowhawk, and later the Tipperary, but at midnight sunk the old battleship Pomern. The twelfth flotilla was in action between one and two in the morning, and torpedoed two enemy battleships. The ninth flotilla lost the Turbulent, and after 2 a.m., the thirteenth flotilla engaged four Deutschlands. The German ships made good their escape, but they lost in the process out of all proportion to the British light craft. No ships in the whole battle won greater glory than these. Quote, they surpassed, wrote Sir John Jellicoe, the very highest expectations that I had formed of them. End quote. An officer on one of the flotillas has described that uneasy darkness. Quote, we couldn't tell what was happening. Every now and then, out of the silence would come bang, bang, boom, as hard as it could go for ten minutes on end. The flash of the guns lit up the whole sky for miles and miles and the noise was far more penetrating than by day. Then you would see a great burst of flames from some poor devil, as the searchlight switched on and off, and then perfect silence once more. End quote. The searchlights at times made the sea as white as marble, on which the destroyers moved, quote, black, wrote an eyewitness, as cockroaches on a floor. End quote. At earliest dawn on the 1st of June, the British fleet, which was lying south and west of the Horn Reef, turned northwards to collect its light craft and to search for the enemy. It was ready and eager to renew the battle, for it had still 22 battleships untouched, and ample cruisers and light craft, while Shears' command was scarcely any longer a fleet in being. But there was to be no second glorious 1st of June, for the enemy was not to be found. He had slipped in single ships astern of our fleet during the night, and was then engaged in moving homewards like a flight of wild duck that had been scattered by shot. He was greatly helped by the weather, which at dawn on the 1st of June was thicker than the night before, the visibility being less than four miles. About 3.30 a.m. a zeppelin passed over the British fleet, and reported to Shear the position of the British squadrons. All morning till eleven o'clock, Sir John Jellicoe waited on the battleground, watching the lines of approach to German ports and attending the advent of the enemy. But no enemy came. Quote, I was reluctantly compelled to the conclusion, wrote Sir John, that the high sea fleet had returned into port. End quote. Till 1.15 p.m., the British fleet swept the seas, picking up survivors from some of our lost destroyers, after that hour, waiting was useless, so the fleet sailed for its bases, which were reached the next day, Friday the 2nd of June. There it refuelled and replenished with ammunition, and at 9.30 that evening was ready for further action. End of chapter 55, part 2, end of section 6. Section 7 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 55 The Battle of Jutland. May 30th, 
to June 5th, 1916. Part 3. Stage 5. The German fleet, being close to its bases, was able to publish at once its own version of the battle. A resounding success was a political necessity for Germany, for she needed a Philip for her new loan, and it is likely that she would have claimed a victory if any remnant of her fleets had reached harbour. As it was, she was overjoyed at having escaped annihilation, and the magnitude of her jubilation may be taken as the measure of her fears. It is of the nature of a naval action that it gives ample scope for fiction. There are no spectators. Victory and defeat are not followed, as in a land battle, by a gain or loss of ground. A well-disciplined country with a strict censorship can frame any tale it pleases and hold to it for months without fear of detection at home. Germany claimed at once a decisive success. According to her press, the death blow had been given to Britain's command of the sea. The emperor soared into poetry. Quote, the gigantic fleet of Albion, ruler of the seas, which, since Trafalgar, for a hundred years has imposed on the whole world a bond of sea tyranny, and has surrounded itself with a nimbus of invincibleness, came into the field. That gigantic armada approached, and our fleet engaged it. The British fleet was beaten. The first great hammer blow was struck, and the nimbus of British world supremacy disappeared. End quote. Germany admitted certain losses. One old battleship, the Pommern, three small cruisers, the Wiesbaden, Elbing, and Fraunlob, and five destroyers. A little later, she confessed to the loss of a battle cruiser, Lutzau and the light cruiser, Rostock, which at first she had kept secret, quote, for political reasons, end quote. It was a striking tribute to the prestige of the British Navy that the German claim was received with incredulity in all Allied and in most neutral countries. But false news, once it has started, may be dangerous, and in some quarters, even among friends of the Allies, there was at first a disposition to accept the German version. The ordinary man is apt to judge of a battle, whether on land or sea, by the crude test of losses. The British Admiralty announced its losses at once with a candour which may have been undiplomatic, but which revealed a proud confidence in the invulnerability of the Navy and the steadfastness of the British people. These losses were one first-class battlecruiser, the Queen Mary, two lesser battlecruisers, the Indefatigable and Invincible, three armoured cruisers, the Defence, Black Prince and Warrior, and eight destroyers, the Tipperary, Ardent, Fortune, Shark, Sparrowhawk, Nestor, Nomad and Turbulent. More vital than the ships was the loss of thousands of gallant men, including some of the most distinguished of the younger admirals and captains. Sir John Jellicoe at the time estimated the German losses as two battleships of the largest class, one of the Deutschland class, one battlecruiser, five light cruisers, six destroyers, and one submarine. He overstated the immediate and understated the ultimate damage. The German account was formally accurate, but her real loss was infinitely greater. The Seidlitz and the Derflinger limped home almost total wrecks. The battleship Ostfriesland struck a mine. The Moltke and the von der Tann took two weeks to repair. Almost every vessel had been hit, some of them grievously. Scheer had declared that, apart from the two battle cruisers, the fleet was ready to take to sea by the middle of August. But the truth is that it was never again a fighting fleet. Jutland, which had at first the colour of victory, was an irredeemable disaster. After the war was over, Captain Perseus wrote in the Berliner Tagblatt, quote, The losses sustained by us were immense, in spite of the fact that luck was on our side, and on June the 1st, 1916, it was clear to everyone of intelligence that the fight would be, and must be, the only one to take place. End quote. 
the fact was recognised by reasonable minds everywhere, and it was only the ignorant who imagined that the loss of a few ships could weaken British naval prestige. There was much to praise in the German conduct of the action. The German battlecruiser gunnery was admirable. Scheer's retreat, when heavily outnumbered, was skilfully conducted, and his escape in the night, even when we admit his special advantages, was a brilliant performance. But the one test of success is the fulfilment of a strategic intention, and Germany's most signally failed. From the moment of Scheer's return to port, the British fleet held the sea. The blockade which Germany thought to break was drawn tighter than ever. Her secondary aim had been to so weaken the British fleet that it should be more nearly on an equality with her own. Again, she failed, and the margin of British superiority was in no way impaired. Lastly, she hoped to isolate and destroy a British division. That, too, failed. The British battlecruiser fleet remained a living and effective force, while the German battlecruiser fleet was only a shadow. The result of the Battle of the 31st of May was that Britain was more than ever confirmed in her mastery of the waters. Nevertheless, the fact that the only occasion on which the main fleets met did not result in the annihilation of the enemy was a disappointment and a surprise to the British people, and criticism has been busy ever since with the British leadership. It has been asked why the Admiralty at 5.12pm on the 31st of May ordered the Harwich force to sea and then cancelled the order for ten hours, and this when Jellicoe had long before asked that all available ships and torpedo craft should be ordered to the scene of the fleet's action as soon as it was known to be imminent. Beatty's dash and resolution have been universally commended, but he has been criticised for allowing Evan Thomas's squadron to lag so far behind that it scarcely joined in the first stages of the battlecruiser action, and for the lack of precision in his messages to Jellicoe before their junction. But it is the conduct of the commander-in-chief which has principally been called into question. He has been accused of a lack of ardour in engaging the enemy, as shown in his deploying to port instead of to starboard, in his turning away between 7.15 and 7.30pm on the 31st of May to avoid torpedo attacks, and in his refusal of a night battle. On the first and third of these points, it would appear that the bulk of expert naval opinion is on his side. On the second, the arguments are more evenly balanced, and the matter will long continue in dispute. Even had no turn away been ordered, it is doubtful whether the range could have been kept closed, owing to the bad light and Shear's persistent turning to starboard. But from the controversy, there emerges a larger issue, on which naval historians must eternally take sides. Was Jutland fought in the true Trafalgar tradition? Had the British commander-in-chief the single-hearted resolve to destroy the enemy at all costs, content to lose half or more than half his fleet provided no enemy ship survived? It is idle to deny that the destruction of the high sea fleet would have been of incalculable value to the Allies for it would have taken the heart out of the German people, would have crippled, even if it did not prevent, the submarine campaign which, in the next twelve months, was to sink twenty-five out of every one hundred merchantmen that left our shores, and would have opened up sea communication with Russia, and thereby prevented the calamity of the following year. Was such a final victory possible at Jutland, had Jellicoe handled the battle fleet as Beatty handled his battle cruisers? The answer must remain a speculation. It is probable, indeed, that no risks accepted by the commander-in-chief would have altered a result due primarily to the weather conditions and the late hour when the battle was joined. But the fact remains that Jellicoe's policy was that of the limited offensive. He was convinced that his duty was not to press the enemy beyond a point which might involve the destruction of his own weapon. The situation, as he saw it, had changed since the days of Trafalgar. Then, only a relatively small part of the British fleet was engaged. Now, the Grand Fleet included the great majority of the vessels upon which Britain and her allies had to rely for safety. There was ever present to his mind, in his own words, quote, the necessity for not leaving anything to chance in a fleet action, 
because our fleet was the one and only factor that was vital to the existence of the Empire, as indeed of the Allied cause. We had no reserve outside the battle fleet which could in any way take its place should disaster befall it, or even should its margin of superiority over the enemy be eliminated. End quote. Moreover, the British Navy had already achieved its main purpose. Was any further gain worth the risk of losing that victory? It was a war of peoples, and even the most decisive triumph at sea would not end the contest, while a defeat would strike from the Allied hands the weapon on which all others depended. Such considerations are of supreme importance. If it be argued that they belong to statesmanship rather than to naval tactics, it may be replied that the commander of the British Grand Fleet should be statesman as well as seaman. A good sailor, of proved courage and resolution, chose to decide in conformity with what he regarded as the essential interests of his land and against the tradition of the service and the natural bias of his spirit, and his countrymen may well accept and respect that decision. Stage 6 Following close upon the greatest naval fight of all history came the news of a sea tragedy which cost Britain the life of her foremost soldier. It had been arranged that Lord Kitchener should undertake a mission to Russia to consult with the Russian commanders as to the coming Allied offensive and to arrange certain details of policy concerning the supply of munitions. On the evening of Monday the 5th of June, he and his party embarked in the cruiser Hampshire, which had returned three days before from the Battle of Jutland. About 8 p.m. that evening, the ship sank in wild weather off the western coast of the Orkneys, having struck a mine in an unswept channel. Four boats left the vessel, but all were overturned. One or two survivors were washed ashore on the inhospitable coast, but of Kitchener and his colleagues no word was ever heard again. The news of his death filled the whole empire with profound sorrow, and the shock was felt no less by our allies, who saw in him one of the chief protagonists of their cause. The British army went into mourning, and all classes of the community were affected with a grief which had not been paralleled since the death of Queen Victoria. Labour leader, trade union delegate, and the patron of the conscientious objector were as heartfelt in their regret as his professional colleagues or the army which he had created. He died on the eve of a great Allied offensive, and did not live to see the consummation of his labours. But in a sense, his work was finished, for more than any other man, he had the credit of building up that vast British force which was destined to be the determining factor in the war. At the hour of his death, he was beyond doubt the most dominant personality in the empire, and the greatest of Britain's public servants. His popular prestige was immense, for he had about him that air of mystery and that taciturnity which the ordinary man loves to associate with a great soldier. His splendid presence, his iron face, his silence, his glittering record, raised him out of the ranks of mere notabilities to the select circle of those who even in their lifetime become heroes of romance. He was a lonely figure, with no talent for the facile acquaintanceships of the modern world. But few men have inspired a more ardent affection among those who were admitted to the privilege of their friendship. Popular repute is apt to be melodramatic, and to simplify unduly. Lord Kitchener was by no means the man of granite and iron whom the public fancy envisaged. He was a stern taskmaster, inflexibly just and unfailingly loyal, but he had a deep inner fount of kindliness. He did not cultivate the gift of expression, but now and then, as after the Ferenichung Peace Conference, he showed something like a genius for the fitting word. He had humour, too, of a kind which the world little realised, that sense of the comedy of situation which keeps a man's perspective true. To his abilities, it is likely that history will do ample justice. He had behind him great positive achievements, the conquest of the Sudan, the completion of the South African campaign, a singularly successful administrative career in Egypt, and, above all, the organisation of Britain for her greatest war. But in his own day, 
the popular judgment was as wide of the mark as to the exact quality of his genius as to the nature of his personality. The capture of Omdurman and the eulogies of a famous war correspondent had established him as the complete administrator, the master of detail, the businessman in excelsis. But the true bent of his mind was not towards detail. He was by no means the perfect administrator, for he did not understand the part of delegating duties to others, tending always to draw every task to his own capable hands. He was fond of shortcuts and summary methods, and there were occasions when the result was confusion. His true genius lay in his foresight and imagination. That is why he was so brilliant an Oriental administrator, for he could read the native mind. That is why, in August 1914, when most people expected a short campaign, he declared that the war would last for three years and made his plans accordingly. There were men in the British Army, and there were men in the Allied forces, who ranked above him as scientific soldiers, learned in the latest military art. There were men who could have handled better than he a force in the field. There were those, too, who equally well could have organised the business side of an army. But there was no man living who saw the main issues so simply and clearly. He could divine the essentials, though he might err over the details. He had the vision which is possible only to the rare few whose souls are of the spacious and simple cast and are undistracted by the tumult of petty absorptions. And with insight went balance. His mind soberly and accurately discerned realities. In the apt words of his biographer, quote, He saw all, not as in a picture with illusions of perspective, but as in a plan where dimensions and distances figure as they are and not as they seem. End quote. In the art of war, said Napoleon, the making of pictures is fatal. A good soldier sees objects exactly as they are, as if through a field glass. The last months had not been the happiest of his life. Many of the day-by-day -day problems which he found himself called upon to face were so unfamiliar to him that he handled them clumsily. He did not understand, nor was he understood by, certain of his colleagues. For politics in the ordinary sense, he had no aptitude. He did not comprehend their language, and he did not shine in that business of discussion by which all normal government must be conducted. On many matters, he spoke with an uncertain voice for he was not quick at comprehending mere matter of detail, and often his colleagues were driven to a justifiable irritation. After the smooth mastery of his earlier career, he was sometimes puzzled and uneasy in the vortex in which he found himself. To his long-sighted eyes, the foreground was always apt to be a little dim, but the vision remained, and if he could not foresee what the day was to bring forth, he was right about the year. More notable than his intellect were those gifts of personality which dominated without effort those who came into contact with him. No man of his time enjoyed a completer public confidence, and he had won it without any of the arts of the demagogue. A diamonic force radiated from him and affected millions who had never seen him. Without being a politician, he had the greatest of the politician's gifts, the power of creating a tradition which, so to speak, multiplied his personality indefinitely and made the humblest and remotest recognize in him their leader. In the dark days of August 1914, he was the one man to whom the nation turned, and without the magic of his name, Britain's stupendous military effort could not have been made. His death was a fitting conclusion to the drama of his life, since the great soldier of England found peace beneath the waves to which England had anew established her title. Footnote. One of the finest tributes to his memory appeared in a journal published in the French trenches. The following is a free translation. Quote, Cyprus nor you shall weave for him their shade. Cyprus nor you shall shield his quiet sleep. Marble must crack, and graven names must fade. He for his tomb hath won the changeless deep we mortal pilgrims bring our transient gift. Fast-fading flowers as garlands for his fame, 
but tis the tempest and the thunderous drift that to eternity shall sound his name. End, quote. End of footnote. For epitaph, let us set down words written of a very different figure, but applicable to all careers of splendid but unfinished achievement. Quote, his work was done, all of his work for which the fates could spare him time. A little space was allowed him to show at least a heroic purpose, and attest a high design. Then, with all things unfinished before him and behind, he fell asleep after many troubles and triumphs. Few can ever have gone wearier to the grave, none with less fear. Forgetful now, and set free for ever from all faults and foes, he passed through the doorway of the ignoble death out of reach of time, out of sight of love, out of hearing of hatred. In the full strength of spirit and of body, his destiny overtook him, and made an end of all his labours. He had seen and borne and achieved more than most men on record. He was a great man, good at many things, and now he had attained his rest. End, quote. end of chapter 55. End of section 7. Section 8 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Fortress Continued and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 56. The Austrian Attack in the Trentino. October 21st, 1915 to June 15, 1916. The achievement of Italy during the first year of war was too little appreciated by the world at large, and even her allies were in some doubt as to its precise character. Her difficulties from the start had been very great. She began with the frontier so drawn at every point as to give the advantage to the enemy. Her main thrust could only be eastwards across the Isonzo. But, alone of the Allies, she had her flank and her communications directly threatened should she pursue her natural line of offensive. And she was compelled to fight hard and continuously on two fronts, to press against the Isonzo barrier, and at the same time to win safety in Carnia, the Dolomites, and the Trentino. Napoleon in 1798 and Messina in 1805 did not dare to cross the Isonzo till Jubert, in the one case, and Ney in the other, had forestalled the danger of an enemy flank attack from the hills. Italy's battlefront was, therefore, not less than five hundred miles from the Stelvio, in the north to the sea at Malfancolo. Moreover, they were five hundred miles of the most difficult miles in Europe. Beyond the Isonzo lay that strange plateau of the Carso, which had long been selected for the Austrian defense. Their trenches and shelters were hewn out of the solid rock, since ordinary field entrenchments were impossible in a land where there was no soil. The enemy had to be ousted from his hold before any advance could be made, and the campaign became, in the strictest sense, an attack upon the fortress. North of the Carso was the town of Gorizia, a formidable entrenched camp defended by 200,000 troops, and with its flanking positions, showing a width of over 60 miles. North and west of the Isonzo was the long horseshoe of the mountain front. Every pass was, to begin with, in Austria's hands, and to win security the enemy had to be pressed back over the watershed. Moreover, on Italy's left flank, the ominous salient of the Trentino ran down into the Lombard Plain, and offered a choice of a hundred starting points for an Austrian assault upon the Italian rear. In strategical anxieties and tactical difficulties, the Italian battleground was one of the worst in the whole area of the campaigns. These military drawbacks found a counterpart in the condition of Italian politics. The great majority of the nation was on the Allied side, but that majority was not prepared for a protracted struggle. 
A short campaign of victory had been the general anticipation. Again, war had only been declared against Austria-Hungary, and Germany was nominally not yet an enemy. The immense purchase, which the latter had won by her control of Italian commerce and finance, made a breach with her unacceptable to many classes. This partial avoidance of the main issue led to some fumbling in Italian policy, and to the intrigues which always attend indecision. Moreover, it prevented the army from being what it was elsewhere, the whole nation in arms. During the long and desperate winter struggle, the troops, which held their own so gallantly among alpine snows and the floods of the Isonzo, did not yet represent the true sum of Italy's fighting strength. If we realize the Italian difficulties, we shall do justice to the magnitude of her achievement. Her intervention, as we have seen, was an invaluable contribution to the Allied strategical purpose. She had drawn against her some of the best troops of the dual monarchy. She had drawn them to a line where they were more or less segregated from the rest of the Austrian forces, for the Italian sector was not an extension of the main eastern front. Hence the Austrian staff were placed in the position that they could not, after the German manner, move rapidly reinforcements to different parts of their line. Owing to the divergent nationalities under their command, they were unable to treat their armies as a homogeneous whole which could be moved solely according to military considerations. The existence of the Italian front, therefore, hampered that mobility on which the central powers, holding the interior lines, chiefly relied. During the winter there was a steady pressure along the whole frontier, even in regions where the weather seemed to compel inaction. October and November saw considerable activity against the positions protecting Gorizia. On 21st October, after an artillery preparation of 50 hours, the third main assault since the declaration of war was made on the Isonzo front. The fighting was fierce along the rim of the Dobredo Plateau and towards San Martino, and some trenches were captured on the Podgora Height. At the same time, in the Trentino, troops descending from Monte Altissimo cut the Austrian communications by the direct road from Riva to Roveritu. The bombardment on the Isonzo continued for a fortnight, and much damage was done to Gorizia itself, for the trenches were gained on Podgora, and on 20th November the village of Oslavia, northwest of Gorizia, was carried, while on the Carso ground was one on the north slopes of Monte San Michel, and southwest of San Martino. Till the end of the month the struggle went on, but the enemy was now reinforced, and in the first days of December the battle died away. The Italians had won a narrow strip along the western edge of the Carso, and had improved their position at Podgora, but they were still far from bursting through the formidable Austrian defenses. For the main achievement of the winter campaign, we must look to the great hills. It is probable that history has never seen such mountain warfare, as was now waged from the Stelvio round the skirts of the Trentino, among the limestone crags of Coduri in Carnia, and down the dark gorges of the upper Isonzo. During the summer and early autumn, the main passes had been won by Italy. The great Austrian lateral railway through the Pustathol was under the fire of the guns behind Cristallo. Far up into the glaciers and on the icy ridges were Italian observation posts directing the guns behind the cliffs, and the heavy guns themselves were often emplaced at heights usually reached only by the mountaineer. There were batteries at an elevation of 9,000 feet, of which each gun weighed 11 tons, the carriage 5 tons, and the platform 30 tons. Many of the engineering and transport feats almost surpassed belief. But not only did men and guns reach unheard of eyries, but they were able to maintain themselves there during the winter storms. It was difficult enough in the summer, when the Alpini, in their scarpetta di gata, or string sole shoes, climbed the smooth white precipices of Tefano and Cristallo. But in winter, when ice coated the rocks, and among the high peaks of the western Tarantino, 
avalanches hung poised on every cliff. It became the sternest trial of human endurance. He who has mountaineered in the Alps in winter is aware that extraordinary climbs may be made, given fair weather conditions. But he knows, too, that the day must be picked, and that nature may not easily be defied. But the work of Italy's mountain defenders went on by day and night, and stayed not for the wildest weather. Food and ammunition must be brought up to the high post at whatever cost. Much was done by the filori, or aerial cables, on which a load of half a ton could travel, in the same way as in Norway, the hay crop is sent down from the high cedar meadows to the deep-cut valleys, but no mechanical device could seriously lessen the constant difficulties and dangers. It must be remembered, too, that in the mountains, the Italian Alpini, by no mean antagonists, whoever knows the hardy people of Tyrol, will not underrate their hillcraft and courage. There were desperate encounters in that icy wilderness, of which the tale has not been told, and when the snow melted, grim sights were to be seen. On Monte Nero, one morning the Italian line saw suddenly a new army on the hillside, standing in a strange attitude. There were six hundred Austrian corpses, frozen stiff, which the summer sun had rescued from the shroud of snow. In the middle of March, 1916, the guns began to sound again on the Isonzo. Gorizia and the Doberto Plateau were bombarded and for a week or two there were attacks and counterattacks. But the spring floods made progress difficult, and the only result of the action was to inspire the Austrian staff with the firm belief that Cordona contemplated an offensive in this quarter as soon as summer had come. The chief activity of the early spring was in the hill country. The night of 17th April saw one of the great mining exploits of the campaign. West the Falzarego Pass, which runs through Cortino to Bozen, stands a bold, round-topped spur just inside the Austrian frontier, which commands all the western road. It is called the Caldolana, and in November 1915, its summit was taken by Colonel Peppino Garibaldi. But the summit could not be held, and while the Italians controlled the greater part of the mountain, the Austrians kept their foothold on the northern slopes. It was resolved to blast the enemy from his stronghold, and in the middle of January, mining operations were begun under the guidance of a son of the Duke of Samanetta. The tunnel took three months to complete. Before the end, the Austrians grew suspicious and started countermining, but their direction was wrong. On the night of 17th April, the Italian mine was exploded and the remnants of the Austrian position were carried by infantry. The crater thus formed was 150 feet wide and 50 feet deep. About the same time, a brilliant action was fought far to the west, where the Adamello group separates the upper waters of the Oglio from the streams that feed La Garda. The Austrians held the crest, and the Italians were in position far down on the great Adamello glacier and on the rock ridges that cut it. Colonel Giordano, commanding an Alpini detachment, resolved to push the enemy from the crest. On the night of the 11th April, 300 Alpini left the Refugio Garibaldi on skis and reached the glacier in a whirlwind of snow. The place is 10,000 feet above the sea, and in April its climate is arctic. After struggling on through the night, they attacked the Austrian position in the early morning and drove them from the rocks of the glacier. This exploit was followed on 29th April by a bigger movement. In a clear starlit night, 2,000 Alpini followed the same route, forced the Austrians from the main crest, and, after severe fighting, in which they were assisted by a battery of six-inch guns, which had been brought up to the very edge of the glacier, dominated the head of the Val di Genova and so won a position on the flank of the Austrian lines in the Val Guida Caria. Giordano was promoted major general, and fell a few weeks later in the Trentino battles. The Austrian front was now divided into three main sections. From the sea to Tolmino lay the 5th Army, 
and the Burbit von Bronjo. North from Tomino to Carnia lay the 10th Army under von Rohr, and the 14th Tyrol Corps defended the Pustathal line to the north of Kadori. In the Trentino itself lay two Austrian armies, that of Danko and Van Kovis, the whole under the command of the Archduke Charles, the heir to the Austrian throne. Between them, these forces probably aggregated a million men, with 600,000 combatants in line. Throughout the winter, there had been a gradual strengthening of one section of the front. That part of the Trentino, between the Val Lagarina and the Val Sugano. Large numbers of batteries had been brought to the Volgario and Lavaroni Plateau, southwest of the city of Trent. The infantry strength was also increased during April by picked troops from the whole Austrian front. The Italian staff were aware of the concentration, but they anticipated no more than a local counterattack, such as they had seen in April on the Isonzo. In that view, they erred, for the Archduke Charles was preparing one of the major offenses of the war. In the previous December, when the war on the Russian and Balkan fronts had slackened for the time, the Austro-Hungarian staff had proposed a breakout from the Trentino salient against the flank and rear of Cordona's lines, in the hope of putting Italy out of the war. Falkenhayn refused his consent, on the ground that he could not spare German divisions, to replace the troops taken from the Galician front. That if Cordona were driven back into the plains, it would not mean the end of Italy's resistance, and that, even if it did, England and Russia, the two pillars of the Entente, would not be deeply grieved to see a partner who did so little and asked so much out of the business altogether. The proposal was therefore dropped for the moment, but it was revived in the spring, and the Austro-Hungarian general staff, determined to carry out the plan with their own resources. The friction between the two staffs was growing, and Austria was resolved to do something to solve her wounded pride and to exploit the weakness of Italy's strategic position. In the Trentino, she had accumulated a total of some 400,000 men, and out of that she had a striking force of 15 picked divisions. The obvious objective for an enemy in the Trentino was the plain of Venetia, through which ran the two railway lines, which were the main communications of the Isazo front. The northern ran by Brescia, Verona, Vicenza, and Casafranca to Udine, the southern by Mantua and Padua to Malfanconi. If one was cut, the Isazo army would be crippled and compelled to retreat. If both fell, it would be in deadly danger, as at Verdun. The army of attack was to be commanded by the heir apparent, but dynastic and military interests were interwoven in Teutonic strategy. At the beginning of May, the Italian position in the southern Trentino ran from a point just south of Reverito, in the Val Lagarina, eastward, up to the Val Tarignolo, north of the mountain mass called Pesubio. Thence it stretched northeastward, just inside the Austrian frontier, facing the enemy lines of the Bulgario Plateau. From the hill called Soglio d'Aspio, it went due east and then north, just outside the old frontier line, to the Sima Mondariolo, from which point it ran north across the valley of the Brenta to Monte Carlo, northwest of Borgo. Thence it passed northeast to the Val Calamento. The front had elements of dangerous weakness, on the extreme left of the position at the north end of the Zogna Ridge, the peak called Zogna Torta, was a salient exposed to the enemy's fire from three sides. The left center and center were also precarious, being commanded by the Admiral Austrian gun positions on the Volgario and Lavaroni plateaus. The whole front was really a string of advanced posts, which any resolute attack must speedily push in. The true Italian front was the second line, which ran from the Zogna Ridge to the Vesuvio Massif, along the hills north of the Val Pacino to the upper Astico, across the north and higher part of the Seti Comuni Plateau, reaching Val Seguno east of Borgo, at the glen of the little river Masso. Here again, the left center was badly situated, 
who have behind it there along their slopes fall into the Pacino and Astico valleys. Obviously, the main peril was on the flanks, for in the Val Lagarina and the Val Sugano, there were roads and railways to support an enemy advance. In these valleys, defensive positions were good, but there was always the danger that they might be turned by a thrust of the enemy's center through the intervening mountains. There were three roads along which troops and guns could move. One, the best, ran from the Val Lagarino up the Velasa to Chiesi, and thence by a good pass to the town of Shio just above the plain. Another ran from the Vulgaria Plateau down the glen of the Astico to the little town of Asiero. A third ran from the Lavaroni Plateau down the Valdassa to the town of Asiago. Shio, Asiero, and Asiago were all connected by light railways with the trunk line running through Vincenza, and Asiago was only eight miles from Vestano in the valley of the Lower Brenta. To get the Shio road, the Austrians must carry Pesuvio, which commanded it. To win Asiario was easier, but in order to debauch from it, they must get the ridge just south of it, the last line of the mountain defense. In the same way, while Asiago offered an oozy prey, to make use of the gain, they must clear the Seti Comuni Plateau to the south of it, so called from its seven villages, which long ago were a German settlement. In any great assault, these three points, Pesubio, the ridge south of the Val Pocino, and the Seti Comuni upland, would form the last rallying ground of the defense. If they fell, the road to the plains was open. In December, Falkenhayn, had told Conrad von Herzogdorf that in the Trentino he could not secure a strategic or tactical surprise, since the deployment would be limited to a single railway. In this view, the German chief of staff was wrong, for Cordona was caught napping. The Italian commander-in-chief had staked everything on a short war and a dash for Trieste, and when this failed he seemed unwilling to evolve an alternative plan. A competent soldier of the old school, he was somewhat lacking in mental elasticity, and new facts dawned was slowly on his mind. A native obstinacy made him tenacious of his own opinion and impatient of advice, and commanders who differed from him were apt to be summarily removed. He refused to admit the menace from the Trentino, and treated the First Army which held that front so casually that it became known as the convent lesson corps. Its commander, Roberto Brassati, had warned him from February onward of the impending danger, but Cordona was deaf, and Brassati suffered the fate of faithful counselors and was dismissed from his command. Footnote. For three years he carried the whole blame of the mischance, till his reputation was completely cleared by the findings of a commission of inquiry. End of footnote. Nevertheless, the high command was not wholly at ease, and the new commander, Pecori Giraldi, was allowed to strengthen the flanks of the first army in the Val Lagarina and Val Sugano, which were obviously the vital points. But the repentance came too late, and before the work could be completed, the Archduke Charles had launched his attack. The great bombardment began on 14th May, over 2,000 guns, of which at least 800 were heavies, opened on a front at 30 miles. The Italian front line was blasted away, and from the 15-inch naval guns and the howitzers in the Folgario and Lavaroni positions, shells were thrown into Asiago itself. The Italian advance lines fell back at once in the center, but resisted fiercely on the flanks at Sogna and west of Borgo. On the 15th and 16th, there was a severe struggle on the Zogna Ridge, and on the 17th, the Italian left retired from Zogna Torta towards the Coney Zogna Crest far the south. Next day, all the section from Monte Maggio to Soglio d'Aspio was abandoned, and on the following day, the 19th, the center in the upper glen of the Astico was driven from the position Monte Terraro, Monte Campolano, Spitz Tonezzo. Things went better on the right, but the defeat of the sentiment 
that the as the arrow plateau must fall. That day the Italian line ran from Conizugno or the Vesuvio Massif, and then, waveringly, north of the Val Pacino and across the Seti Comuni tableland to the Val Saguno. On 20th May, Cadorna decided to withdraw his center to a position well in the rear. The north side of the Val Pacino was no place to hold, so the Italians fell back to the southern bridge and to a line in the Seti Comuni east of the Val d'Aza. This withdrawal was completed by the 24th in good order, but the Austrian advance did not allow the defense time to prepare its new ground. Many prisoners had been lost in the past days, and the casualties were heavy, though the enemy had also suffered severely whenever he came out from the shelter of his guns. By the 25th, the Austrians were violently attacking Konizogna and Pasubio, and had made it the latter a salient, since they had pushed up the Reverito Shio Road between it and Konizogno, as far as the hamlet of Chiesi, under the Buoli Pass. If the advance continued, Pasubio must fall, and if Pasubio fell, the whole Italian center south of the Von Pausina was turned, and the way was open to the Venetian plains. Meantime, Cadorno had summoned his reserves, a new army, to assemble in and around Vincenza. This was the Fifth Army, which had been already concentrated between the Tagliamento and the Azonzo for the offensive against Gorizia. In ten days it began to appear on the skirts of the hills, a total of little less than half a million men. But it could not arrive in force before 2nd June, and to be ready so soon, was a real feat of organization and transport, and it was necessary for Bacori Giraldi to hold the fort for the critical last week of May. Some local reserves were brought to aid him, including one division which in a single night was moved by motor from Carnia to Pasubio. By the 25th, while Pasubio and the Pasino position were threatened, the Italian right in the Val Sagano had managed to retire in good order east of Borgo to its prepared line on the east bank of the Masso Torrent. But the right center in the Seti Comuni was in hard case. On the 25th and 26th, it was driven off all the heights east of the Val d'Aza. On the 27th, the Austrians were south of the Gal Marara, a tributary of the Asa on the left bank. On the 28th, they had occupied the mountain called Moschichi, just north of Asiago. While things were going thus ill on the right center, the Italian left was fighting the action which marked the critical point in the battle. For days, a desperate struggle raged for Conizogna and Pasubio, and especially for the pass of Buoli, which would give the enemy access to the lower Adigi. There, in spite of the Austrian mastery in guns, the Italians managed to remain in their makeshift trenches till they could get to grips with the bayonet. Again and again the waves of attack rolled forward, broke, and ebbed. On 30th May came the climax. The Austrian infantry in masses assaulted the pass of Buoli, but the defense did not yield one yard. On that day, 7,000 Austrians fell, and in the weeks fighting some 40% of their effectives perished. By their fortitude at this supreme moment, the Italians had blunted the point of the whole Austrian spear thrust. But the battle was still far from its end. The enemy now endeavored to take Pasubio, attacking on three sides, from the ridge of Col Santo, from Chiesi, and from the Val Terragnolo, by the Barcoli Pass. His superiority in men was great, and in guns greater, but the resolute defense did not break. For three weeks in the snow of the ridges had battled heroically against odds, till the assault slackened, weakened, and then died away. Meantime, the Italian center was scarcely less highly tried. The battleground lay in two sections, the left along the ridge, which runs from Vesuvio south of the Pocina, the right across the Seti Comuni tableland. On 25th May, the Austrians took Batali on the Pocina, and the height of Simone, which dominated Assi Arrow. On the 28th, they were across the Pacino, 
and fighting for the Southern Bridge, the last line of defense before the plains. On 30th May, they won the peak of Priya Foro, one of the points on the ridge, and to the east were on the heights just north of Asiero. By that day, the Italians had evacuated both Asiero and Asiago, and at the latter place, the enemy was east of Val Campobono, and within four miles of the Val Sagono, well to the rear of the Italian front in that valley. In the center, he was all but looking down on Scio. On 1st June, an Austrian army order informed the troops that only one mountain remained between them and the Venetian plain. Three days later, the Italians were driven east of the Val Canaglia to the southeast of Asiero. The enemy was only 18 miles from Vincenza and the trunk line. But he had exhausted his strength. He had been held on the wings, and this nullified the success of his center. Already on 27th May, he had asked for a division from Prince Leopold's army group, and Falkenhayn realized that the situation had grown critical. On 3rd June, Cordona announced that the Austrian offensive had been checked. He had got his new army. Moreover, the troops already in line had taken the measure of the enemy. The Italian position now ran from Zagna Torta to Presubio, then well south of the Porcino to the Astico, southeast of Asiero, east of the Val Canaglia, along the southern rim of the Asiago Plateau, to east of the Val Campololo, and then north along the edge of the tableland that drops to the Val Sagano. While the new army was preparing its attack, a ceaseless struggle went on, on the Pacino Heights and in the Seti Comuni. In the first sector, the enemy sought to reach Gio and the plains, and in the second to turn the Italian right in the Val Saguno. If this fighting represented the great effort of the Austrian offensive, it was not less the supreme effort of the heavily tried defense. On the night of 4th June, Chiovi, the last Italian position south of the Pacino, was violently assailed, and again on 12th June, when the whole ridge was blasted by the great guns. On the 13th, the attack was renewed without success, but the Italian brigade which held the place lost 70% of its strength. In the Seti Comuni, the main points of attack were Monte Sengio and Val Canaglia and the Val Frenzelli, where the enemy was within four miles of Vestania in the Val Sagano. On the 15th June, and for the two days following, the troops on Monte Fowl, the southern edge of the Seti Comuni, repulsed what proved to be the last of the great Austrian assaults. The action declined into an artillery duel, and a week later Cordono had begun to move forward in his counterstroke. The Austrian attack in the Trentino had deferred, but not for long, Italy's main offensive plan. It had been costly to the defense, and had shown some of the bloodiest combats of the war. Shelling with great guns among those peaks was a desperate business, for whereas elsewhere there was deep soil to limit the effects of the percussion, there among rock walls the result was as shattering as on the deck of a steel battleship. The test proved and tempered the resolution of the Italian soldier. It awoke certain sections of the people, who were still apathetic to the realities of war, and, as is usual in a democracy when things go wrong, it led to the formation of a new ministry. Salandra fell from power, and a cabinet was formed under Signor Boselli, with Sonino still in charge of foreign affairs. Through the whole Italian army went a wave of honest pride, which is due of those who had suffered much and held their ground. But the true moral, the inefficiency of the military hierarchy at the top, was missed, and it was the Prime Minister who dared to criticize it that suffered. The sixteen months longer the valor of the troops was to be misused in blind and ill-considered attacks, till a crushing disaster dispelled the legend of infallibility which had too long shrouded the high command. The vital consequences of Austria's attack were to be found in the field of general strategy. She had crowded her men and guns into a deep salient, served by few railways, and some hundreds of miles from her main battleground. In grips 
there was a determined enemy. She could not easily or quickly break off the battle should danger threaten elsewhere. And danger, deadly and unlooked for, speedily threatened. For on Sunday, 4th June, the day after Cadorna proclaimed the check of the invasion, Brusilov had launched his thunderbolt on the Galician front. End of chapter 56section nine of a history of the great war volume three the beleaguered fortress continued and the great sallies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a history of the great war volume three by john buchan chapter fifty seven brusilov in galicia June 3rd, August 11th, 1916, Part 1 Since the failure of the advance in the Lake Norwich region in April, quiet had reigned on the long front between the Gulf of Riga and the Romanian border. May brought the Austrian eruption into Italy, but Alexiev made no sign of movement, at a time when Cadorna was sorely tried and it looked as if the Archduke Charles would reach the Venetian plains. The power which had not yet failed an ally at need remained inactive. Russia had her own plan, and it took time to mature. She was making ready for the great combined ally offensive, which was due as soon as Germany should have spent her strength at Verdun, and the new British troops and guns were ready for action. It had taken her a long winter to make her preparations, to drill her reserves, to improve her communications, and to collect munitions. Ivanov's Christmas attack at Cernovitz and Everett's spring offensive towards Vilna had been only local assaults with a local purpose. The coming advance was conceived on a far greater scale and with a far wider strategic purpose. At a given signal, in conjunction with all her allies, she would sweep forward and that device of Germany's which had hitherto checked her, the power of moving troops at will by good internal lines, would be defeated. For if the Teutonic League were attacked everywhere at once, there would be no troops to move. But no great plan can be followed to the letter, and the man who sticks too rigidly to a program is not a soldier but a pedant. The Russian offensive, as originally planned, was to be undertaken by Everett's western group west of Molodechno, with the 4th, the 10th, and the new guard army. But during May it was becoming clear that Italy might be so hard-pressed that she would have to use in defense all the resources which he had allotted to her share in the joint offensive. The date for the main movement was not put forward, but it was resolved to use the new might of Russia, in a preliminary attack against the Austrian section of the Eastern Front to ease the pressure on Italy. At the same time, all was put in readiness to follow up any successes that might be gained, and to merge, should it seem desirable, the preliminary attack in the main operation. On the first day of June, the Austro-German armies south of Pinsk lay on the following lines. From the small salient east of that city, their front ran nearly due south, following at first the left bank of the steer, but crossing to the right bank above Rafalovka. East of Charterisk, it left that river, and ran south till it cut the lemberg rovno railway just east of Dovno. It crossed the Galician frontier north of Tarnopol, which town was in Russian hands and followed the Stripna a few miles to the east of the stream. It reached the Dniester, west of Uziesko, where the Russians held the river crossing, and then turned east along the northern shore, curving round to the Romanian frontier on the Pruth, a dozen miles from Zernovitz. This sector was held by four armies. Astride the Pripet lay Linz again, and south to the Steer, the Archduke Joseph's Austrian Fourth Army, from just south of Lutsk to west of Tarnopol, lay Boone Amoli's Austrian Second Army, 
Thence Baltimore's southern army carried the front to the Dniester, while south of it laid the seventh Austrian army under Flans or Bolton, down to the Romanian frontier. It was the old line which, with new dints at Usiesco and east of Chernovitz, they had held throughout the winter. Opposite this force lay the Russian southwestern army group, which till April was in the hands of Ivanov. Recalled to staff duties at the imperial headquarters, he was succeeded by Brusilov, who had commanded the Eighth Army through the storm and shine of the Carpathian struggle of 1914-15. Brusilov was one of the most war-worn of all the Russian commanders, though he had been continually in action since the first day of the campaign. But he was born, if ever man was, with a faculty for storm and turbulence, and twenty-two months of conflict had left no mark on his eager spirit. He was recognized by all as an incomparable leader of troops, but doubts had been expressed as to whether he had the capacity for controlling large and complex operations, whether his talents were not more suited for a cavalry dash or a stonewall retreat than for the methodical stages of scientific warfare. He had four armies in his charge, on his right his old Eighth Army, now under General Kaladin, who, like his forerunner, was a cavalryman. Next, the Eleventh, under Sakharov, once Karapatkin's chief of staff in Manchuria. Then the Seventh, under Cherpachev, and lastly the Ninth, under Lechetsky, extending to the Romanian border. Certain misconceptions were prevalent at this time in the West, with regard to the nature of the Austro-German front in Volhynia, Galicia, and the Bukovina. It was assumed to be a fluid and makeshift affair in contrast with the serried fortifications of the West. This much was true, that in large tracts, where the line extended through the woods and swamps of Polesia, there was no continuous front, any more than there was a continuous front in the marshes of the Somme. That was inevitable from the nature of the country, nor was there anything like that consistent and intricate strength which two years of labor had produced in France and Flanders, since at the most this eastern line had been established for eight months. But it would be an error to regard the Austrian sector as mere improvised field shelters. The trench lines were numerous and good, the dugouts deep and commodious, the wire entanglements on a liberal scale. They were well-constructed, if not always well-sighted, reserve positions. The communications were admirable, far better than anything behind the Russian front. New roads and a great number of light railways connected the firing trenches with the trunk lines of Galicia. In mechanical industry, the Austrians showed themselves apt pupils of their German masters. Nothing was left undone to ensure the comfort of the officers commodious subterranean dwellings and elegant cabins, embowered in the woods, amazed the oncoming Russians with evidences of a luxury which was unknown in their hardy lives. Like the Germans on the Somme, the Austrians behaved as if their front had grown stable and could not be broken, and they were resolved to make it a pleasant habitation. The fault of Austria did not lie in negligent fatigue work, but in an underestimate of the enemy before her. She did not believe that Russia could move yet a while, and she had depleted her long front of both men and guns. The strongest fortifications on earth cannot be held against a resolute foe unless there is also a superior artillery behind them, and infantry adequate in quality and numbers to man them. There were no strategic reserves left to meet an attack and too many batteries had gone west to the Trentino. Above all, the Austrian infantrymen had not the fighting value of the Russian. They were good troops on the Galician front, but the average was not equal to that of their opponents. There was not the same national impetus behind them, and there was a strange lack of touch between the higher and the regimental commands, and between officers and men. Armies bundled about like pawns at the bidding of an alien staff could not have the dash or the tenacity of men who fought for a cause they understood under the command of tried and trusted leaders. 
we must conceive of Brusilov's plan as in the first instance strictly a reconnaissance, a reconnaissance made on an immense scale and with desperate resolution, but still a reconnaissance rather than a blow at a selected objective. His strategy was not yet determined. Behind the enemy's front lay vital points like Covell and Lemberg and Stanislaw, but the way to each was long and might be hopeless. His business was to test the strength of the enemy lines on a front of nearly 300 miles between the Perpet and Romania. When he knew its strength, he would know his own purpose. He was like a man beating at a wall to discover which parts are solid stone and which are lath and plaster. But each blow was to be delivered with all his might, for this was a test of life and death. May had been a month of heavy rains, and the wet lowlands south of the Pripet and around the lowest steer made a bad campaigning ground. It was better southward among the sandy fields in the oak woods of Volhynia, and on the Galician plateau summer conditions reigned. On Sunday, 4th June, a steady methodical bombardment opened along the whole of Brusilov's front. It appeared to be directed chiefly on the wire entanglements, and not on the trenches, and at first the hinterland was scarcely touched. The preparation was intense and incessant, but it bore no relation to the overwhelming destruction which had preluded Neuve Chapelle and the Donajets, Los and Verdun. It seemed rather like the local bombardments which preceded the trench raids of the winter, only it fell everywhere, and when, late on Saturday, the Austrian high command realized this, they grew puzzled and cast about for an explanation. They were not left long in doubt. The work of the Russian guns was short, twelve hours only in some places, and nowhere more than twenty hours. The Austrian trenches had been little damaged, but alleys had been plowed in the wire before them. On the morning of Monday, 5th June, between the Pripet and the Prut, punctually to the hour, the waves of Russian infantry crossed their parapets. It will be convenient in considering a series of actions of the first order in magnitude and complexity to take the different sections of the battleground in sequence and carry the narrative of the events in each to the close of the first stage of the forward movement. The sections were five in number, that from Kolki northwards to the Frippet, where Kaladin's right was engaged, with Linsingen, that between Kolki and Dubno, the Volhynia Triangle, where Kaladin's left and Sakharov's right faced the Austrian Fourth Army, that between Dubno and Zolotsi, where Sakharov's left was in conflict with Bohem Ermoli, that between Zalitsitz and the Dniester, where in front of Ternopol, Cherbachev and Gage Lothmer, and the corridor between the Dniester and the Prut, where Lichitsky faced blinds of Belton. It was in the second and fifth of these sections that the first fortnight of June showed the chief results. North of Kolki, where the brimming swamp still made progress difficult, little impression was made on Linsingen's front. It was different in the area of the Volhynian Triangle. Between Lutz and Rovno lies a district some thirty miles long, from north to south, which is defined on these sides by the river Ikva, a confluent of the Steer, and the river Putolovka, a tributary of the Goran. Here the armies of Kaladin and Sakharov made their great effort. About the center lies the village of Olika, in the midst of a rolling treeless country. For the attack, the Russians had the good Rovno Lutsk and Rovno Brody railways besides the main Rovno-Lutz High Road. From Olika, they pressed due west, and farther south they advanced down the Ikva Valley along the Dubno-Lutz Road. By noon of the first day, the Austrian front was completely gone. The bayonets of the Russians swept over the parapets, while the barrage cut off all communication with the rear. The result was that the elaborate Austrian trenches and deep dugouts proved the veriest trap. Troops were packed and huddled in them without any means of escape and were captured in thousands by the triumphant Russian infantry. 
the Cossacks went through and rounded up those who had escaped the barrage. That day in Lutsk, the birthday of the Archduke Joseph was being celebrated, when news came that the front had been driven in, and that the enemy was sweeping towards the steer. Confidence was placed for a moment in the great strength of the Lutz defenses, but there comes a stage in demoralization when no fortifications seem adequate. On Tuesday, 6th June, Kaladin was at its gates, and in the afternoon the Austrian army commander sought safety in flight. At twenty-five minutes past eight in the evening, the Russian vanguard entered the town and found an amazing booty. Batteries of heavy guns and vast stores of shells and material fell to the conqueror, and since there had been no time to evacuate the hospitals, many thousands of Austrian wounded were added to the total of prisoners. Lutz was taken and the steer and Ikva crossed, but it was necessary to broaden the wedge if an acute salient was not to be the result of the victory. Accordingly, the next few days were spent in advancing north and south of Lutsk, and especially in winning the points where the Ravno Lusk and the Ravno Brody railways crossed respectively the Steer and the Ikva. On 8th June, these two points, Rojitski and Dovno, were the scene of heavy fighting. Next day, both fell, thus giving Russia the third and last of the Volhynian fortresses. The Ikva was also crossed at Milinov, and the advance pushed west and southwest, till by the 13th, Kozen, a village halfway between Dubno and Brody, had been taken, as well as Demidovka, to the northwest, and all the forest land between. West of Lutz, the Cossacks were ranging the country far and wide, and by the 13th, had reached Satursky, halfway to Vladimir Volinsk, while farther north they were on the upper streams of the Stockland. Kaladin and Sakharov had cut a semicircle out of the enemy front, of which the radius was nearly forty miles. Farther north, Kaladin's right wing was now making some progress. Kolki itself fell on 13th June, and since the line of the upper steel was gone, and the enemy driven back behind the Stockard. Svidniki, on the latter stream, was taken after a violent battle, and in the crossing of the river a complete German battalion was captured by Siberian troops. South of the main battleground, the Russian front was pushed down to the Galician border near Radzivilov and Alexinitz. By 16th June, after 12 days of fighting, Kaladin, with the assistance of Sakharov's right wing, had advanced some fifty miles from his original line. He had captured Lusk and Dubno. He had reached the Galician frontier and was at one point within twenty-five miles of Covell. He had taken prisoner over thirteen hundred officers and seventy thousand men, and had captured fifty-three guns and colossal quantities of every type of war material. After the long months of trench contests, this sudden and dazzling sweep restored to the world it's all notions of war. It was time to call a halt and await the counterstroke when the torrent first fell on the Austrian front. Hindenburg sent from the north such reserves as he was able to spare. Certain land fair and land stormed regiments came from Prince Leopold's army in the marshes and several German divisions from the Davina front. Ludendorff was dispatched post haste to straighten out the tangle, and the Volhynian part a Bowen or Molly's command was put under Linz again. But after 16th June, more formidable reinforcements began to appear. Austrian troops were coming from Tyrol in the Balkans, and German divisions were hurried from France. How great was the urgency may be judged from the fact that the German corps moved from Verdun to Covell in six days. These reserves were not fresh troops, and some of them had been severely ground in the Verdun Mill, but they were the best that the emergency could produce. Covell was the danger point, for if Covell fell, the main lateral communications would be cut between Lemberg and Brest-Litovsk, between the armies of the center and the armies of the south. For the defense of Covell, accordingly, every available man was brought into line. The new German army of maneuver under Linsingen, taking to itself the 
area of the steer in Stockholm, and the Austrians the sections from Vladimir Volinsk to the Bug. Lunzingen's counterattack opened on 16th June and was pressed with gradually ebbing vigor till the end of the month. He did not fight with all the reinforcements he had expected, for on 13th June, Evert, on the Russian center, had attacked north of Baranovichi, and though he failed to break the German front, his thrust detained their divisions, which would otherwise have been marching south. We may here conveniently summarize the various actions on the northern and central sections of the Russian front, which were fought during the Great Southern Offensive. Baran Novichy stood on the plateau close to the watershed between the river Sevech, which joined the Neman, and the Shara, which flowed to the Pripet. It was an important railway junction, with the Vilna Rovno line met the railway from Smolensk to Brest Litovsk. The possession of the place by the Germans should have cut the lateral communication of the Russian armies, but a switch line had been constructed behind their front to link up the broken part. Perinovici, therefore, did not mean a great deal to Russia, but it represented an amount, amount to Germany, for it was a nodal point of the whole railway system between Vilna and brest litovsk Hence, any attack on the place was sure to be strongly resisted and to draw in all adjacent reserves. Moreover, in the event of success, any gain in this region would pave the way for a converging attack by Ebert and Brusilov on Brest Litovsk. In the beginning of June, the Russian Fourth Army under General Rogoza was facing the army group under Warsuk. Rogoza's attack was most elaborately prepared by sapping up to within close distance of the enemy. On the morning of 13th June, the bombardment opened, and at four in the afternoon, the Russian infantry attacked on the front along the upper Shara. Presently, the battle line extended farther south, towards the Ojinsky Canal, and north to the upper streams of the Servek. In the early days of July, when Lusk and Kaladin were preparing their second offensive, Rogoza renewed his efforts. On 2nd July, the German trenches received a baptism of fire, which had scarcely been paralleled in the campaign. To the Russians, it was their revenge, but that on the jets, all the bitterness wrote one officer, the sufferings with which was strewn the long path of our retreat were poured out in this fire. But Warsaw's men resisted stubbornly. By 4th July, Rogoza had penetrated the enemy's lines to a depth of two miles on a front of twelve. But by 9th July, it was clear that the advance had reached its limit. On 14th July, Warsaw attempted a counterstroke without success, and thereafter the battle died away. It had fulfilled its purpose, for at a critical moment in Brusilov's movement, it had disorganized the enemy's plan and divided his forces of resistance. The result was assisted by the attack of Radko Dmitriev on 16th July with the 12th Army from the Riga Bridgehead, a holding battle which lasted till the end of the month. Lensingen's aim, east of Kovel, was to check the enemy and wrest from him the initiative, to achieve a counterstroke which would give a breathing space to the rest of the shattered front. In this object, he partially succeeded, for during the fortnight, Kaladin's triumphant course was stayed. The counterstroke was delivered by three enemy groups, in the south of the salient, on the line lokachev gorachev in the center, between the vladimir volensk road and Sivitniki on the Stockhart, and from the north against the rojitsky kolki sector of the Steer Line. The immediate result was that Kaladin had to retire from Sivitniki and the western bank of the Stockhart. The action was now joined on the west bank of the Steer, on a line dipping southwest to Kisselin at the Stockhart source. At Gatomichki, on the Steer, just west of Kolki, the fighting was especially furious, and the place changed hands several times in the course of one day. At the other end of the line, the village of Varenchin, northeast of Kisselin, was the chief center of the struggle, south of Vladimir Volinsk Road, 
below Lukarczki and Gorokov, the Austrians made their main effort, attacking in massed formations and winning some successes. Kaladin withdrew his front on his left center, a matter of some five miles to the line, Satursky, Blutov, Lipa. On his right center, apart from the retreat from Savitniki, he held more or less the ground he had gained. The counterattack died down about 20th June, to revive with redoubled violence in the last days of the month. But the second effort was less successful than the first. It kept the Covell Road blocked for Caledon, but it was not that crushing counterstroke which Hindenburg had hoped would take the edge off the Russian temper and crippled the impetus of Pusilov's attack. Germany was aware that the offensive was only beginning in the east, and that presently the fires would blaze on the western front. She strove to scotch the menace in one vital sector, while yet there was time, but only succeeded in postponing it for a fortnight. Going south from Lutsk, we reached the sector dubno Zolotsi, where Sakharov faced Bohan Ermoli. There, with a low watershed between them, run the Ikva and the Seret, in a country of insignificant hills patched with oak woods and wide marshy valleys. Sakharov's right wing, as we have seen, had pushed far on the road to Brody along the railway from Dubno, and had almost reached the frontier station of Radzivilov. For the moment, its role was secondary. It supported the army to the north of it, but did not press on towards Brody. Its main objective, since Cherbachev in the south had found his advance seriously checked, south of the Tarnopol Lemberg Railway, the ground rises from the low downs of Volhynia in the great lift of the Podolian tableland, where the rivers flow south to the Dniester in deep cut wooded canyons. There the Austrian front followed for a little the course of the Sereth, and then struck westward to the glen of the Stripna, on the eastern bank of which it ran till it reached the Dniester. It was a countryside made by nature for defense against an enemy coming from the east. The approaches were open and unsheltered, and the positions themselves offered endless chances for concealing guns and perfecting redoubts. Jervikev made his attack at three main points. The first was between the Tarnopol Lemberg line and Zalost. The second at the left of the plateau around Birkenhof, and the third along the Pushkosh Tanislav Railway. In the first he was firmly held by Bothmer who had rightly argued that any attack would follow the Tarnopol Railway. At Birkenhof, things went better, and the enemy were driven in many places across the Stripna. The left wing of the Russian 7th Army at Bucharest was a success comparable with the great events in Volhynia. On 8th June, Bucharest was carried, the Stripper was crossed, and the advance pushed well to the west of the stream but it was clear that on no grounds of strategy could an army move too far forward in this section with Bothmer's center unbroken to the north of it. In front of it lay the Dniester and the strong bridgehead of Halitz. On its left lay the rugged Dniester defile, with an unconquered country on the other side. An advance ran the risk of being driven southward and pinned against a dangerous river line. Chervachev, Accordingly, was compelled to stay his hand and wait upon developments in the Bukovina. The corridor between the Dniester and the Pruth, which is the main entrance from the east into the Bukovina, afforded no easy access to an invader, as Ivanov had found to his cost in his offensive at Christmas 1915, for it is a corridor blocked by a range of hills, which only in the north break down into the little plain between Dobrovetsky, and the Dniester, a plain, moreover, which is itself blocked from the Bessarabian side by subsidiary foothills. At Christmas, Lachitsky had attempted to force the hills by a frontal assault, and had failed. On the north, the Dniester formed a strong barrier, and of the three main bridgeheads, the two most important, Salischiki and Utsti Bekupi, were in Austrian hands. The third, Osiesko, was Russia's, but the surrounding country did not permit of its serving as a base for crossing in force. The Bukovina 
seem triply armored against attacks from east and north. Lechitsky's plan was to concentrate on the dubious gap between Dobrovetsky and Okna, for if this will once force the line of the Needster at Selichiki, and the range of hills would both be turned. He had the advantage of surprise, for the result of the Christmas battle seems to have convinced Flans of Balton that his position was impregnable. The Russian general aimed at attacking the Okna Dobrovetsky line simultaneously from the east through the corridor and from the north across the Dniester, where the Russian position on the left bank commanded the lower southern shore. On 2nd June, the bombardment began, and on the evening of 4th June, the same day which saw Kaladin sweeping upon Lutsk, the Russian infantry crossed the river towards Okna and the foothills towards Dobrovetsky. It was now clear to Flans of Balton that a desperate crisis had come upon him. He had under his command many of the picked troops of Hungary, and they were flung wildly into the breach. But they were blasted out of their positions by the Russian guns, and forced back in grim hand-to-hand -hand struggles by the terrible Russian bayonets. By 9th June, the Dobrovitsky line had gone, and Lechitsky had taken 347 officers, including one general, 18,000 other ranks, and 10 guns. Flans of Balton fell back along the little branch lines, which led to Sternabitz and Kolomea, with the enemy close at his heels. Salajuki was now turned, and the Russians on 12th June had the bridgehead, and had pushed west to Horodenka, a great road junction which lies some 20 miles northwest of Sternabitz, with the enemy pouring across the Dniester and through the corridor. Flans of Balton's position was hopeless. His force began to break up. Most of it retreated south across the foot, but detachments went west along the road to Kolomea. On 13th June, Lechitsky was in Sniatin and was descending on Chernovitz from the north, whence Austrian officials and German professors were fleeing like the household of Lot from the cities of the plain. The Austrians had evacuated Satagora on the turn of its electric key road and went now across the Prith, attempting to hold the low ridge of hills on the southern bank. In nine days, Lechitsky had taken 757 officers, 37,832 other ranks, and 49 guns. On 16th June, the Russians crossed the Prith, and that night the military evacuation of Cernovitz began. Next day, at four in the afternoon, the conquerors entered the city. Lands of Balton was now in full retreat through the southern Burkovina, towards the Carpathians, leaving behind him masterless detachments at Stanislaw, Kolomea, and along the Dniester. He seems to have hoped to make a stand on the Sarath, the Burkovina river of that name which flows into the Danube. But Lechitsky gave him no time to halt. The day after Chernovitz fell, he was across the Sarath, and on the 21st was 30 miles south of the capital. Columns were meanwhile moving westward, and were presently in Kuti and Piston, on the outskirts of Kolomea. On 23rd June, Kimpalong, the most southerly town of the province, was taken, together with 60 officers and 2,000 men. The country of the beech woods was once again in Russian hands. On this date, 23rd June, closed the first stage of what had been one of the most rapid and spectacular advances in the history of the war. In three weeks, a whole province had been reconquered. Lutz and Dubno had been retaken. The advance was within 25 miles of Covell and with 10 of Brody. The prisoners captured number 4,031 officers and 194,041 of other ranks. 219 guns and 644 machine guns had been taken, besides vast quantities of all war material. Strategically, the first stages had been won in the attack upon the three vital places behind the enemy front, Kovel, Lemberg, and Stanislaw. The Austrian line had been pierced and shattered over wide stretches, and the campaign in these areas translated from the rigidity of trench warfare to something like the freedom of maneuver battles. 
For the first time since the beginning of the war, the Russians were, as regards artillery and munitions, on terms of an approximate equality with their foe, and the decision lay with their incomparable foot and cavalry. In another matter, they were on level terms, in Volhynia and at Borkots. They had railways to support their advance equal to those of their opponents. Brusilov had made brilliant use of this newly acquired advantages, and had conducted his vast operations with the skill of a master. Only the first steps had been taken. The movement was still far from having won a strategic decision, but loss, vast and irreparable, had already been caused to the shrinking manpower of Austria. End of chapter 57, part 1《Section 10 of the History of the Great War, Volume 3 》The Beleaguered Fortress Continued and the Great Sallies This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3 by John Buchan Chapter 57 Brusilov in Galicia June 3rd to August 11th, 1916, Part 2. June had been a month of signal successes, but these successes were incomplete. Brusilov had pushed out two great wedges in Volhynia and the Bukovina, but he could not rest on his laurels. A wedge is leveled to the counterstroke, unless its flanks are guarded by natural obstacles, and this was not the case in Volhynia where the stockard line had not yet been won, and in the south there was a perpetual menace from the direction of Brody and Lemberg. In the Book of Vena, the Carpathians gave security to Lichitsky's left when the time came that he had gained the foothills, but Bothmer's army held the crossings of the Middle Dniester. Until it was forced to retreat, it prevented any advance from Bukos towards Howlitz. The position of Bothma was indeed the crux of the whole matter. The Russians had found, during their great retreat in the summer of 1915, that in eastern Galicia they might be hopelessly outflanked to south and north, and yet be able to retire at their leisure. The parallel river canyons, running to the Dniester, provided an ideal set of successive positions, and now Bothma had the advantage of them. Brusilov's immediate duty, therefore, before moving towards his ultimate objective, was to straighten his front. He must carry the line of the stockard and rest his right flank on the marshes of the lowest steer and the prepit. Similarly, he must take Brody and advance his left wing in Volhynia. Above all, Bothman must be forced back from the stripper to the same longitude as the advance south of the Nester. It was in such a purpose, rather than in a violent struggle for Lemberg or Covell, that we must look for the motive which dominated Brusilov's strategy of the second stage. The first task was to carry forward the right flank to a position of safety. So soon as the German counterattack on the Stalkard in the second half of June had begun to ebb, preparations were made for broadening the Volhynia wedge, the left wing of Everett's central group was the Third Army under Lesch, the general who had taken over the command from Radko Dmitriev in the beginning of the Great Retreat, and had distinguished himself by his resolute holding battles on the south flank of the Warsaw salient. This army was brought south from the Pripet marshes and put under Brusilov's charge. Kaladin drew in his right, and the new force lay along the steer astride of the Kovel Sarny Railway facing Linsingen. On 2nd July, in the Baranovich area, Everett's right wing, as we have seen, struck a second time against Vorich. It was an attack in force, supported with a good weight of artillery, and on a broad front, the enemy's first line was carried and some thousands of prisoners taken. But Hindenburg was not to be caught napping, and presently the advance was checked, with heavy Russian losses and Everett's impetus died away. This thrust of the Russian right center was in itself 
a substantive operation designed to test the enemy's strength in a vital theater. It failed to break his front, but it had one beneficent effect on the operation south of the marshes. It prevented any further reinforcement of Linsingen in front of Covell at the critical moment when Lesch was about to strike. That moment came at dawn on 4th July. From Kolke to north of Rathalovka stretches a wide, wooded plain between the steer and the started. In the south near Kashovka, there are low ridges, but all to the northwards is as flat as the Libyan desert. Coarse grasses and poppies cover the dunes, and between them there are stretches of swamp and great areas of melancholy pine woods. North of Rafalovka, the marshy region of the prepet begins, where there could be no continuous front, but only isolated forts on the knuckles of dry ground, connected by precarious trenches along the lagoons. On this marshy region, Lesh had no designs. It was the protection he desired for his flank. His aim was the sandy plain beyond which, thirty miles to the west, crawled the sluggish stockard. The brilliant weather of June had dried up most of the swamps and given him the one chance which might occur in the twelfth month. The action began with such an artillery preparation as had not yet been seen on the Russian side. The guns opened on a front of more than thirty miles, pounding the Austrian positions east of the steer, between Kolki and Ravalovka. Soon the air was clouded with dust, as the sand of the entrenchments was scattered by shell. The two main attacks were at Kolsky and just north of Rafalovka. The salient formed by the charter risk position, being cut in upon on its two flanks. By the night of the 4th July, Lesh was over the steer north of Rafalovka and had pushed his right as far as Volka Galutsiaskaya, some twelve miles from the river line. Next day, the latter position, defended by three lines of barbed wire entanglements, fitted with landmines, was carried. The stubborn resistance of the Bavarians at Kolki was broken down and the river bridged. The following day, 6th July, Kashtuvnovka, west of Kolodai, was won, and Ratznitsi, north of Kolki, that marked the end of the Chatteris salient. The apex fell back in disorder and by the evening of 7th July, the Russian cavalry were in Manovici Station on the Koval Sarny Railway, about halfway between the steer and the stockard, and the two wings of Lesh's advance had joined hands. Moreover, on his extreme right, on the very fringe of the marshes, he had pushed forward from Yazirsky and had reached the stockard at Nova Cherevizhji, the high road from the latter part to Kolki, by way of Manovici, was now wholly in his hands. On 8th July, in conjunction with Kaladin's right, he crossed the upper stockard at Ugly and Arsenovici, where the river makes a sharp bend to the east. The Russians were now upon the stockard line between the Kovel Rovna and the Kovel Sarny railways. After the first stern grapple, the enemy's retreat had become almost a flight. Through the dry bent of the dunes and the shattered pine woods, the Russian infantry swept forward like men possessed. Nothing stayed their remorseless progress. The enemy fired the villages as he retreated, and in that blazing midsummer weather, Lesh advanced through a land clouded by day and flaming skyward by night. And always in the van went the great Cossack cavalry, clinging to the rear and flanks of the broken infantry. In four days, Lush had advanced twenty-five miles on a front of forty. He had taken three hundred officers, including two regimental commanders, over twelve thousand unwounded men, forty-five guns, including some heavy batteries, and large quantities of machine guns, ammunition, and military stores. Above all, he had won his immediate strategic purpose, the right flank of the Volhynia Wedge, was secured against any counter-stroke. But now that the stockard was reached, the problem became harder. Covell, that vital center, was only some twenty-odd miles distant, and on it converged the two railways, which had been the Russian lines of supply. 
It was clear that Lessington would fight desperately to cover his citadel. The stockade was a marshy stream with wide beds of reeds on either side, and on the western bank the ground rose slightly so as to give the defense better observation. An alternative position had been prepared there during the previous autumn, and every nerve was now strained to make it impregnable. Though the river had been crossed at various points, yet the river line was far from being won, and about the middle of July, the Russian advance had begun to stagnate into ordinary trench warfare. It was about this time that the Russian high command saw fit to announce to the world their intention. On the issue of those battles, so ran the communique, undoubtedly depends not only the fate of Covell and a strongly fortified zone, but also to a great degree all the present operations on our front. In the event of the fall of Covell, new and important perspectives will open out for us for the road to Brett Litovsk, and in some degree the roads to Warsaw will be uncovered. But this was not the usual language of the Russian staff, nor was the language of a prudent general who did not desire to share his secrets with the enemy. It is difficult to regard the announcement as other than a ruse. Brusilov wished Hindenburg to believe that he intended to break his teeth on Cobell, as the crown prince had broken his on Verdun, and thereby to delude him as to the direction of the next effort, for after his fashion, the Russian commander was making plans elsewhere. So far the Russian 11th Army, under Koropatkin's old chief of staff, had played a lesser role than those of Kaladin and Lejitsky. Its right wing had, indeed, crossed the Ikva and collaborated with Kaladin in the thrust north of Lutsk to the Galician border. But now it was cast for a major part, for against the south side of the Lutsk salient, Lutzigan proposed to institute a great offensive, which should do more than counterbalance the Russian gain on the Stockard. The Austrian line, held by Bowen Ermoli's left wing, ran after the Russian withdrawal of the second half of June from the village of Schlunken by Ingrinov and Mikhailikova to the steer, and then south across the little Plashevka through the wooded hills to the frontier town of Radzivilov. It was served by the many roads leading from Lemberg, by the Lemberg-Brody Railway, and, so far as concerned its left wing, by the lemberg stoyanov line. There, in the second week of July, fresh divisions were in process of concentration, some brought from as far afield as the Davina, Ferdon, and the Trentino, an attack and force would, it was hoped, Drive back Kaladin, behind Lutz and Dubno, force Lesh to retreat from the Stockard and wipe out Brusilov's Volhynian gains. The date of the great effort was fixed for 18th July. Brusilov got wind of the plan and resolved to strike hard and quick before the danger had time to mature. Sakharov began to move during the night of 15th July. During the next two days, he forced Bohem Ermoli's center back upon the upper steer. At the same time, he struck against the line Bludov Slotchevka, farther north. On 16th July, pivoting on Bludov, he turned the Austrian flank and shepherded it southward for seven miles. And Mikhaila Lakovka, on that day, he took three huge ammunition dumps which Linsingen had prepared for his army's offensive. The enemy in this sector were was back at Gorokov, where he endeavored in vain to regain ground by counterattacks. On that one day, 16th July, Sakharov took 317 officers, 12,637 men, and 30 guns. Then the dry weather broke, and torrential rains fell, as at the same date they fell on the Somme. But in spite of the difficult country, Sakharov did not halt. He was advancing in a half-moon, forcing the enemy from the north against the Lippa and from the east against the Steer. On 20th July, he attacked and carried Berich Cheko, where, in the 17th century, John Casimir, king of Poland, had routed the invading Tartars, and next day he crossed the Steer 
having in this action taken 300 officers and 12,000 men. He had driven a wedge between the Austrian 4th Army and Bothra by his defeat of Bohem Ermoli, and was now, in effect, swinging south to operate against the left wing of Bothra's army on the Sarath and the Strippa. By 22nd July, the Austrians began to evacuate Brody, remembering the fate of Lutz. It was a place which might have been stoutly defended, but Bohem Ermoli had his left on the steer, and in front of his center had the curve of the river Slotnovka, a broad marsh, and more than a hundred square miles of forest. On his right he had the wooded hills at the source of the Ikva. Sakharov began his attack early on the morning of 25th July. The Russian infantry, creeping through the dark before the summer dawn, crossed the swamp of the Slonovka and forded the stream. In the center they fought their way yard by yard, through the dense forest west of Ratsavilov, and after six attempts took the village of Oberitzi. On the morning of 27th July, the center and right came into line, and by the evening had carried the Kleketov position five miles from Brody. Meantime, the Russian left wing, which had met with less opposition, emerged from the forest southeast of the town. The fate of the place was now sealed, and at 6.30 on the morning of 28th July, Sakharov entered Brody, which had been O.M. Ramoli's headquarters. The battle, one of the bloodiest and sternest fought in the campaign, had been planned out at every detail beforehand by the Russian commander, and Brody fell within 24 hours of the scheduled time. In the three days' fight, the 11th Army took 210 officers and 13,569 men, bring the total of his captures since 16th July to 940 officers and 39,152 of other ranks. Forty-nine guns were part of the immense miscellaneous booty. Even then, Sakharov did not rest. The railway winding southward from Brody to Lemberg joins at the town of Krasny, the great trunk line which runs southeast through Tarnopol to Odessa. The new Russian front between Brody and Zolostsy ran roughly parallel with that line, which was Bothmer's main avenue of communication, some twenty miles distant at Brody, and only ten at Zolotsy. But to reach it, a tangled region of forest and mere had to be crossed, where the steer, the bug, the serath, and the stripper had their springs. All these valleys, with their enclosing ridges, ran at right angles to any Russian advance, and would give the enemy an endless series of strong alternative positions. Only one road crossed the wilderness, that from Brody to Sloskow, another farther east stopped short, halfway at Pianaki. The Austrians seemed to have expected that Sakharov would move towards Krasny on the way to Lemberg. Instead, he advanced to south crossing the ridges east of the most difficult country, to the Pianaki, Potkamanian line. This brought his front parallel to Bothmer's main communications. On 4th August, he attacked the line nushki Zagasi, while Cherbatev's right from Zolotsi attacked also toward the Sarath. By the next evening, Sakharov had won all the villages around the upper Sarath, and the following day, 6th August, was as far south as Renioff, not eight miles from the Tarnopol line. In three days he had taken 166 officers and 8,415 men. On 10th August he was in Nesterovsi, less than five miles from the railway. Bothmer's flank had been completely turned. Meantime, in Pelusia, the new guard army, under Bezer Brasov had been brought south and placed between Lesh and Kaladin. On 28th July, just after midday, it attacked along the upper Stalkhod. In the first hours of the fighting, it broke through the enemy position and took 38 guns and 4,000 prisoners, mostly German. The river was crossed at many points. The cavalry went through, and two days later at one place, the Russians were more than five miles west of Stockholm, The Simkin was forced to relinquish the bend of the river 
at Kashkovka and fell back to a fresh set of prepared positions. But he was now on the alert and the defense, laboriously constructed since the opening of the offensive on 4th June, proved too strong to be broken. On 2nd August, the Russians were on the line, Sitovichy, Yanovka, and next day made a desperate attack on the German position at the village of Rotka, Mirinska. They carried the place, but it formed so acute a salient that, under pressure of counterattacks, they were compelled to relinquish it. This action was one serious failure in the operations, a failure due to imperfect reconnaissance and a complete lack of coordination. By the evening of 9th August, 532 officers and 54,770 rank and file had fallen, and these, the elite of the Russian armies. The control of the Perkovina, which Lachitsky had won in June, had little direct effect upon the campaign in Galicia. The province was strategically self-contained, or rather its importance lay in relation to Romania, since it possessed all the gates into Moldavia. Its road and railway system was in no way vital to the Galician armies, as was proved in the previous year, when Russia held nearly all Galicia and most of the Carpathian passes without control of the Burkovina. But any advance from the east pushed to the west of Kolomea must bring Lachitsky into contact with Bothmer's most indispensable communications. Above Halitz, the Dniester flows through wide belts of marsh, and below Niznov, it enters a rugged canyon. The good crossings, two railways and three roads, were all between these two towns. The southern Galician trunk line ran from Steer to Stanislav and Bukats, and was the main feeder of Bothmer's right wing. Moreover, one of the principal connections with Hungary was the line running from Stanislaw by Dalatin to Maramoris Sikyet, crossing the Jablonitsa Pass. If Lachitsky took Kolomeo, he would cut one of the loops of the Hungarian line which ran from Dalatin by Kolomeo to Stanislaw. If he reached Dalatin, he could cut the line altogether. If he took Stanislaw, he would cut the Street Bukhut's railway, and if he forced the Nister crossings between Halitz and Nizniov, he would turn Bothmer's southern flank and make his position on the stripper wholly untenable. Part of the debris of Flans of Baldwin's army retreated, as we have seen, in the direction of Stanislaw, and passed under Bothmer's command, so that Bothmer's right wing was now holding the Nister crossing from Halitz to Nizniov. Lichki's first business was to take Kolomea. On 28th June, he attacked the Austrians east of that town, on the line nedvitsky pristin stretching from the Nista to the Carpathians. Partly owing to a brilliant flanking movement in the north by the Russian cavalry, the Austrian position collapsed like sand, and that evening, 221 officers and 10,285 men were added to the total of prisoners. The following day, 29th June, the Russians entered Kolomea to find that the enemy had retreated in such haste that the six railways and six high roads which converged there were scarcely damaged. The next stroke must be against the Maramora-Sitsit Stanislaw Railway, but it proved impossible to march up the Proth Valley straight on Delatin. Accordingly, Lichki's left wing moved southward over the wooded hills around Berezov, while his right wing, in conjunction with Chervatev's troops north of the Dniester, advanced against Lubach. On the last day of June, the latter place was carried, principally by a brigade of Circassian cavalry, who charged the trench lines without any previous artillery preparation. This success compelled Bothmer on the north bank, to fall back several miles to conform to the Austrian withdrawal. The Russians were now within ten miles of the vital Nister crossings, and the enemy made a desperate effort to stay their progress. On 2nd July, Bothmer, having received German reinforcements, counterattacked and compelled Lichki to give a little ground of relinquished Lomach. 
The advance of his right wing was for the moment stayed. Meantime, his left flank and center were carrying all before them. On 30th June, the left wing was in Piston and Berezov. On 3rd July, it was only six miles to the Maramaras Zitget Stanislaw Railway, and next day it cut the line. The center pressed on against Elliton itself, and on 8th July, the place was captured. The first vital strategic objective of Lichke's advance had been attained. During the fighting between 23rd June and 7th July, he had taken prisoner 674 officers and 30,875 men, and had captured 18 guns. The July rains were now beginning. The Neister and the Proth were in roaring flood, and all the country south of Stanislaw was under water. In such conditions, a halt had to be called in the most ardent advance, and only the left wing of the Russians, now among the Carpathian Heights, could find dry ground on which to operate. For nearly a month, the fall continued, and then on 7th August, Lechitsky struck again. This time it was on his right wing, towards Stanislaw and the Dniester crossings. That day he recaptured Flumach and reached the Dniester close to Nizanov. Next day, Cherpachev, north of the river, crossed the Kurapiats and came into line. On 9th August, Kriplin, the railway junction south of Stanislaw, was taken, and the Austrians evacuated the latter town. On 10th August, Lichke entered Stanislaw. Next day, too, Cherubachev was across the Slot of Lippa north of Nizinov. Bothma's position was now very grave. Sakharov, in the north, was close to the lemberg tarnopol Railway, which fed his left wing. Lechitsky had cut the Maramoros Ziget line, and by his capture of Stanislaw, had cut also the street Bukat's line, which fed his right wing. Moreover, Cherubachev was actually bound his flank north of Nizinov. There was nothing for it but retreat. The army which had made so stalwart a stand must bend its neck at last. Bothma's right fell back from the stripper upon the slot of Lippa, his center to Brezhnevny, and his left to behind Zorov on the lemberg tarnopol Railway. With this retirement, the second phase of Brusilov's offensive ended. It left the enemy in an awkward position, with both Kovel and Lemberg menaced by unbroken armies, and with Lechitsky south of the Dniester, well on Bothma's right rear. The significance of the ten marvelous weeks which had elapsed since Brusilov launched his thunderbolt was not to be computed in mere gain of ground. Alexiev played for a great stake, and had no care for petty reconquests. It was not the regaining of the Volhynia fortresses, or the Bukovina that mattered, but the fact that the enemy in his retreat had been compelled to lengthen his front by at least two hundred miles, and was left with fewer men to hold it. A retreat in most cases shortens a line. In the east, the German-Austrian front was straight to begin with, and retirement made it sag and dip, so that its total length was greatly increased. Over three hundred thousand prisoners had been taken, and the dead and badly wounded may have amounted to twice as many again. How desperate was the crisis may be judged by the steps which Hindenburg took to meet it. During June, while the front on the west was quiet except at Verdun, Germany transferred thence four complete divisions and a number of odd battalions, making a total of some seventy-three battalions. When the Somme battle began, her power of reinforcement was seriously crippled, but the necessity was urgent, and she continued to send divisions, exhausted divisions, whose fighting value was gravely reduced. In July, for example, she transferred from west to east three divisions and some odd battalions, making a total of 37 battalions. The process continued during August and September. To anticipate, if we take the period between 4th June and the middle of September, we find that Germany sent in the way of reinforcements to the line north of the Pripet, an infantry division from the west, and to the line south of the Pripet, 
16 infantry divisions and 3 cavalry divisions from north of the Pripet, 15 divisions from the west, and 1 division from the Balkans. Austria brought to the area south of the Pripet 7 divisions from the Italian front, divisions ill to spare, since Cadorna was busy with his counter-offensive. Finally, two Turkish divisions, the 19th and 20th, were brought west and given to Bothra. There can be no difference of opinion as to the vigor and resource which the German staff, with their ally almost out of action, showed in meeting the danger. But the rushing of weary troops across the breadth of Europe was an expedient such as no sane commander would contemplate except in the last necessity. Austria's disasters led to a complete revision of the eastern commands. A new army, called at first the twelfth, and afterwards the third, was formed to take position between Bothma and Flans of Bolton. From 30th July, Hindenburg was put in command of the whole eastern front, except the three southernmost armies, which, as a solace to Austrian sentiment, were made a group command for the heir apparent, the Archduke Charles a young gentleman of twenty-nine. The Archduke Joseph Ferdinand, commanding the Austrian Fourth Army, and Flanzer Balton, commanding the Seventh Army, vanished into obscurity. Von Terziansky took the Archduke Joseph's place, and a new Seventh Army was formed under von Kirschbach. The front was thus a portion between Kravit, age, and youth. The Austro-German dispositions were now from north to south. Eichhorn's group, comprising his own 10th Army, the German 8th Army, Otto von Bülow, and Schlotz's detachment, Prince Leopold's group, comprising the German 12th Army, Fehbeck, and the German 9th Army, Orsuk. Linsingen's group, comprising his own Army of the Bug, the Austrian 4th Army, Terziansky, and the Austrian Second Army, Bohem Ermoli. All these were under Hindenburg. In the south, the Archduke Charles had in his group Bothmer's army, the Austrian Third Army, Kovess, and the Austrian Seventh Army, Kirkbach. The point had all but been reached when the supreme command of the Central Powers would be formally vested in Germany's hands. As against these kaleidoscopic changes, the Russian battlefront, remained the same as on 4th June, save that in August, Kuropatkin became Governor-General of Turkestan, and Ruski returned once again to the Northern Command. Ten weeks of constant fighting had welded the armies into a formidable weapon. The new thing, the tremendous fact which emerged from the battle, was that Russia had shown that she could adapt herself to modern warfare and could create a machine to put her manhood on even terms with the enemy. The staff work, too, had been admirable, and the patient sagacity of the leadership beyond praise. Aliexip, Brusilov, and each of the four army commanders had revealed conspicuous military talent. The battles were generals' battles as much as soldiers' battles. They were won in the brain of the high command before they were won in the field but the effort had stretched her powers to their extreme limits. It was her flood mark which could not be passed, which, unhappily, could not be reached again. End of chapter 57, part 2《Beleaguered Fortress and the Great Sallies》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 58 The Battle of Verdun. Second Stage. May 3rd through August 8th. 1916. The first stage of the Battle of Verdun ended on 9th April with the defeat of the German purpose. Defeat, indeed, had befallen the Imperial Crown Prince weeks before. Ever since the merciless usury of Peyton 
had forced his enemy to pay a price in excess of possible gain. Verdun had long ago passed out of the sphere of pure strategy into that of politics. It had become a fatal magnet, drawing to itself the German strategic reserves, not for the military ends, but because the high command had burned its boats and could not retire. They had staked their reputation on the capture of the little city, and without grave loss of credit could not break off the action. Towards the end of April, the French staff believed that the battle was virtually over. But they overestimated the capacity of their opponent for the rigor of the game. Germany dared not take the heroic course. Her commitments were too deep and a second battle was about to begin, not less desperate than the first, in which her sole purpose was, by blind blows on a narrow front, to wear down the French strength. The significance of Verdun itself had long since gone. It mattered very little to the main interest of the campaign whether or not a German soldier set foot in its shattered streets. Germany's own hope was to weaken what she still believed to be the waning manpower of France, and to forestall the combined Allied attack which since Christmas had been her nightmare. In April, Pétain succeeded Langlet de Carry as commander of Central Sector, from Soissons to Verdun. His promotion to one of three group commands was a well-deserved tribute to his superb achievement. He was succeeded in command of the Second Army by Nivelle, who, like Pétain, had at the outbreak of war been only a colonel. As we have seen during April, there was no great action in the Verdun section, but only minor attacks and counterattacks, and an intermittent bombardment. At the end of the month, the French line lay as follows. From Avoucourt, in the west, it ran through the eastern fringes of the Avucor Wood, covering the famous redoubt along the slope of Hill 287, and across the northern slopes of Hill 304, dipped into the ravine of the end branch of the Forge Brook, climbed the western slopes of Mont Um, covering the summit, then fell back to the south of the Goose's Crest and reached the Moose at Cumier. On the right bank of the river, the line ran on the south side of Côté du Poivou, through the wood of Oudremont, along the south side of the Douaumont Ridge, just short of the crest, dipped into the Vaux Glen, passing through the western skirts of Vaux Village, and then ran south along the eastern scarp of the heights of the Meuse, covering Vaux Fort. The position on the left bank was curious. At Hill 304, the French front was in the shape of a horseshoe facing north, with the ends in Avocor wood, and in the gully of the Inn Brook, and the center flung well forward on the north side of the ridge. East of Mont-Om, the position was reversed. There, the German front was the horseshoe facing south, having one end in Inn Gully, and the other north of Cumier, while the center bulged over the crest well into the wood of Cumier. Obviously, this position in the shape of the letter S lying on its side exposed both combatants to the danger of flanking attacks, and it was the object of German command to straighten it out. Such a straightening would give them Hill 304 and Mohon, which had been the key points of the first battle in this section. But at the end of April, these had not the importance they bore in early March. The main French position was now well behind towards the Charny Ridge. It should be remembered that on the left bank of the Meuse, the Germans were still fighting for positions corresponding to those which they had won on the right bank in the first week of the battle. The Hill 304 Mont Homme line was parallel on the east by the Louvemont Ridge. Charny was the line parallel to Douaumont. 
The second stage of the Battle of Verdun divides itself naturally into three main episodes. First came the attempt of the German right wing to carry Hill 304 and Mont-Homme and press the French back on their last position, an attempt which succeeded in its immediate but failed in its ultimate purpose. The second, simultaneous with the first operation, was a vigorous counterattack by the French on the Douaumont Ridge. The third, the last phase of the battle, was a concentrated German assault from Douaumont against the last line covering Verdun, which gave them the Fort of Vaux, the work of Tumont, and for a moment the village of Fleury, and brought them within four miles of the walls of Verdun. 1. After a week of inaction, there began on the 3rd of May a steady and violent bombardment of the north slope of Hill 304. More than a hundred German batteries concentrating on the narrow front. Not only were the French first lines bombarded, but the crest of the slope behind them became one mass of spouting volcanoes, which resulted in changing the shape of the skyline to an observer looking north from Verdun. All that night the fire continued, the trenches were obliterated, and the defense sheltered as best it could in shell holes. There was a lull on the morning of the 4th, and then the artillery began again, and continued with increasing fury till the afternoon. At four o'clock, reconnoitering parties of German infantry advanced and were beaten back by French rifle fire. At five o'clock, the enemy made a massed attack. Most of the French advanced troops had been buried, their rifles broken, and their machine guns put out of action by the bombardment. The result was that the Germans occupied a considerable stretch of the first line north of Hill 304. That same day, the French had themselves attacked at Mont-Homme and pushed their left horn forward. On the night of the 4th, there was a brilliant French counterattack at Hill 304, which pressed the enemy back at the point of danger, which he held just above the Inn Ravine. On the 5th, the German bombardment moved a little westward and attacked the ragged little coppice called the Camard Wood, just south of the Ulcor Avocor Road. There lay the French 66th Regiment of Infantry. One of those captains has described that devastating fire. It began at 4 o'clock in the morning and lasted till 3.30 p.m. The dugout which I was was hewn out of solid rock, but it swayed like a boat on a stormy sea, and you could not keep a candle lit in it. The Camard wood that morning had had the appearance of wood though all tattered and broken, but by the evening it had lost all semblance of anything but a patch of earth. At 3.30 p.m. the enemy's infantry attacked, but the heroic 66th and 32nd regiments had still a sting left in them. With their rifle fire they halted the advancing waves, and then small parties of gallant men leaped from the wreckage of their trenches and charged with the bayonet. It was sufficient to check the enemy's advance. That night and the next day there was a lull, except for the steady bombardment. On Sunday, 7th May, came a more formidable assault. It was delivered on all three sides of Hill 304, from the wood of Avucor, from the direction of Ucor, and in the ravine of the end stream between Hill 304 and Mont-Om. An intense bombardment began at dawn, and a barrage cut off all communication with the rear. The Germans attacked with the equivalent of an army corps, by far the most considerable attempt yet made in this part of the front. Five times during that Sunday they advanced, and five times they were thrown back. In the last attack, they carried the communication trench east of Hill 304 and pushed up the ravine. The French promptly counterattacked, and after a stern struggle lasting well into the darkness, they recovered the communication trench and by the morning of the 8th were able to consolidate their line. 
but that day's fighting had altered the position. The crest of Hill 304 was so bare and shell-swept that it could not be retained, and the French line now ran just south of it, though they had advanced posts still on the summit ridge. That same day there was an action on the right bank of the Meuse, between Oudremont Wood and Douaumont, where the Germans won a slight advantage. North of Toumont Farm, they carried the French first line for 500 yards on both sides of fleury Douaumont Road. Thereafter, for some days, the fighting on the left bank became desultory. On 17th May, the Germans, after their usual fashion, having failed in their frontal attack on Hill 304, set themselves to turn it from the direction of Avucourt Wood. The action began at six in the evening, and soon it spread over the whole front from Avucourt to Meuse. On the 18th, there were repeated attacks on the west flank of Hill 304, and also on the northeast from In Glen. On the 20th, the bombardment became especially severe on Mohon. It will be remembered that while the Germans held Hill 265, the French held the true summit, Hill 295 but held it as a salient, for their flanks fell back sharply on both sides of it. About two in the afternoon, the German infantry attacked the salient from northeast and northwest and carried the French front lines. In the eastern part, they were driven out again. But in the west, they held their ground and pushed on towards the French second line along the slopes of mont -Om directly overlooking the Inn Brook. These attacks were delivered with great resolution, with large numbers of men, and with other recklessness of loss. By Sunday, 21st May, the summit of mont -Om had passed from French hands, and their line now lay along the southern slope. That same day, the enemy made stupendous efforts to push his way up the Inn Glen. But the impetus had slackened, and the French were comfortable enough in their new positions. That fight for mont -Om was one of the most costly incidents of the whole battle. The Germans between Avucourt and Cumier used at least five divisions, partly drawn from the famous 1st Bavarian Corps, which had lately been on the British front. Their losses were enormous. The ravine of the inn was cumbered with dead, and there were slopes on Hill 304 and on mont -Om, where the ground was raised several meters by mounds of German corpses. The two crests were lost, but their value had largely gone. The French main position now was the front Avucourt in Hill 310, the Boisbourg Moor, and their lines on the southern slopes of the much-contested ridges were only advanced posts. The German success had brought them half a mile nearer Verdun, but every yard of that advance had been amply paid for. 2. But stern as the conflict had been, it was to become sterner still. From 21st February to 20th May, the French artillery had fired 9,795,000 shells. In the next 25 days, they were to expend 4,200,000. We turned to the right bank of the Meuse, where Douaumont was once more to become the scene of grim fighting. The time had arrived for a French counterattack to ease the pressure on the western flank. They began their bombardment sometime on Saturday, the 20th. On the 21st, they won ground on both flanks, capturing the Oudremont Quarry and taking a trench near Vu. These attacks were designed to divert the attention of the enemy from the massing troops on the French center opposite Douaumont Fort. The troops chosen for the principal attack were the 5th Division of the 3rd Corps who, on 3rd April, had retaken the Calle Wood. It was one of the most famous of French divisions, commanded by Manger, who had been with Marchand on his great African journey. They had fought under Liut in Morocco. 
and had won great honor at every stage since the retreat from the Sombra. On 21st April, he had issued an order to his men. You are about to reform your depleted ranks. Many of you will return home and will bear with you to your families the warlike all do and the thirst for vengeance which inspire you. But there is no rest for us French so long as the barbarous enemy treads the sacred soil of our fatherland. There is no peace for the world till the monster of Prussian militarism has been laid low. Therefore prepare yourselves for new battles when you will have full confidence in your superiority over an enemy whom you have so often seen to flee and surrender before your bayonets and grenades. You are certain of that now. Any German who enters a trench of the 5th Division is dead, or a prisoner. Any ground seriously attacked by the 5th Division is captured ground. You march under the wings of victory. The assault was fixed on Monday, 22nd May. As the sun rose, the German kite balloons appeared in regular lines over the horseshoe of Upland. But at 8 a.m., a French airplane squadron was seen hovering above the German sausages. They had with them a bomb, now used for the first time, which, in falling, burst into a shower of lesser bombs, each of which, in turn, gave out minute particles of a burning chemical. In a few minutes, six of the German kite balloons had exploded in flames. The infantry, waiting in the trenches, watched the spectacle with joy. We have now bandaged the Bosch's eyes, said one to another. The Germans, scenting the new peril, kept up a ceaseless fire of shrapnel, to which the French replied, till the firmament twanged like a taut fiddle string. At ten minutes to twelve precisely, the men of the 10th Brigade of the 3rd Division rose from their trenches. The whole operation had been most skillfully planned. The French were close up to the fort, only some 350 yards distant. The Germans had dug trench lines south of it, but it would appear that these and the wire entanglements had been largely destroyed by the French fire. The 129th Regiment of Infantry was directed against the fort itself, while on the left the 36th Regiment and on the right the 74th Regiment moved in support. The French streamed from their cover in open order, and with unfaltered resolution made straight for the fort. The 129th Regiment, in ten minutes, was inside the southwest angle of the defense. At noon precisely, a Bengal light was burned, and the watchers behind knew that the center had won its objective. On the left, the 36th Regiment stormed all the German trenches up to the Douaumont Fleury Road. Inside the fort, the 129th pushed on, fighting from yard to yard of the honeycomb debris. It took all the western and southern parts and the north side up to the northern angle. Engineers were put in to organize the defense, and machine gun battalions were brought up to hold the captured positions. In the first hour, over a hundred prisoners were sent back from the fort. The only hitch was on the right, where the 74th Regiment found a harder task. Its left had advanced rapidly but its right had hung up by the crossfire from the German trenches, where the bombardment had been less effective. The result was that the Germans were able to maintain themselves in the northeastern corner. All day the fighting in the fort went on. The French, by the evening, held two-thirds of the position, and had consolidated their defense. The counterattack did not come till darkness had fallen. About 10 p.m., Great masses of German troops assembled east of Haudremont Wood, and a furious bombardment was directed on the French lines west of the fort. An infantry attack followed, which made a little ground. In the fort itself, the new garrison won some yards during the darkness. From daybreak on the 23rd, 
there was a steady bombardment and many infantry attacks on the position. But the 129th Regiment, though losing heavily, clung to their gains, and when next morning the whole brigade was relieved, it had the proud consciousness that it had yielded not an inch of the ground it had won. On that day, however, two fresh Bavarian divisions came up in the cover of the ravines in the wood of La Vache and Bezonvaux Glen, and attacked in front and in flank. It was not Nivelle's plan to continue a costly struggle beyond the point which in his eyes marked the profitable limit. The fort was retaken by the Germans, but the French managed to retain on its east and west flanks some of the trenches they had won. Meanwhile, the battle had waxed hotter on its western flank. On Tuesday, 23rd May, the Germans made a great effort to do Bausch from the new positions they had gained at Mohomme and to straighten their front. Under a terrific curtain of fire from French heavy guns, they attempted to push their left wing into Cumier between the Meuse and the hill, and to advance their right wing up the N ravine. Again and again they failed, for they could not establish themselves close enough to the French to forbid the latter the use of their high explosive barrage. But at last, in the N glen, Largely by means of liquid fire, they managed to carry the French front trenches. During the night, the Germans left, debouching from the woods of Cumier and Carret, and pushing along the Meuse bank, managed to gain a footing in Cumier village. This, it will be remembered, they had temporarily achieved before in the great attack of 9th April. The place became a slaughterhouse and the day of Wednesday, 24th May, was one of the bloodiest since the opening of the battle. By the evening the enemy had won all Cumier, and had pushed his infantry along the railway line almost to Chatencourt Station. A French counterattack drove him back to Cumier, and the fighting became desperate in the thicket and the low ground between the railway and the river. The French main position was now defined as Chatencourt, the south slopes of Hill 304, Avoucourt. Both Morholm and Hill 304 were lost. Till the end of the month, the struggle continued. On the evening of Friday, the 26th, the French, attacking from the east, got into the skirts of Cumier village. On Sunday evening, the 28th, there was an abortive German attack from the Crow's Wood against the French trenches on the south slopes of Mohom. After that, there came great bombardment, which lasted through most of Monday, the 29th, the hundredth day of battle. At three in the afternoon of that day, German forces attacked all along the front between Avoucourt and the river, in a great attempt to drive the French from their positions on the south slopes of Hill 304 and Mont-Homme. There were now five fresh divisions in action, two of them being from general reserves at Combray and two from the 6th Army, and the enemy's immediate aim was to carry the salient between Mont-Homme and Cumier. It was the last great effort on the western side of the river, and it won only the ground which artillery fire had made untenable. The French first-line trenches south of the Carrette wood were obliterated. There was also a big attack from Cumier towards Chatencourt, which the French counterattacks drove back to its old line. In those days, there was seen what was up to date the heaviest bombardment of the whole campaign both in number of shells and in casualties in a limited area all records were surpassed but no result was obtained on the last day of may the french position was unbroken they had not even been forced back upon their main defences and the road to verdun by the left bank of the meuse was as firmly held as when on second march the guns first opened from the wood of forge Three. The battle was to end as it had begun. 
on the heights of the Meuse. While the struggle had been furious at Mont-Homme, the Germans had made certain useful gains on the right bank. On 25th May, they had recaptured Oudremont quarry and extended their hold across the upper part of Cumont Ravine. On the 27th, they pushed their right wing to the southwest border of the part of the big Oudremont wood, which was called variously the wood of Cumont and the wood of Nawe. On Monday the 29th, the heavy guns began near Vu, a preparation which warned Nivelle of what was coming. With mathematical exactness, the German effort had swung from flank to flank and the failure which was presently announced on the left bank meant a new effort on the right. There, they were within five miles of Verdun, and the recapture of Douaumont Fort and their possession of the rest of the Douaumont Crest gave them direct observation over all the intervening ground. From about the same position which they held on 26th February, they were to make, after a hundred days, their final effort to gain what they had promised themselves to win in four. One-sixth of the whole artillery of the German army was assembled there, and the emperor had ordered that Verdun should fall by 16th June. The German plan was an advance in front and flank to turn the inner fortified line which defended the city, and to make the flanking movement possible, they must first carry the fort of Vu. That fort, obsolete, D-class, and dismantled, and now a mere point de puy in the field line, had, since Douaumont was lost, become the key point of the French defense on the plateau. It covered the Glen of Vu and all the eastern approaches to the great fort of Suiville. For twenty-six hours the enemy guns played on the French lines, and then, on 1st June, their infantry carried the remains of the Cayette Wood, won the ground south of Vu Pond, and fought their way into the Fumen Wood. At the same time, an attack was delivered from Domlou in the east, a village from which the French were compelled to retire. The German aim was to make two converging assaults from the northwest along the ridge from the Fumen Wood and from the southeast up the gully from Domloup. All the day of Friday, the 2nd, and Saturday, the 3rd, the contest continued. Wave after wave of Bavarian infantry surged up the hillsides, only to be mown down by the French fire. The fort had long ago been smashed by the heavy guns for since March the enemy had directed on it a daily average of 8,000 shells. But in the deep cellars the little garrison, under Major Raynal, continued their resistance. The place was as bare and open as a target buoy at sea, and after the second, when the Germans won the Fumen Ridge, there was no direct communication between the defense and the French lines. This isolation had not been achieved without a desperate struggle. Scattered sections of trench, which, till occupied, prevented complete envelopment, were held by detachments of the 101st Regiment for three days, under torrents of bombs and a fire of high explosives, which observers likened to a tropical downpour. It was not until 9 p.m. on 5th June that this gallant remnant retired from a fight which began early on the morning of the 1st June. By the 2nd, as we have seen, the fort was cut off from news, for no dispatch bearer could cross the zone of death. The defense tried to establish a system of signals, but the troops a mile away could not see them. A volunteer managed to make his way out, and, by shifting the position of the signalers, at the other end, established some kind of communication. Another most gallant man, a stretcher-bearer of the 124th Division, called Vanier, worked patiently among the wounded, dressing their wounds and hiding them in crevices among the ruins. When there were no more wounded to tend, 
he went out to fetch water, for thirst was the supreme torment. Four hundred men had taken refuge in the fort, and the garrison numbered one hundred fifty. The air was thick with fumes and dust. Every throat was parched, and every drop of water had been brought from a distance through a land churned by great shells into the likeness of a yeasty sea. For five days Renal and his men performed the patently impossible. Presently the enemy won the outer walls, but the main building was still defended, and a machine gun in every cranny made it death for the invaders to enter the courtyard. The fight was now largely subterranean. The enemy let down baskets of grenades to a level with the loopholes, and tried to swing them through the openings so as to explode inside. The limit of human endurance came on Tuesday the 6th. Raynal sent his last message. We are near the end. Officers and men have done their whole duty. Viva la France! Vanier, that incomparable Broncardier, managed to escape with a few wounded through a grating, and after perilous adventure while crawling through the enemy's ground, most of the party reached the French lines. That was the last news from the fort. Raynal was removed to Mainz and permitted by his captors to retain his sword. He was made commander of the Legion of Honor by the French Republic, and, at a special review at the Envalide, the insignia of his new honor were conferred upon his wife. The capture of Vu Fort saw the beginning of a furious German assault upon the whole section from Tumont eastward. The direct objective was Fort Souville, which had now become the main outwork for Verdun. The French fort on the 7th June ran from Hill 321 below the Côte du Pouvoir and the Côte des Foitaires through the Fortin of Tumont along the slopes defined by the woods of Chapitre, Fumin, and Laufey and then south along the fringes of the hills east of Ease. Between the Côte de Froide Terre and the plateau where stood the forts of Souville and Tavana was a deep-cut hollow down which ran the road from Vaux to Verdun. The village of Fleury lay on the western lip of the ravine. The easiest and most open approach to Souville was by the way of Fleury and the western ridge for on the east the woods gave strong defensive positions. For four days there was a lull. Peyton, who knew what was coming, warned Joffrey of the gravity of the case and begged him to expedite the great attack on the Somme. But the commander-in-chief replied that at all costs Verdun must be defended. Then, on the night of Sunday, the 11th, after a bombardment, the enemy managed to gain a little ground in the Fumin Wood. Next day, the assault was on the other flank, delivered by a division and a half of Bavarian and Pomeranian troops. A bit of a French line on Hill 321 west of Tumon was captured, and the enemy was within three and three-quarter miles of Verdun. All through the week, Tumon and the adjacent slopes of Hill 321, 316, and 320 were the theater of heavy fighting. The great effort came on Friday, 23rd June. At 8 o'clock in the morning, 19 regiments, drawn from seven different divisions, were flung against a front of three miles. The French right stood firm, but the left was driven back between Hill 320 and Hill 321, and Tumon Fort fell. Meanwhile, the German center, coming down the ravine from the wood of Cayette, attacked Fleury Village and got into its outskirts, but a French counterattack, admirably timed, drove back the invaders. The position in the evening was that the German center stood out in a wedge towards Fleury, some 800 yards in advance of their general front. That evening Nivelle issued an order to his army. The hour is decisive. The Germans, hunted down on all sides, are launching wild and furious attacks on our front. 
in the hope of reaching the gates of Verdun before they themselves are assailed by the united forces of the Allies. You will not let them pass, my comrades. The country demands this further supreme effort. The army of Verdun will not allow itself to be intimidated by shelling or by German infantry for four months it has beaten back. The army of Verdun will keep its fame untarnished. His confidence was not misplaced. But the last week of June saw a mad crescendo in the German assault. The situation was so grave that Pétain, while ordering resistance at all costs, had made every preparation for evacuation the right bank of the Meuse. On 24th June, the enemy again got into flurry, and the two sides faced each other in the streets. Meantime, the advance from Hill 320 and 321 on the Foie de Ridge was firmly held, and the French made some small progress towards Tumont. On the last day of the month, about ten in the morning, with a brilliant effort, they pushed through the German barrage, regained Tumont Fort, and held it against all counterattacks. The rest of the story may be briefly told. During July, in August, the Verdun volcano had moments of eruption, but the storm center had moved elsewhere. The Germans at the beginning of July were still in flurry, and on the 11th of the month, their center delivered an attack on a 3,000 yards front from Flurry to the Chapitre Wood with the effectiveness of six regiments and gained a little ground at the Chapelle St. Fine. 1,000 yards northwest of Souville. On Tuesday, 3rd August, it was the turn of the French to counterattack. On the 5th, they regained Fleury Village, pushed their left well along Hill 320 to the southeast of Cumont, and increased the number of prisoners captured since 1st August to 1,750. This meant that the German center wedge was now flattened in. During August, the fighting swayed backwards and forwards, and on 8th August, the Germans were back in small parts of Cumont, and a day or two later again entered Fleury. From the latter place, they were promptly ejected, and from Cumont, they were ousted a few days later. The initiative was now wholly in the hands of Nivelle. Whatever the enemy won, he won at great cost and he held his gains only so long as the French cared to permit him. The recapture of Tumont work on the last day of June, the 130th day of the struggle, may be taken as the logical end of the Battle of Verdun. The fighting which followed was the backwash of the great action, the last desperate efforts of a baffled enemy who had lost all strategic purpose, and the first forward movement of the triumphant defense. The battle had served its purpose. It had grievously depleted the manhood of France, and the 39 divisions which Folk had destined for the Somme had shrunk to 16. But it had compelled Germany, between 21st February and 21st August, to use up 50 divisions. It had sucked in and destroyed the bulk of her free strategic reserves. It had tided over the months of waiting while France allies were completing their preparations. The scene was about to change from the shattered Verdun uplands to the green hills of Picardy, and the main battle was on the eve of transference from the Meuse to the Somme. Even as the weary and dusty Fantassins scrambled over the debris of Cumont, a hundred miles to the northwest on a broad front, the infantry of France and Britain were waiting to cross their parapets. The citadel by the Meuse had been for Germany a will-o'-the-wisp to lead her to folly and death. But as the weeks passed, it became for France also a watchword, an oriflamme to which all eyes could turn, a mystic symbol of her resolution. It was a sacred place, and its wardenship was the test of her devotion. Mankind must have its shrines, and that things for which much blood has been spilled become holy in its eyes. Over Verdun, 
as an Ypres, there will brood in history a strange aura, the affluence of the supreme sacrifice, the splendid resolution, the unyielding fortitude of the tens of thousands who died before her gates. Her little hills are consecrated forever by the immortal dead. Heureux ceux qui sont morts sur un dernier haut lieu, parmi tout l'appareil des grandes funérailles. Heureux ceux qui sont morts pour les cités charnelles, car elles sont le corps de la cité de Dieu. Charles Piggy End of chapter 58「Section 12 of the History of the Great War, Volume 3 » The beleaguered forest continued in the great sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3 by John Buchan. Chapter 59 The Second Year of War, A Retrospect, Part 1 June 28, 1915 to June 28, 1916. As the narrative approaches the end of the second year of war and reaches the second anniversary of those murders at Sarajevo, which opened the floodgates, it is desirable to halt again and review the position. Only in this way can a campaign whose terrain was three continents and every sea and whose battlefronts were reckoned in thousands of miles be seen in its full purpose and its right perspective. At the end of June 1915, Germany's arms to a superficial observer seemed to be everywhere crowned with success. It was true that her original scheme had failed and that she had been compelled to revise her views and adopt a plan for which she had small liking. But with admirable patience, she had performed the revision and the new policy had won conspicuous triumphs. She held the Allies tightly in the West, held them with a minimum of men by virtue of an artillery machine to which they could not show an equal, and fortifications of a strength hitherto unknown to the world. Using her main forces in the East, she had driven Russia from post to pillar, had won back Galicia, had penetrated far into Poland, and had already in her grip the great fortresses, the loss of which meant for Russia not only a crushing loss in guns, but an indefinite further retreat. She held vast tracts of enemy soil in Belgium and France, and so far these gains had not diminished. The central powers had a unified command, and all their strength could be applied with little delay and friction to the purpose of the German general staff, nor was the full tale of the Allied misfortune yet told. Bulgaria, though the fact was still secret, was about to enter the Teutonic League, and that must presently mean the annihilation of Serbia and German dominion in the Balkans. Turkey had so far held the Allied advance in Gallipoli and was soon to bring it to a melancholy standstill. There were tragedies waiting to be enacted in Mesopotamia. What had the Allies to show us against such spectacular triumphs? the conquest of one or two outlandish German colonies, a few miles gained on the Isonzo and in the Alps, the occupation of the butt end of a Turkish peninsula, an advance of the Tigris, where the difficulties loom greater with every league, a defensive action in Egypt, and one or two costly failures on the Western Front. To the German observer it seemed a mirage as contrasted with the solid earth. The prospect was not more pleasing when viewed with another eye than the strategists. In the struggle of military bureaucracies against democracies, it would seem that the bureaucracies must win. Fifty years before Abraham Lincoln had said, it has long been a grave question whether any government, not too strong for the liberties of its people, can be strong enough to maintain its existence in great emergencies. That question seemed to have been answered against the democracies. Germany and her allies looked abroad, and saw Britain still perplexed with old catchwords, still disinclined to turn a single mind to the realities of war. The air was full of captious criticism. Her people had willed the end, no doubt, 
but they were not wholly inclined to will the means. Again, while the Teutonic command was single and concentrated, the Allies were still fumbling and wasting their strength on divergent enterprises. There seemed to be no true general staff work done for the Alliance as a whole. Each unit fought its own campaign and was assisted by its colleagues only when disaster had overtaken it. Their assets, potentially very great, could not be made actual. They had more men, but those men could not be made soldiers in time. They had a great industrial machine, but that machine would not adapt itself quickly enough to military needs. They commanded the sea, but their fleets could not destroy Germany's unless Germany was willing to fight. Their blockade, while it might annoy, could not seriously cripple the energies of Central Europe, which in the greater matters was economically self-sufficing. As for morale, had not a bureaucracy shown that it could elicit a steely resolution and as wholehearted an enthusiasm as those powers which worship the fetish called popular liberty? Nevertheless, an impartial critic, looking around him in June 1915, might have noticed chinks in the Teutonic panoply. So far the Allied blockade had had no very serious effects, but might it not be tightened? Germany had occupied much land, but could she hold it? She was spending herself lavishly in brandishing her sword far afield in the hope of intimidating her enemies. But what if those enemies declined to be intimidated? Unless Germany achieved her end quickly, it was possible that the Allies might set their house in order. They were fighting for their national existence, and they saw no salvation save in a complete and unquestionable victory. Was it not possible that, as the urgency of the need sank into their souls, there might come such a speeding up and tightening of energies that Germany's offensive would be changed to a defensive? For the one hope of Germany lay in a successful offensive, which would break up the alliance by putting one or other of its constituent armies out of action. If this was not done speedily, could it be done at all? Let us suppose that a man, wounded at the close of June 1915, had been shut off from the world for the space of a year. As he became convalescent, he asked for news of the war. Was the Russian army still in being? And if so, in what ultimate waste, far east of Petrograd and Moscow, did it lie? For in the absence of Russian equipment, the German advance could not have been staged short of those famous cities. To his amazement, he was told that Hindenburg's thrust had first weakened and then died away, and that the winter in the east had been stagnant. More, Russia had had her breathing space and was now advancing. All the Bukovina had been recovered, and the Volhynia Triangle, and Brusilov was well on the road to Lemberg, with three quarters of a million Austrians out of action. In the Balkans, Serbia and Montenegro had been overrun, and Bulgaria had joined the Central Powers. But an allied army, French, British, Serbians, Russians, and Italians, was holding the Salonica front and waiting for a signal to advance. The Gallipoli adventure had failed, but the force had been extricated was now in France and Egypt and Mesopotamia. Egypt had laughed at the threat of invasion and had easily subdued the minor ferments on her borders. On the Tigris, one British fort had fallen, and a weak division had been made prisoner, but it had detained large Turkish forces and allowed the Grand Duke Nicholas in Transcaucasia to take Erzurum, Trapezon, and Ergesian, and to threaten the central Anatolian plain. Italy had flung back the invader under the Trentino, and was now beginning her revanche. In the West there had been one great effort to pierce the German front, and after its failure the Allies had sat down to perfect their equipment and increase their armies. The convalescent heard with amazement of the tornado that had swept on Verdun, and of the stand of the thin French lines. He was told of the desperate assault then being delivered against Fleury and Theomol but he was told also the great Allied armies mustered on the Somme for the counterstroke. 
Above all, he heard of the miraculous work of Britain, of ample munitions, of seventy divisions in the field, and great reserves behind them. He heard, too, of a growing unity and strategical and economic purpose among the Allies, of attacks conceived and directed with a single aim. As the manifold of these facts slowly shaped itself in his consciousness, he realized that he had awakened to a different world. The Allies had passed from the defensive to the offensive. What is the test of military success? The question has often been asked, and the popular replies are innumerable. But the soldier knows only one answer. The test is the destruction of the enemy's power of resistance, and that power depends upon his possession of an adequate field army. Success is not the occupation of territory, or of successive enemy lines, or of famous enemy fortresses. These things may be means, but they are not in themselves the end. And if these things are won without the end being neared, the winner of them has not only not advanced, he has gone backward, since he has expended great forces for an idle purpose, and is thereby crippled for future efforts. Early in 1916, when the German press was exulting in the study of the map of Europe, Hindenburg was said to have described Germany's military position as brilliant, but without a future. If the veteran field marshal was correctly reported, he showed in the remark an acumen, which observers would not necessarily have deduced from his exploits in the field. Strategically, in the strict sense of that word, Germany had long ago failed. Her original purpose was sound, to destroy one by one the Allied field armies. Her urgent need was a speedy and final victory. The Marne and First Ypres deprived her of this hope, and she never regained it. The Allies took the strategical offensive, and, by pinning her to her lines and drawing round her the net of their blockade, compelled her to a defensive war. In the largest sense, the Allied offensive dated from the beginning of 1915, but it was an offensive which did not include the tactical initiative. So long as the Allies were deficient in equipment, Germany was able to take the tactical offensive. Instances were the Second Battle of Ypres and the Great German Advance in the East, movements which were undertaken largely in the hope that tactical success might gradually restore the strategic balance. This hope was doomed to disappointment. Victories, indeed, were won. Brilliant victories, but they led nowhere. By and by came the last attempts, the onslaughts on Verdun and the Trentino and the failure of these prepared the way for the Allies themselves to take the tactical initiative. Germany was tactically as well as strategically on her defense. Now the essence of German tactics was their reliance upon guns. For them, artillery was the primary and infantry the secondary arm. They looked to win battles at long range, confident in an elaborate machine to which their opponents could provide no equivalent. The calculation miscarried, but at the beginning of the war there was some ground for their confidence. To improvise an equivalent machine might reasonably have been considered beyond the power of France and Russia. But three things combined to frustrate the hope. The seventh fight against odds of all the Allies. The command of the sea which allowed them to import munitions till their own producing power had developed. And the industrial capacity of Britain which enabled her to manufacture for the whole alliance. Faced with an artillery equipment of equal strength, the German tactics were ineffective, and when the day came that the Allies had a strong ammunition meant than their enemy, they were both futile and perilous. The Battle of Verdun may be taken as the final proof of their breakdown. They were intrinsically wrong. They could only have succeeded if the whirlwind fury of the first German assault and immediately achieved its object, and so soon as Germany was reduced to a strategical defensive, they became a signal danger. The miscalculation of Germany at this stage did not lie only with the general staff, but with all the German authorities, civil, naval, and military, and with the German people. Since she was clearly on the defense, 
It would have been well to take the measures proper to a defensive campaign. She was holding far-flung lines with too few men, and the path of wisdom was obviously to shorten them. But in the then state of German opinion, it was impracticable. When the people had been booed up, with hope of a triumphant peace and a vast increase of territory, when the fanatics of pan-Germanism were publishing details of how they intended to use the conquered areas, when the imperial chancellor was lyrically apostrophizing the map, a shortening of the lines in east and west would have tumbled down the whole edifice of German confidence. She could not do it. Her political commitments were too deep. Her earlier vainglory sat like an old man of the sea on her shoulders. Yet beyond doubt it was her best chance. Had she, before the Allied offensive began, drawn in her front to the Vistula and the Muse, she would have had an immensely strong line, and adequate numbers wherewith to hold it. She would have offered the Allies the prospect of an interminable war, under conditions which they had fondly hoped they had made impossible. Her one chance was to weaken the Alliance internally, to weary this or that power, to lengthen out the contest to a point where the cost in money and lives would induce a general nervelessness and satiety. Moreover, by shortening her lines, her food problem would have become far less urgent, and the deadliness of the blockade would have been lessened. But she let the moment for the heroic course slip by, and when the first guns opened in the combined Allied advance, that course had become forever impossible. The position at sea in midsummer 1916 had not in substance changed from that of the preceding year. The waterways of the world were still denied by the Allies to the enemy, and used by them for their own military purposes. There had been several bursts of submarine violence, already chronicled in these pages. But it is fair to say that the submarine as a serious weapon had, during the year, decreased in importance. Its brutality was enhanced, but its efficiency had declined. Its moral effect in the way of shaking the nerves of British merchant seamen was nil. The result of the year's experience had been to induce a high degree of popular confidence in the measures taken to meet the underwater danger, a confidence not wholly justified, and, as we shall see, soon to be rudely shaken. One great incident had broken the monotony of the maritime vigil. The German high sea fleet had been brought to action, and in the battle of 31st May, off the Jutland coast, had been driven back to harbor. But that great sea fight did not change the situation. It only confirmed it. Before Jutman, as after it, in Mr. Balfour's words, the German fleet was imprisoned. The battle was an attempt to break the bars and burst the confining gates. It failed, and with its failure, the high sea fleet sank again into impotence. The British Navy, viewing the position while they swept the North Sea, and the bells rang in Berlin and Hamburg, to celebrate Shear's return, were convinced that they would see the enemy again. They had reason for a view which facts were nevertheless to refute. The Battle of Jutland was fought because politics demanded that the German fleet should do something to justify its existence in the eyes of the German people. That demand must be repeated. As the skies darkened over Germany, it seemed certain that Scheel would make further efforts, and the nearer came the day of final defeat the more desperate those efforts would be. For the navy of a power is like a politician who changes sides. It counts two on a division. If the power is conquered, its fleet will be the spoil of the conqueror. Far better that the German battleship should go to the bottom with a number of British ships to keep them company than they should be doled out in nobly to increase the strength of the Allied victors. While Germany's military and naval situation had a certain clearness, it was far otherwise with her domestic affairs. If differences of opinion were ruined within her general staff, they were open and flagrant antagonisms among her civilian statesmen. Two main streams of opinion had long been apparent. One was that held by the emperor, by the imperial chancellor, and by the bulk of the civilian ministers. They believed with occasional lapses into optimism, that the contest must end in a stalemate, 
and they were willing to abate their first arrogance and play for safety. Above all, they were anxious to avoid any conflict with the more powerful neutrals, for they knew that only by neutral help could Germany set her shattered house in order. They still talked boldly about victory, but these utterances were partly a concession to popular taste, and partly a desire to put their case high in order to enhance the value of future concessions. These people were the politiques, and they were not agreed on the details of their policy. Some looking towards a rapprochement with France or Britain, others seeing in Russia a prospective ally. But they differed from their opponents in being willing to bargain and concede, and in allowing prudential considerations to temper the old German pride. Arrayed against them were the fanatics of pan-Germanism, of the Red Vent Low Turpit School, who still clung to the belief in complete victory, and were prepared to defy the whole round earth. To this school, Prince Bulow had by a curious metamorphosis become attached. Neck or nothing was their maxim. They were advocates of every extreme of barbarism in method, and refused to contemplate any result of the war, except one in which Germany should dictate to beaten foes. They had a considerable following, including the bulk of the naval and military staffs, and they used the name of Hindenburg as their rallying cry because he loomed big in the popular imagination as the strong, imperturbable soldier. We can trace the strife of these two schools through German speeches and writings till the late spring of 1916. And then something happened, which convinced both that their forecasts were wrong, which took from the politics their hope of bargaining, and from the fanatics their certainty of triumph. Suddenly, with one of those queer illuminations which happen now and then to the most self-satisfied. The masters of Germany realized that their case was growing desperate. They saw that the Allied command was now in the way to be unified, and that the Allied efforts were about to be quadrupled. They saw that the Allies would accept no terms but unconditional surrender, and they saw, moreover, that the contest could not end with the war for the enemies were preparing a conjoint economic policy which would ensure that their gains in battle should not be lost in peace. They saw at the same time that their military position was losing its brilliance and had even less future than when Hindenburg coined his epigram. The alternative now was not between a complete victory and an honorable draw, but between victory and annihilation. Feldsbach, Oder Niedergang. This sudden realization induced a new temper. The people had been deluded, but there must some day be a stern awakening. Let that awakening come from the enemy, was the decision of the German high command. The nation must learn that their foes would not stop short of their utter destruction, the ruin not only of Germany's imperial dream, but of that laborious industrial and economic system which brought grist to the humblest mill. The boldest course was the safest. Concessions to humanity brought no reward, so let rigor rule unchecked. It was only on the grim resolution of the whole nation that they could count for the life and death struggle before them, and the nation must be brought to this desperate temper by the proof that their leaders possessed it. The following of the politics shrank in number and the voice of discretion was hushed. Germany proceeded accordingly to burn her boats. The first evidence of this calculated insanity was the murder of Captain Fryatt. Early in June 1916, the great eastern steamer Brussels, plying between Harwich and Holland, was captured in the North Sea by a German torpedo boat and taken to Zeebrugge. Captain Fryatt was imprisoned at Bruges, and brought to trial as a franc terreur, on the ground that in an encounter with the German submarine on March 28, 1915, he had defended himself by trying to reign his enemy, and had compelled her to dive. He was condemned to death on Thursday, 27th July, and shot that evening. The German press, instructed for the purpose, broke into a chorus of approval. The necessity, wrote the Cologne Gazette, a protecting honorable and chivalrous combatants against perfidious and murderous attacks 
compels the military command to visit all illegal attacks with the strongest punishment. The captain who, beneath the harmless mask, flashes a dagger on an unsuspecting person is a bandit. The incident roused in the people of Britain a cold fury, similar to that which followed the murder of Miss Cabell. The Prime Minister in the House of Commons gave renewed warning that it would be the first business of the Allies, when the proper season arrived, to punish such crimes, that the criminals would be brought to justice wherever their station, and that the man who authorized the system, which permitted such deeds, might well be held the most guilty of all. About the same time, the German military authorities in northeastern France organized a general shifting of sections of the population. In the neighborhoods of Lille, Roubaix, and Tourchen, women, young and old, were moved wholesale to other districts where they were compelled to work at the dictation of their masters. The transference and the coercion which followed were attended with much revolting inhumanity. Germany in both cases put forth in defense of her conduct a number of contradictory pleas. Captain Fryatt had not been defending himself, she said. He had been attacking. In any case, resistance on the part of a civilian was a violation of the laws of war. The French deportations were justified on the ground of the force majeure of necessity. They were a deliberate breach of Germany's own undertakings at The Hague, but she argued that she must do the best for herself in a life-and-death struggle. The legal arguments on the first case need not delay us. There were none on the second. It is an old rule of war among civilized peoples that a merchant vessel may lawfully defend herself against an enemy attempt at her capture or destruction. This rule became more reasonable than ever when German submarines were scouting the seas with instructions to torpedo British merchantmen at sight. It had been laid down by Lord Stowell and Chief Justice Marshall. It had been embodied in the naval codes of most countries. It had been approved by the chief German jurists. It had even appeared in the German naval prize regulations, which were in effect at the time when Captain Fryatt was alleged to have tried to ram the submarine. Germany, it is true, had shown herself restless under that doctrine before the war, and had made various attempts to have it set aside. And since August 1914, she had simply disregarded it, as she had disregarded all other bonds which checked her freedom. The captain of a troll who tried to ram a submarine, which was endeavoring to sink him. The householder who fired a rifle at a zeppelin, which was engaged in destroying his township. The peasant who carried a pistol to protect his family from the last outrage were all alike, under this curious creed, bandits and murderers. It is idle to discuss the question on legal grounds, for Germany had none which serious men could consider. But if we neglect the sphere of legality, there would still seem to remain certain fetters to unbridled license imposed by elementary human decency. Even this Germany now spurned, as she had spurned them before, in the horrors of her first invasion of France and Belgium. Had the affair not been so tragic, there would have been comedy in the unplumbed childishness of a power which still worshipped the leaden idols, the creation of her own vanity, when the earth was cracking beneath their feet. If the German leaders desired to impress upon the nation the implacableness of their foes, then they assuredly succeeded. In France and Britain, the desire to wage the war à contrance was blown to a white heat of resolution. It found expression in the words of the Allied statesmen, and it was soon to find a more deadly expression in the deeds of the Allied armies. End of chapter 59, part 1「Section 13 of A History of the Great War」Volume 3 – The Beleaguered Fortress Continued and The Great Sallies This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
A History of the Great War, Volume 3 by John Buchan, Chapter 59, The Second Year of War, a Retrospect, June 28, 1915 to June 28, 1916, Part 2. At the end of June, the economic situation of the Central Powers was becoming serious. The immediate food stringency was the least part of it. That stringency was already great, and till the harvest could be reaped in August, it would continue to increase. A director of food supplies was appointed, but no rationing and no ingenious manipulation of stocks could add to an aggregate which was too small for the comfort of the people. The British blockade had been greatly tightened and every day saw its effectiveness growing. In June, the unfortunate declaration of London had been totally and finally abandoned. However good the German harvest, it could not make up all the deficit and its results would cease early in 1917. Nor could it supply the animal fats, the lubricating wells and the many foreign necessaries which the British Navy had forbidden. As for finance, further loans might be raised on the security of the Jutland victory, though such loans were at the mercy of some sudden popular understanding of the true position. But the darkest part of the picture was the situation which must face Germany after war, assuming that a crushing victory was beyond her. Her great commercial expansion had been largely due to the system of favorable treaties, which under Capri V and Bulow she had negotiated with foreign countries. Even before the war it was clear that the signatory nations would seek to recover their freedom, and a tariff struggle was in prospect at the end of 1916 when the treaties were liable to denunciation. Now not only was there no hope of their renewal on good terms, but there was the likelihood that all the Allies after the war would unite in boycotting Germany and developing commercial relations between themselves. At a conference held in Paris in the middle of June 1916, it was agreed that in the reconstruction period the enemy powers should be denied most favored nation treatment that enemy subjects should be prevented from engaging in vital industries in allied countries and that provision should be made for the conservation and exchange of the allied natural resources. It was further resolved to render the allied countries independent of the enemy countries in raw materials and essential manufactured articles unless Germany won the power to dictate treaties to her foes as she had dictated to France in 1871. It looked as if the self-sufficiency of which she had boasted would be all that was left to her. How nervous was Germany's temper on this subject was shown by the popular joy which greeted the voyage of a German submarine to America and its safe return. On 9th July, the U-boat Deutschland arrived at Baltimore from Bremen with 280 tons of cargo, mostly dye stuffs, and an autograph letter from the Emperor. She had sailed under a commercial flag, and being held by the American authorities to be technically a merchantman, was allowed to leave, and returned safely to Germany. It was a bold performance, and no one grudged the crew and captain their meed of honor, but the voyage involved no naval difficulty. Its commercial results were infinitesimal, and the popular joy in Germany was based upon the erroneous idea that a means had been found of meeting the British blockade. She hoped that she had re-established trading relations with the chief neutral power. It was a vain whimsy. There was nothing which the British Navy more desired than that a hundred Deutschlands would attempt to repeat the enterprise. A submarine or two in the vast expanse of the Atlantic might escape detection, but a submarine service would be gently and steadily drawn into their net. The one hope for Germany, and it was slender at the best, was that dissension would creep into the Allied Councils. 
she could not look to draw any one of her foes to her side, but she might weaken their affection for each other, and so lessen their united striking power. She used her press and her connections in neutral countries to play the part of the sour of tears in the Allies vineyard. France was praised for her gallant exploits and was advised not to count on the alliance of perfidious Britain. It was hinted that the channel ports would never be restored to her, that Normandy had once been joined to England and that history might repeat itself. What, it was asked, had become of the British during the long Verdun struggle? The overgrown improvised armies of British were simply mobs, too untrained to influence the war. The legend of Britain's commercial ambitions was, was zealously preached. Russia was warned that after the war she would soon pray to be delivered from her friends. This game was destined to fail for two reasons. It was most blunderingly played, for German diplomacy was a clumsy thing, and her backstairs efforts were betrayed by the tramping of her heavy feet. Again she underrated the depth and gravity of the Allied purpose, which was faced with far too desperate an issue to have time for pettishness and vanity. There was rivalry indeed between the Allies, but it was an emulation in gallantry and sacrifice. When we turn to the position of Germany's opponents, we find by midsummer 1916 that in every respect the year had shown a change for the better. Britain had enormously increased her levies and had provided the machinery for utilizing her total manpower. France, though she had suffered a terrible drain at Verdun, had all her armies in vain, and with the assistance of Britain, who had taken over a large part of the front, would be able to supply the necessary drafts for a considerable time. Russia had trained huge numbers of her new recruits and was stronger in men than before her great retreat began. In munitionment, the change was amazing. France was amply provided for. Russia had at least four times greater a supply than she had ever known, and Britain, though still far from the high water mark of her effort, had performed the miraculous. In a speech in the House of Commons, Mr. Montagu, who had succeeded Mr. Lloyd George as Minister of Munitions, drew a contrast between the situation in June 1915 and June 1916. The report of the work of the department read like a fairy tale. In shells, the output which in 1914-15 it took 12 months to produce, could now be supplied from home sources in the following times. Field gun ammunition, three weeks. Field howitzer ammunition, two weeks. Medium shells, 11 days. Heavy shells, four days. Britain was now manufacturing and issuing to the Western Front weekly as much as the whole pre-war stock of land service ammunition to the country. In heavy guns, the output in the year had increased sixfold and would soon be doubled. The weekly production of machine guns had increased 14-fold and of rifles threefold, wholly from home, source, home sources. In small arm ammunition, the output was three times as great, and large reserve stocks were being accumulated. The production of high explosives was 66 times what it had been in the beginning of 1915, and the supply of bombs for trench warfare had been multiplied by 33. These figures were for British use alone. But we were also making colossal contributions to the common stock. One third of the total British manufacturers of shell steel went to France, and 20% out of production of machine tools we sent to our allies. Such a record was triumph for the British workman, who in his long hours in dingy factories was doing a vital service to the country as his brothers in the trenches of France and Salonika. On the sands of Mesopotamia and Egypt, or on the restless waters of the North Sea. The economic heart of the alliance was Britain, and on her financial stability depended its powers of endurance till victory. We have seen in earlier chapters how complex was her problem. All the allies had to make vast purchases abroad, and these had to be supported by British credit. 
the foreign exporter had to be paid for his goods in the currency which he would accept and Britain had to find large quantities of gold or marketable securities for her daily purchases. So far as internal finance was concerned, her position was sound. In a speech in the House of Commons on 10th August, the Chancellor of Exchequer calculated that by March 31, 1917, if the war lasted so long, our total indebtedness would almost equal the national income, a burden by no means intolerable to contemplate and that our national indebtedness would be less than one-sixth of the total national wealth. But the question of foreign payments, something between one and two millions a day, remained an anxious one, and was yet far from settlement. In some respects, the situation had improved. Owing to the policy of restriction of imports, and owing also to a remarkable increase in British exports, Eleven and a half millions higher for July 1916 than for the same month in the previous year. Our adverse trade balance was being reduced. In July 1916, for example, it was 22 and a half millions as against 31 and a half millions for July 1915. But ahead of our statesmen loomed the old difficulty. We were paying for American imports for ourselves and our allies mainly out of dollar securities. Those American bonds which British owners had lent or sold to the Treasury. At the present rate, we should have exhausted this form of currency before midsummer 1917, and we might then be faced with a real crisis. It was urged with a great reason that it would be well to adopt at once some drastic method of reducing unnecessary imports and so lessening foreign payments if, if we did not wish to find our military efforts crippled at the moment when it should have been gathering power for the coup de grace. Economy in this respect could only be affected by the Allies jointly, since British credit had to cover all purchases and it was now made possible by the unification which we have seen in progress in the Allied staff work. The pooling of resources was in theory complete. Frequent conferences, economic, political, and strategic, seemed to give assurance that every atom of strength would be directed to a single end. The whole Allied force now held one great battlefront, from Riga to Bakovina, then after a gap from the Gulf of Orfeino to the west of the Vardar, then from the Sonzo to the Stelvio Pass, and lastly from Belfort to the North Sea. The Russians were the right wing, the Salonika army the right center, the Italians the center, the French the left center, and the British the left wing. The military conference in Paris in May 1916 had for the first time prepared for the whole front one common strategic plan. The central powers, who had won what they had won by their superior unity, seemed to be now confronted with an alliance no longer loose and divergent but disciplined and directed. This sense of energy better guided induced all allied peoples a new confidence and peace of mind. France, key to a high pitch by her marvelous deeds at Verdun, was in no mind to criticize her colleagues and still less to find fault with her leaders. In Britain, the mist of suspicion grew thinner between the government and the people. Critics forsook their quest for a man of destiny and were content to help fallible statesmen to make the best of things. In Russia, the popular temper was fired by the great sweep of Brasilov and his armies. Though the first son of success seemed to be about to wake into activity the host of parasites which preyed upon her, and which had been driven to hibernate during the chill winter of long retreat. It was the dawn of the Allied offensive, which, if conducted with resolution, seemed to make victory mathematically certain during the coming year. But these calculations were based on the hypothesis that the world would remain substantially as it was in 1914, and that no new factor would enter into the problem. A freak of fortune might still give the enemy a fresh lease of life, and alter the whole character of the war. The position of neutrals had in certain respects changed materially during the past year. Bulgaria had entered the war on the side of central powers. The British blockade had revolutionized the overseas commerce of those powers which still stood aloof from the contest. 
no neutral save Portugal had joined the alliance, but so far as could be judged, no other neutral was likely to join the enemy. Romania was still waiting with a single eye to her own territorial interests, but every mile that Brasilov advanced in the north increased the chance of her intervention on the Allied side. Greece had attempted to play the same game, but in each move had shown a singular folly. Bulgaria's invasion of her territory had roused a national feeling which the court and army chiefs, blinded by the spell of Germany, could neither understand nor in the long run control. Mr. Venizelos, the leader of Greek nationalism, bided his time and watched with shame and melancholy as did all well-wishers of Hellas, the huckstering policy of the Athens government. The Greculus Assurians was not dead. Still, as of old, he tended to be too clever, and, from his absorption in pretty cunning to wreck the greater matters of his own self-interest, Spain remained aloof from the struggle, her hierarchy and the bulk of her upper classes leaning in sympathy towards Germany and the mass of her people favoring the Allies. Holland and the Scandinavian states preserved a strict neutrality, and as the German star grew dimmer, Sweden found lace to admire in her trans-Baltic neighbor. On these states, who were in close proximity to Germany, the restrictions of the British blockade bore very hard. On the whole, they faced the difficulties with good temper and good sense, and their collaboration in the rationing system was of inestimable advantage to the Allies. Switzerland had, perhaps, the hardest fate of all. The war had greatly impoverished her and the two widely different strains in her population kept her sympathies divided between the belligerents. To her eternal honor, she played a diligent and kindly part in facilitating the exchange of prisoners on both sides, and in giving hospitality in her mountain health resorts to the badly wounded. The country which had originated in Red Cross service was faithful to her high tradition in the works of mercy. The attitude of the United States had not altered since we last reviewed it. Her triumph over Germany on the submarine question, real in principle but trivial in results, gave to Mr. Wilson's government a stock of credit in foreign policy which carried them through the summer. America's interest was presently absorbed by her coming presidential election, when Mr. Wilson was to be opposed from the Republican side by Mr. Hughes, assisted by Mr. Roosevelt and the Progressives. This meant that foreign affairs would be considered mainly from the electioneering standpoint. Neither side wished to alienate the German electors. Both sides wished to appear as the champions of American interests. And at the same time, Mr. Wilson, whose trump cards was that he had kept America out of the war, was unwilling to embroil himself with either the Central Powers or the Allies. The British blockade had made some kind of blacklist necessary in order to penalize neutral farms that were found trading with the enemy. This step naturally roused great discontent in America. Much strong language was used, and the president was given drastic powers of retaliation. But till the elections were over, relations with the United States had a certain unreality. Her statesmen were bound to speak and act with one eye on the facts and the other on the hustings. The year had not brought to light any new great figure in the politics or war. This was a war of small men, Herr Zimmerman had observed early in the struggle, and the phrase was true in the main of all the belligerents. Mackensen was probably the best fighting general in the highest command that Germany possessed, and in Falkenhayn and Ludendorff she had two conspicuously able staff officers. Hindenburg was coming to be generally recognized as one of those favorites of fortune who acquire popular repute beyond their deserts. He was a grim and impressive figure, and he could strike a hammer blow, but in professional skill he ranked below more than one of his colleagues. On the Allied side, one reputation had been greatly enhanced. Alexiev, the Russian chief of staff, had shown in the retreat a military genius which it was hard to overpraise. No less remarkable was his judgment during the long winter stagnation, and his power to seize the psychological moment when the hour of the offensive struck. Of the other Russian generals, Yudinich in Transcaucasia and Brasilov in Galicia had increased their fame. 
In the West, a new fighting man had revealed himself in Pettain, whose discretion was as great as his resolution and fiery energy. In civil statesmanship, the French premier, Monsieur Briand, had shown qualities which made him an admirable leader of his nation in such a crisis. His assiduity and passion, his power of conciliation, his personal magnetism, and his great gift of speech enabled him to interpret France to the world and to herself. In Britain, the death of Lord Kitchener had removed the supreme popular figure of the war, the man who played for the British Empire the part of Geoffrey among the French people. He was succeeded at the war office by Mr. Lloyd George, the only British statesman who possessed anything like the same power of impressing the popular imagination. The year had brought one notable discovery. Lord Robert Cecil, the Minister of Blockade, had perhaps the most difficult department in the government, and in it he revealed much of the patience and coolness, the soundness of judgment and the capacity for the larger view which had characterized his father. He now ranked among the foremost of those ministers whose reputation was not measured by parliamentary dialectic or adroitness in party management, but by administrative efficiency and the essentials of statesmanship. But at this stage, to look only at prominent figures was to misread the picture. It was a war of peoples, and the peoples were everywhere greater than their leaders. The battles were largely soldiers' battles, and the civilian effort depended mainly upon the individual work of ordinary folk whose names were unknown to the press. Everywhere in Britain, France, and Italy there was a vast amount of honest efficiency, and on this hung the fortunes of the Allies. Many of the ablest business and professional men were now enlisted in the service of the state. It was the work of middle-class German in production and administration, far more than that of Falkenhayn or Helferich, that kept Germany going, and it was the labor of the same classes among the Allies that enabled them in time to excel the German machine. End of chapter 59, the second year of war, a retrospect, June 28, 1915 to June 28, 1916, part 2. Read by Ahsan Ahmed Mehdi in 4th of August, 2023 in North Sindhi, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Section 14 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 60 Affairs in the Near and Middle East, April 18 to August 25, 1916, Part 1 During the summer of 1916, the Near and Middle East had lost the position which they had held for a little as the center of interest in the World War. While the tides of battle were flowing strongly in Poland and Galicia, in the Trentino and on the Somme, the Transcaucasian, Mesopotamian, and Egyptian theaters, nay, even the Balkan area, tended to be forgotten. But if they lacked the strategic importance which they held a year before, they were nonetheless the scene of much desperate and intricate fighting. For Turkey remained the incalculable and unknown quantity in the strife of the two alliances. Her position dominated alike the Balkan and South Russian battlegrounds, and in her direction Germany looked mainly for those rewards which she was determined at all costs to extract from the struggle. Constantinople, during the summer, again changed its character. Its people seemed to have lost heart in their manifold sufferings and whereas in the spring it would have been dangerous for German troops to parade in its streets, by July only German and Austrian soldiers were visible, since the Turkish infantry had gone east and west to the firing line. The Christian troops of the Ottoman Empire, whom the authorities distrusted, 
were busy fortifying the European side of the Bosporus and erecting defenses at Angora and Konya. The city was congested with thousands of starving refugees. Business was everywhere at a standstill, and the steps taken by the Turkish government to regulate commerce were probably the most perverse and whimsical economic measures ever adopted by a modern state. Towards the end of July, the strain was slightly eased by the arrival of the new harvest from central Anatolia, as well as by the receipt of food supplies from Romania. But in the provinces, things were no better. In Syria, especially, starvation stalked at large through the land. Germany filled the place with her engineers and surveyors and strained every nerve to complete the gaps in the Baghdad line. She made some slight efforts, in her own interest, to fight the cholera which was appearing among the Turkish troops. But for the rest, she plundered the country wholesale and had no eye for anything but her military purpose. Her emissary, well-fed and well-doctored, made his camp everywhere from the Marmora to Jerusalem and worked at his railways and reservoirs, while the wretched country folk, dully resentful of an invasion which they did not comprehend, were dying in thousands at his gates. The fall of Trebizond on the 18th of April left the way open for the advance of the Grand Duke Nicholas through the last ramparts of that mountain land which defended the cornlands of Sibas. The position of Yudinich was precarious. His wings were thrown out well ahead of his center. His right was beyond Trebizond. His left, having occupied Mush in Bitlis, was moving on Diyarbakir, while his center was still fighting its way through the narrow hill glens towards Baiburt and Erzingian. At this moment, the new strength of the Turks had not yet been tried on their opponents. Rebizond had fallen to the efforts of an isolated wing, and it was certain that the troops brought from Gallipoli and those released by the British failure at Kut would make a desperate effort to hold up the Russian advance along the central high roads which led to the Anatolian granary. By the end of May, the Russian front was close on Baiburt on the Trebizond Road, and had occupied Mamakatun, halfway between Erzero and Erzingian. On the last day of the month, a strong Turkish offensive developed in the Baiburt region and on the Erzingian Road, with the result that in the latter area the Russians were forced to evacuate Mamakatun after destroying the bridge. For a month there was a lull in the fighting, and then on 12th July, Yudinich's center again advanced and recaptured Mamakhaton, taking nearly 2,000 prisoners. Three days later, his right center took the important town of Baiburt, and his left wing drove the enemy from his position southwest of Mush. Yudinich pressed on, and by the morning of the 25th was within 10 miles of Erzingian itself. That evening, the Russian cavalry occupied the fortress, the most important gain in this theater since the fall of Trebizond. The ancient Armenian town was the headquarters of the 4th Turkish Corps and had been the advanced base of the enemy in the campaign since the loss of Erzerum. It was on the edge of the hill country and was therefore the last outpost of the Turkish defense in front of the central Anatolian valleys. The enemy replied with a vigorous diversion against the Russian left wing. It began in the early days of August, a fortnight after the fall of Rezingian, at a time when Yudinich's main forces were on his center, and his left wing from Lake Van to Mush and Bitlis was slightly held. From his base at Diyarbakir, the enemy thrust northward against Mush and Bitlis, took the towns, and forced the Russians some thirty miles back to a point not quite fifty miles from Erzerum itself. The danger of the attack was that Erzingian was a hundred miles distant, separated by wild mountains with few communications, and there was a risk that, before reserves could be brought up to the threatened flank, the enemy might win his way to the east of Erzerun, cut the Russian front in two, and drive the halves apart towards the Black Sea and Lake Van. At the same time, the extreme Turkish right, comprising the 4th Division, 
supported by troops from Mush, struck east of Lake Van in the direction of Rayat. The Russian reply came on 18th August, being directed from south of Lake Urmia against Rayat, and from west of Lake Van against Mush in Bitlis. It reached its head on the 25th, when, near Rayat, the 4th Turkish Division was utterly dispersed. Bitlis had already been taken, and that same evening Mush was recaptured. The danger to Erzurum had now gone, the Russian front was reconstituted, and Yudinich resumed his slow movement westward between the Black Sea and the Tigris watershed. Meantime, in western Persia, a curious campaign had been going on during the summer months. In December 1915, a Russian force under General Baratov had entered the country from the north and had driven the mixed levies of Turks, Gendarmerie, and Persian insurgents west through the passes which bordered Mesopotamia. During the early months of 1916, this force, scarcely more than an infantry division in strength, supported by cavalry, had a series of considerable successes. Hamadan was theirs in January, and when Turkish supports arrived from Baghdad and concentrated in the Kermanshah region, Faratov smote them heavily and drove them back through the mountain passes. For three months the bold enterprise prospered well. The Persian loyalists raised their heads, and the rebels lost adherents daily. Sir Percy Sykes arrived at Bandar Abbas in March and proceeded to organize a military police for southern Persia to rid the country of German and Turkish bands and the rebel gendarmerie. On 12th March, Baratov occupied Karind, 50 miles west of Kermanshah and some 64 miles from the Turkish frontier at Kanikin. By 6th May, he was 30 miles nearer Kanikin. By 15th May, he reached the frontier and was less than 120 miles from Baghdad, while 160 miles farther north, another force, which may be regarded as an extension of Yudinich's left wing, captured Rawandus, some 80 miles east of Mosul. Unfortunately, this speed could not be maintained. Baratov's southern force had long and precarious communications behind it, and was out of touch with the main army of the Grand Duke, Nicholas. Even at Kermanshah, it was a full 250 miles from its base at Kaspin. Its bold sally towards the Tigris Valley came too late to turn the tide at Kut, and it all but led to its own undoing. For early in June, Turkey sent reinforcements to the Persian border, and Baratov was steadily driven back. His retreat was as gallant and skillful as his advance. He fell back from Kanikin, and then from Kermanshah, then across the passes, and finally from Hamadan itself. The fires of revolt once more flamed up throughout Persia. Wavering tribesmen went over to the rebel side, and the position of the Shah and his ministers and the various British officers grew daily more difficult. Russia had flown after her generous fashion, to the relief of her ally, and was paying the price of her devotion to the common cause. But before the dark days fell, a bold adventure brought a breath of romance into the tale. A sotnya of Baratov's Cossacks succeeded in joining hands with the British on the Tigris. The incident had little military significance, but it was an exploit requiring supreme audacity and skill. On the night of 8th May, the squadron, consisting of five officers and 110 troopers, left Mahidash, 20 miles west by south of Kermanshah. They rode south through the wild Push Iku hills, crossing passes some of them 8,000 feet high, where the snow still lay deep. They started with three days' rations, and when these were finished, depended on local supplies. So swift was their ride that they met with no opposition except stray shots at long range. The distance to be covered was 180 miles, and they traveled at the rate of 24 miles a day, halting for two and a half days at the court of the Wali of Pushtiku. 
After nightfall on 18th May, they reached the British camp at Ali Garbi, on the Tigris, and were warmly welcomed by our men. The tough horsemen, though their last stage had been thirty miles long, spent the evening with song and dance, and declined to go to bed till the small hours. The day after the arrival of the Cossacks, Gorringe's force made an important advance. On 19th May, the Turks evacuated their position at Beit Asa, on the right bank of the river, a little in rear of the Sana Iyat line, on the left bank. Following up the enemy, Gorinch carried the Dujaila redoubt, the key of the S. Sin position, which Aylmer had assailed in vain on 8th March. Next day, the whole of the southern bank of the Tigris was cleared as far as the Shat el Hai and from the south we were facing Kut, though the other bank was still held by the Turks as far as Sana Giyat. The advance, had it been possible a month before, would have led to Townshend's relief, but now it had no fruitful consequences. Our troops were weary, and suffered much from a temperature which was never less than 100 degrees in the shade. Moreover, the floods were out and would continue well into July. The summer campaign in Mesopotamia resolved itself into a dull and arduous watching of the enemy. But if military operations in the strict sense were thus suspended, a vast deal of work was done by Sir Percy Lake in preparing for the next cold-weather campaign. Two new railways were under construction, the shallows of the river were dredged, and at Basra, Wharves were completed where ocean-going steamers could unload. Embankments were built to protect the main camping grounds at the advanced base against floods. Huts were erected on a large scale, and hospital accommodation was enormously increased. In January 1916, there had been only 4,700 beds. In May, there were over 9,000, and in July, nearly 16,000. In August, Sir Percy Lake relinquished the chief command in Mesopotamia to Lieutenant General F. S. Maud. The beaver-like activity of German engineers on the Baghdad and Syrian railways and the accumulation of stores at various points from Alexandretta to Beersheba presaged still another effort against Egypt and the Suez Canal. The committee and still more its German masters, had never lost the hope of striking at Britain in that vital part, and their ardor grew as the chances of success diminished. The stagnation in Mesopotamia and at Salonika in the early summer enabled certain reserves to be freed for the enterprise, and Germany supervised the preparation of material. For the crossing of the canal and for water transport, reliance was no longer to be placed on floats of kerosene tins. Great tanks and pontoons were brought from Germany by the Baghdad Railway and carted over the gap in the line through the Amanus Mountains. The British commander in Egypt was fully alive to this activity and its meaning and waited with confidence on the issue. The period of waiting was beguiled by a brilliant exploit of our airplanes against the big Turkish aerodrome five miles south of El Arish. On 19th June, 11 machines crossed the hundred miles of desert and bombed the ten hangars. Two were set on fire and wholly destroyed. Four others were hit repeatedly, and at least five enemy airplanes were put out of action. Besides the aerodrome, enemy camps and troops were attacked with bombs and machine gun fire. Preparation was steadily going on for that advance beyond the desert, which was the true defensive policy for Egypt. Meantime, an event had occurred of profound significance for the future of the Muslim world. Arabia had never been truly conquered by the Turks. It had remained the stronghold of the aristocracy of the faith and had, at the best, only tolerated the Turkish guardianship of the holy places, since Turkey was the chief Mahomedan state, and had still the prestige of the conquering days of Islam. But many movements, 
inspired by a desire to return to the old ways, had risen like dust storms amid the sands of the desert. More than a century ago, the Wahhabis had driven the Turks from the holy places, from all Arabia, and even from Kerbala, the Mesopotamian city which holds the tomb of Hussein and is the object of pilgrimage to pious Shias. In 1872, the Turks attempted the conquest of Yemen, but failed, and in those parts the writ of the Sultan never ran. Since 1907, the province of Asir, under Said Idrisi, had been in revolt. In 1913, the great Wahhabi chieftain, Ibn Saud, drove the Turks out of El Hassan, the province of eastern Arabia which borders on the Persian Gulf. The Arab had never wholly bowed to the Osmanli, and once the Osmanli fell under the spell of the unbeliever, it was certain that the conservative theologians of the peninsula would assert themselves. They could not endure to see the shrines of their creed in the hands of men who, daily by word and deed, flouted the mysteries of Islam. On the outbreak of war, the Aga Khan issued a message to Indian Muslims in which he pointed out that, since Turkey had shown herself to be no more than a tool in German hands, she had lost her position as trustee of Islam. The Kaiser's resident will be the real ruler of Turkey and will control the holy cities. The wiser braids in Constantinople had long before the war foreseen trouble with Arabia, and Abdul Hamid, who was no fool, had built the Hejaz railway that he might be able to pour troops southward to meet the first threatenings of revolt. But the new masters were less alert. They contented themselves with vaporings about a jihad, while they continued to outrage every Islamic sanctity and in Syria and Arabia grossly maltreated the Arab population. As against such anarchy, the grim chiefs of southern Arabia looked with friendly eyes towards the Allies. If there could be degrees of merit among unbelievers, the latter were clearly the better friends of the faithful. Both Britain and France ruled over millions of contented Muslims and safeguarded them in the practice of their religion. In November 1914, the government of India had announced that the holy places of Arabia, including the holy shrines of Mesopotamia and the port of Jeddah, would be immune from attack or molestation from the British naval and military forces, so long as there was no interference with pilgrims from India to the shrines in question. And at Britain's request, the governments of France and Russia gave similar assurances. The Grand Sheriff of Mecca was a powerful, perhaps the most powerful, prince of Western and Central Arabia. He was the real ruler of Mecca, and, along with his able sons, the emirs Faisal and Abdullah, exercised a unique authority due to his temporal possessions and his religious prestige as sprung from the blood of the Quraysh. On 9th June, supported by the Arab tribes of the neighborhood, he proclaimed Arab independence of Turkey and took prompt steps to make good his challenge. He occupied Mecca and, with the help of the British Navy, the port of Jeddah, as well as the town of Taif to the southeast, captured the Turkish garrisons, taking in Jeddah alone 45 officers, 1,400 men, and six guns, and laid siege to Medina. He cut and destroyed parts of the Hejaz Railway to prevent reinforcements coming from the north. The revolt spread fast. The emir Nuri Shalan, who had already refused to support Jamal, joined the Grand Sheriff, and presently the Said Idrisi of Asir took up arms and captured the Red Sea port of Kunfida, 150 miles south of Mecca. The policy of the Arab leaders was to refrain from shedding Muslim blood and to invest the Turkish garrisons till they surrendered. On 27th July, Yambo, the port of Medina, fell, and in Medina itself the Turkish troops were closely besieged, while the fires of revolt spread northward among the Arabs all the way to Damascus. 
Constantinople could not sit still under a blow which threatened the little religious prestige that remained to her. Troops were hurried south, and part of the forces destined for the invasion of Egypt were diverted to the new theater of war. The Grand Sheriff had no easy task before him, for he had to fight a modern army with levies whose equipment and discipline belonged to another age. But his action had pricked the bubble of pan-Islamism which Germany had sought to use for her own ends. In August, he issued a striking proclamation to the Muslim world to explain his action. He and the princes of his race, he said, had acknowledged the Turkish government because they desired to strengthen the House of Islam and preserve the rule of the House of Osman. But the Committee of Union and Progress had ground down the true believer, had forgotten the precepts of the Quran, had insulted the caliphate, and had despised the cornerstone of the faith. It was open to all men to see that the rulers of Turkey were Enver Pasha, Jemal Pasha, and Talaat Bey, who were doing whatsoever they pleased. In such a state of things, he could not leave the life and religion of his own Arab people to be the plaything of the godless. God had shown us the way to victory, and has cut off the hand of the oppressors, and cast out their garrison from our midst. We have attained independence from the rest of the Ottoman Empire, which is still groaning under the tyranny of the enemy. Our independence is complete and absolute and will not be affected by any foreign influence or aggression. Our aim is the preservation of Islam and the uplifting of its standard in the world. We fortify ourselves in our noble religion, which is our only guide. In the principles of the administration of justice, we are ready to accept all things in harmony with the faith, and all that leads to the mountain of Islam, and particularly to uplift so far as we have the strength, the mind and spirit of all classes of the people. This we have done according to the dictation of our creed, and we trust that our brethren in all parts of the world will each do the duty that is incumbent upon them, that the Brotherhood of Islam may be confirmed. The Hejaz revolt delayed but did not prevent the attack upon Egypt. This came in the first week of August and was promptly scattered to the winds. Sir Archibald Murray had all his preparations made, and, as was expected, the enemy advanced and followed the old northern route which had been taken before the Katia engagement in April. He knew that we had thinned our forces in Egypt and had sent several divisions to the west, and he hoped to find the desert front weakly held. He was mistaken, for since April the Katia front had been strongly entrenched, admirable communications had been established, and we had advanced our flanking posts in every adjacent oasis. The Turkish force, which included many German officers, was under the command of the German general Kress von Kressenstein and numbered some 18,000 men. It was elaborately equipped with many light mountain batteries, and a great supply of water tanks carried on camels. It hoped, apparently, by timing its attack for the hottest season of the Egyptian summer, to get the benefit of surprise. On the evening of Thursday, 3rd August, the British force, the 52nd Division of Territorials from the Scottish Lowlands, under Major General the Honourable H. A. Lawrence, was drawn up on a line some seven miles long from Romani, 23 miles east of the canal, to the Mediterranean. Its left flank was protected by British monitors in the Bay of Tina, and on the right lay General Chauvel's Australian and New Zealand mounted division. About midnight on the 3rd, the Turks delivered their attack, and the fighting lasted through the whole of the 4th. The lowland infantry stood firm, while the cavalry on the right slowly withdrew, entangling the enemy in a maze of sand dunes. By the afternoon, reinforcements had come up. The Warwickshire and Gloucester Yeomanry, 
and the Brigade of Lancashire Territorials from the 42nd Division. About five o'clock our whole front advanced to the counterattack, and before the dusk fell the enemy line was hopelessly broken. The defeat was soon changed to a rout. From daylight on the 5th our cavalry were harassing the Turkish retreat and sweeping up prisoners and guns. On a wide front, with mounted troops on their flanks, our infantry pressed on through weather that in the daytime was a hundred degrees in the shade. By Monday, the 7th, the fleeing enemy was 19 miles east of the battlefield. On the 9th, he attempted a stand, but was driven on by our cavalry. Then, and not till then, we called a halt and counted our spoils. We had taken some 4,000 prisoners, including 50 officers, and the wounded and dead we estimated at at least 5,000, so that half the total force of the invaders had been accounted for. The action was one of the most successful and conclusive in the campaign. The fighting quality of the Anzac troopers and the British territorials was worthy of their great Gallipoli record, and there could be no higher praise. End of chapter 60, part 1 Read by Maria Angela R. Aragon, Quezon City, 12th of October, 2023Section 15 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 60 Affairs in the Near and Middle East, April 18th through August 25th, 1916. Part 2. 3. But it was in the Balkan Peninsula, and especially in connection with Greece, that outside the main battlegrounds lay the chief preoccupation of the Allies. In the modern world, the state, like the individual, cannot live to itself alone. Nationalism in any robust sense implies internationalism and a hermit people pursuing with complete absorption a domestic purpose is an anachronism destined to a speedy disappearance with the greater and more solidly founded nations this interconnection of interests may lead to a richer civic life since only in cooperation and international fraternity is to be found security for legitimate national development but the smaller states may find in it their undoing. Unable to rank as honorable rivals, they are apt to attach themselves as suitors to some nation or group of nations and to play in interstate policy the part rather of courtiers than of statesmen. The position is inevitable, and it leads to a certain pettiness of international outlook. They do not hope to sway the councils of the world by wealth or armed strength so they seek their advantage by adroitness and diplomacy absorbed in their local ambitions they cannot take the wider view of the future of a continent and being compelled to play by petty methods they become petty in their conception even of their own interests the trees are always before their eyes but the wood escapes their vision greece shared to the full in this drawback of all little peoples and she had other disadvantages due to her past history and her racial character. That she was in a true sense a nation no man could doubt. Her long bondage to Constantinople, her heroic struggle for freedom, her laborious rectification of her borders, her victories in the Balkan Wars, had given her nationhood. But it was a nationhood somewhat narrow and unintelligent in its outlook on affairs beyond its frontiers. She had no very clear ambitions. Turkey was the secular enemy, Bulgaria an ancient rival. The Balkan Wars had given her territorial enlargement towards the north somewhat beyond her deserts, and in Europe her only unrealized aim concerned the boundaries of Epirus and the chameleon-like fortunes of Albania. She aspired to rule all the islands of the Aegean, 
and her wiser citizens remembering ancient hellas looked forward to a great domination of the anatolian coast which had revived the glories of classic ionia but nowhere was there any clearly defined objective such as bulgaria and serbia possessed and in default of a clear aim greece was doomed to a policy of waiting in the hope of snatching some casual advantage from the european conflagration to an impartial observer it seemed that there were two established facts which must dominate the greek outlook one was turkey who was the eternal foe at turkey's expense alone could greece enlarge her boundaries in the one direction where enlargement was possible the second was that greece was a maritime nation trading throughout the whole eastern mediterranean and her obvious alliance was therefore with the great sea powers it would be suicidal if she ever joined a national group which included turkey and arrayed herself against the british navy moreover the german dream of eastern empire was in direct conflict not only with her legitimate aspirations but with her continued national independence these truths were perceived by the abler minds among greek statesmen they were perceived most clearly by monsieur venizelos but they were scarcely present to the nation at large owing partly to an imperfect education in foreign politics and partly to the fact that they were negative things and had not the appeal of a direct territorial objective hence there was no widespread popular conviction to counteract the fatal tendency to trim and hesitate which was the greek tradition in foreign affairs and had become a second nature to the common politician the court at athens had strong german affinities the greek army like most other armies was under the spell of prussian methods and its staff was avowedly dubious as to the allies chances of victory let it be said that the allies had given greece small reason for confidence in their military wisdom the attack on gallipoli had justified most of the greek objections to their policy mesopotamia had not increased their reputation and their efforts in the balkans had failed to avert serbia's destruction not unnaturally with the fate of belgium serbia and montenegro before her eyes greece hesitated to league herself in the field with powers who had so far proved themselves broken reeds for the little nations to lean on in such circumstances the inclination supported by the whole tradition of past policy was to wait till the success of one side in the struggle was beyond question the attitude was not heroic but it is hard to condemn it as unreasonable moreover it must be remembered that to a considerable section of the greek people the larger ideals for which the allies fought had small attraction the country was an incomplete democracy the court had more sympathy with the prussian doctrine than with the liberalism of france and britain russia in occupation of constantinople was a bugbear even to many greeks who otherwise would have been ranged on the allied side the western powers were apt to assume that their own views of the european situation must appeal overwhelmingly to any land that possessed some kind of popular government they forgot the difference that local atmosphere may make in the coloring of facts germany was not slow to take advantage of the uncertain elements in the greek polity her agents worked unceasingly to present the allied case as the effort of powers militarily inferior to cloak a self-seeking purpose with dishonest rhetoric the charge against the government of greece was not that they followed a prudential course and waited for the world is not entitled to demand quixotry from any people it was that when greece's own territorial rights were infringed they still wavered and that they blanketed popular opinion and violated the free constitution of the country an appeal to the people in the summer of nineteen fifteen had restored venizelos to power early in october his proposal to carry out greece's obligations to serbia under her treaty of alliance was vetoed by the king and he was compelled to retire from office thereafter constitutional government disappeared from the peninsula 
irregular elections were held from which the venezuelists abstained and for eight months the land was governed by a camarilla who had no popular sanction and were clearly unrepresentative of the hellenic people greek policy was therefore during this period the policy not of the nation but of a bureaucracy who were legally usurpers worse still the king and his advisers were prepared to sacrifice a portion of greek soil if they were only left in peace the bulgarian occupation of fort rupel on may twenty sixth nineteen sixteen was not the result of superior armed forces but of connivance on the part of the athens government timidity had in this case brought statesmen into naked treason there was no parallel between such an occupation and the permission to serail's army to hold the salonica zone the latter had the assent of the greek people through their constitutional mouthpiece and it was accorded to the powers who had won and guaranteed greece's freedom the former was a gift of territory to an avowed enemy who had always claimed the land and would not willingly depart from what she had once occupied for this new aberration of greek policy the king was mainly responsible king constantine had deserved well of his country and had hitherto enjoyed considerable popular prestige but he was too slight a character for the rough times in which his lot was cast well-meaning and amiable he had a mind incapable of grasping a new and complex situation but tenacious of the small dogmatic stock in trade with which the lesser type of monarch is provided he hankered after the absolutist heir of prussia salubrious to minor royalties and he dreaded the vast and incalculable forces which he felt around him he believed firmly it was the sum of his convictions that germany would win fear was at the root of his attitude fear of the unknown fear of the known in the shape of germany fear of a false step which might cost him his throne fear of everything and everybody and like many another weak soul before him he was as obstinate as he was timid his policy became a kind of fanatical impassivity the surrender of the forts roused in greece a storm of popular protest the venezuelist journals appeared with black borders and among the greeks in salonica there were impassioned demonstrations it was announced that the athens government had protested formally to berlin and sophia but the allied powers were not misled by this device they deemed it necessary to take strong precautionary measures for their position at salonica was impossible with the treacherous government in their rear and on their flank mobilized greek forces who might any hour receive orders hostile to the allied plan on eighth june the british foreign office announced that from seven a m on sixth june certain restrictive orders had been put in force regarding the export of coal to greece and greek shipping in british ports with the object of preventing supplies reaching the enemy the result was virtually a pacific blockade similar to that which had been proclaimed during the salonica dispute in the previous november the allies action gave athens food for reflection greece was at the mercy of the powers which held the sea and the british and french warships at the piraeus were cogent arguments on ninth june monsieur scaludis announced in the chamber a partial demobilization of the army twelve classes would be disbanded and the rest given leave the object being to prove to the allies that the greek government were without aggressive designs but there were elements in the bureaucracy which had no thought of concessions on monday twelfth june the secret police organized a military fete in athens after which bands of hooligans paraded the streets and insulted the allied embassies with complete impunity thereupon the allied governments presented their ultimatum greece in regard to them was not in the position of an ordinary neutral france britain and russia were the protecting powers of the state according to the treaties of eighteen sixty three on which the hellenic liberties were founded and had the right to insist as trustees that these liberties were not infringed and that their ward was not plotting mischief they were in the strictest sense the guarantors of the hellenic commonweal 
and the king, though they had chosen to make the throne hereditary, was their agent, put there to give effect to the wishes of the Greek nation. If he chose to neglect his task, it was the duty, as well as the right of the trustee powers, to call him sharply to order. The Allied note, after reciting the offenses of the Greek government, demanded an immediate and real demobilization of the Greek army, the installation of a new ministry which should give guarantees for benevolent neutrality, the dissolution of the chamber, followed by new elections and the dismissal of certain police officials. On 21st June, it was announced that the premier, Monsieur Skaloudis, would retire and that his place would be filled by Monsieur Zamus, a friend of the Allies, who had succeeded Monsieur Venizelos on October 4th, 1915. That day, on behalf of the king, the new prime minister accepted the Allied demands and set about forming that business cabinet devoid of any political prejudices for which the note had stipulated. So far the situation seemed easier, but it was a false peace. Baron Schenk and the other German agents were as busy as ever, and among the disbanded soldiers the royalists formed reservist leagues, which were openly anti-popular and anti-ally. The one hope lay in the promised appeal to the people, for it was certain that fresh elections after demobilization would restore Monsieur Venizelos to power. But events were soon to happen which made an appeal to the electorate impossible. The military situation at Salonica during June and the first half of July showed little change from that of the early summer. The Bulgarian raid of May had given the forts of Rupel and Dragutin the keys of the Struma Valley. During May, the Austro-German troops were for the most part withdrawn from the Salonica front, being urgently needed elsewhere. The center army was indeed still known as the 11, German army under General von Winkler, but it contained at the most one German division. The right wing was held by the Bulgarian one army under Gweshov, and the left wing by the Bulgarian two army under Todorov. These three parts of the enemy force corresponded to the three natural divisions of the front. The zone west of the Vardar, where lay the road to Monaster, was mainly mountainous, that between the Vardar and the Struma, a plain crisscrossed by low hills, till the Belashitsa range was reached north of Lake Duaren. The eastern zone was mountainous in the north and guarded from the sea by coastal ranges. The Allied battlefront was held on the right by the main British contingent under General Milne, the center by the French and the British left wing, and the western zone, the hundred miles between the Vardar and Albania by the Serbian army, which had now taken its position in the line. The dispositions were wise, for they gave Monaster as the objective to the men of the Crown Prince Alexander, who at the end of July assumed the command and so brought them at once within view of the frontiers of their native land. On the extreme left, an Italian force, based on Avlona, was preparing to strike through Albania as a covering detachment on the flank, and an Italian contingent was also present with the Serbians. The whole composite Allied army was still numerically smaller than the Bulgarian and German forces opposed to them, and the latter had every advantage of position. As we have seen in an earlier chapter, to advance from Salonica was no easy task. A certain gain of ground could be achieved at once, and as a matter of fact was achieved during the summer, when the Allied center pushed north to a line a little south of Dwaran Station. The enemy had not drawn in close to the Salonica defenses, but had kept his front on a wide semicircle, commanding the entrance to the difficult part of the Vardar Valley. The Vardar and Struma routes were alike almost impracticable as avenues to the heart of Bulgaria. Only on the west was there any reasonable objective, and Monaster could not be taken without hard and difficult campaigning. Its importance lay not in its strategic so much as its political value. It lay in an isolated pocket among mountains and gave no ready access 
to the central Serbian terrain. But its possession had been one of Bulgaria's chief objects in entering the war, and its loss would undoubtedly so exasperate the Bulgarian people that they might well prove refractory to Germany's orders. The true meaning, however, of the Allied activity was to be found in connection with the Romanian situation. The government of Bucharest was now committed to the Allied cause, and in order to protect Romania's mobilization against Austria, it was necessary to make certain that Bulgaria did not strike first upon her flank. The object of the Allies was, therefore, to hold as large a Bulgarian force as possible on the line between Ostrovo and the Gulf of Orfani. Their principal purpose would be achieved if they detained the bulk of the Bulgarian army, even though their advance were inconsiderable. Sarail, who was now in command of the whole Allied forces in the Balkans, was perplexed with contradictory orders. On 15th July, he was told to occupy the attention of the Bulgarians at once. Then he was bidden wait until three days after the signature of the agreement with Romania. On the morning of 10th August, the French heavy guns began a bombardment of the town of Douarin, 35 miles west-northwest of Salonika, close to the junction of the Greek, Bulgarian, and Serbian frontiers. Next day, the French troops occupied Touaren Station on the salonika saris Railway and a height south of the town. Dolgeli, southwest of Douaren, was presently carried, and then, on 15th August, the situation was completely changed, for the enemy himself took the offensive. The movement had no direct connection with the Romanian crisis. It was sanctioned by Falkenhayn to enable the Bulgarian left wing to push forward to the same latitude as that of the right and so shorten the line. The demobilization of the Greek army made the plan practicable. On 17th August, the Bulgarians struck in three sectors, and their main effort was very properly on their flanks. They did not contemplate a frontal attack on Salonika, but they believed that they could count on an easy advance in the two flanking wedges of Greek territory defended nominally by greek troops the more especially as the occupation of fort rupel had given them the key of the lower struma and kavala on the east todorov flung patrols across the mesta east of kavala and pushed south and west towards the left bank of the struma in the center winkler attacked the french and british at dolgeli but failed to advance in the west Gweshoff, occupied florina a little town in greek territory seventeen miles south of monastir which was held by serbian outposts and advanced upon banitza west of the ostrovo lake during the next few days the center stood fast around Dvoren, and the serbians in the west retiring slowly towards ostrovo held the enemy in check and inflicted considerable losses but east of the struma todorov moved swiftly towards kavala and on the 19th was within seven miles of the town. French and British detachments were east of the Struma as far as the railway south of Demir Hisar, but the Kavala area was held only by Greek troops who were without instructions. Bulgaria saw her way to an easy triumph, much needed for domestic comfort at the expense of her southern neighbor and with the connivance of that neighbor's king. Presently, Todorov was on a line two miles east of the Struma, between lakes Tahinos and Bukova, while the Allies held the main bridges. Benitsa was now in Bulgarian hands, but the line west of Lake Ostrovo was stoutly maintained, and farther north, in the Moglina Mountains, the Crown Prince Alexander made good progress toward the Cerna Valley. Meanwhile, on the east, Todorov was advancing on Ceres and was at the gates of Kavala. On 25th August, the Bulgarians occupied the forts of the latter town and were shelled by British warships. The occupation was a breach of a direct promise given to Greece by Germany at the opening of hostilities. These events complicated beyond hope the already sufficiently complex position in Greek politics. Eastern Macedonia was largely in Bulgaria's hands, and the question of the fate of the Greek troops there, more than two divisions, 
was fraught with extraordinary difficulty the greek people were beginning to stir a fort or two might be overlooked but now they had lost a province and lost it without striking a blow the athens government in their perplexity hastened to conciliate the allies dusmanis the chief of staff was dismissed and his place taken by general Mashapoulis, the commander of the third corps at salonica and a friend of france and britain but the problem could not be solved by the sacrifice of a staff officer the general election on which alone a true settlement depended could not take place when a large district was occupied by the enemy and the position of the greek troops in the occupied territory must lead to a split in the army itself it looked as if the greek situation was approaching the point when relief could only be won by some act of revolution at this moment when the whole balkan front was astir and the greek government were fixed on the horns of a dilemma roumania entered the war on the allied side end of chapter sixty part two section sixteen of a history of the great war volume three the beleaguered forest continued and the great salads this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a history of the great war volume three by john buchan chapter sixty one roumania enters the war August 4th, 1914, to September 1st, 1916, Part 1. During two years of war, Romania, under great difficulties and amid manifold temptations, had steered a course of strict neutrality. Did the resolution come to at the Crown Council of August 4th, 1914, she had scrupulously adhered. The first Russian successes in Galicia had appeared to sway her towards the Allies, but the Russian retreat in the summer of 1915 corrected the balance. Italy's entrance into the war shook her, and the alliance of Bulgaria with Germany and the Serbian debacle for a moment seemed about to force her to draw the sword, whether she willed it or not. War is a maelstrom into which the most resolute neutral may be drawn, and during the early summer of 1916, it became apparent to the world that both external and internal pressure would soon force the court of Bucharest to cast in its lot with one or other of the belligerent sides. Brusilov's resounding successes in the north brought the moment of decision very nigh. Romania was only indirectly a Balkan state, and her situation, half Latin, half Slav, as an outpost to the west at the gateway of the east, gave the little country at this crisis of the war a profound significance. The territory inhabited mainly by the Romanian people, if constituted into a national state, would have formed a square block based upon the lower Danube, and embracing the actual Romania, the Austrian district of Bukovina, the Hungarian province of Transylvania, and the Russian province of Bessarabia. It was the ancient Dacia, conquered by Trajan, and lost to Rome early in the barbarian invasions. But so strong had been the impress of that mighty power that the tradition of Rome continued. The Romanians had in their veins, along with a large Slav admixture, the blood of the old Roman colonists, and their speech was still in its essentials a Romance tongue. Romania, as the world knew it, consisted of two provinces widely different in character, into which projected from the west the wedge of Transylvania. The eastern, Moldavia, watered by the streams of the Prut and Sarath, was a region of black steppe earth, highly fertile, which made it one of the granaries of Europe. The western Wallachia lay between the southern Carpathians and the Danube, the northern part being a broad upland sloping from the hills, and the southern, the alluvial plain of the river. Both provinces were rich in agricultural, pastoral, and mineral wealth. The medieval history of Wallachia and Moldavia was the tale of border states between the Turk, the Hungarian, and the Slav, a tangled tale of savage and incessant war. 
In 1241, the Principate of Wallachia was founded by the first feudal army which crossed the Carpathians. Then came the Turkish conquest, and the land became part of the Turkish Empire. But the province was ruled after the Turkish fashion, with a measure of autonomy by local chiefs. Now and then patriots arose, such as Stephen the Great and Michael the Brave, who raised fleeting standards of independence and were on the verge of founding a Romanian nation. In a country so situated, it was inevitable that the system should be aristocratic. The government was in the hands of the great landowners, the boyars, who were partly a native and partly a fanariate, that is, Byzantine Greek origin, and the peasants tilled the soil as serfs. These boyars elected the princes, who ruled the provinces as feudatories of Turkey, and held their office on a seven years' tenure. Till 1821, the Hospodars, or princes, were mainly Fanariots, but after that day came a succession of native rulers and a new consciousness of nationality. The modern history of Romania began with the War of 1828-9 and the Treaty of Andriopol, when the provinces passed under the suzerainty of Russia, and the Hospodars, being now elected for life, began to change from the chiefs of a nationality to something of the status of kings. The country shared in the European Democratic Movement of 1848, when a revolution broke out under C.A. Rossetti and the two Bradianus, a revolution which was quickly suppressed and led to the re-establishment of the power of the boyars. During the Crimean War, Russia occupied Romania, but evacuated after the successful resistance of the Turks on the Danube, and it was held by Austria under an agreement with France and Britain. The Treaty of Paris in 1856 re-established the Turkish Suriente, but granted a form of autonomy to the two provinces under elected princes chosen for life. A strong movement began for national union, and in 1859, Colonel Kuza was elected prince of both Moldavia and Wallachia, the first ruler of United Romania. Turkey accepted the situation on condition that Prince Kosa had a separate ministry and administration for each province. In 1861, he established a common ministry and an assembly of representatives at Bucharest, and in the following year the union of the principalities was sanctioned by the Sultan, and modern Romania came into being. Prince Kosa was a vigorous ruler, who introduced democratic reforms by the methods of despotism, but had little skill in handling the machinery of politics and party government. The people at large were on his side, but the ruling classes, who formed the liberal and conservative parties, would have none of him. The conservatives objected to his new land law, which abolished serfdom, and to his introduction of universal suffrage, and the liberals, whatever they thought of his measures, disapproved of the means by which he enforced them. The national finances fell into confusion, and a revolution, supported by the army, drove him to abdicate in 1866. The Romanians, looking round for a successor, applied first to Count Philip of Flanders, the brother of Leopold, king of the Belgians. On his refusal, the principality was offered mainly on the advice of Napoleon III, to a prince of the Catholic branch of the Hohenzollerns, Charles of Hohenzollern Sigmaringen, whose sister was the wife of Philip of Flanders and the mother of King Albert of Belgium. Charles accepted and was installed at Bucharest on May 22, 1866, recognized by Turkey and adopted by a specially summoned constitutional assembly. The same assembly drew up a constitution which, with a few emendations, introduced later, was that of modern Romania. Prince Carol, to adopt the Romanian version of his name, proved a wise and efficient ruler. He introduced order into finances, developed the railway system in the Danube ports, and started his country, hitherto very backward, on a new era of prosperity. Not unnaturally, he leaned heavily on Germany, and it was German capital and German advisers that he used in his reforms, 
Ali took Bismarck as his mentor in external politics. Following the advice of that far-seeing statesman, he kept on good terms with Russia, since through Russia alone could come the realization of his dream of true independence. Meantime, he set to work to give the country a modern army. The old provinces had never had more than a rude kind of militia, and Prince Carroll found the existing forces badly armed and disciplined. Himself an ex-officer of the Prussian Guard, he introduced the Prussian system of organization, increased the numbers, and drew upon Krupp for a new artillery. With an efficient army at his back, he waited on his chance to use it. The chance came with the Russo-Turkish War of 1877. On 24th April of that year, he signed a military convention with Russia, granting, with the connivance of Austria, free passage to the Russian army through Romania, which thus became the advance base for the invasion of Turkey. A month later, on 22nd May, he declared his independence of the port. After the first Russian failure at Plevna, he crossed the Danube with 30,000 men and greatly distinguished himself on the northern front. In the grand assault on Plevna, on 11th September, the Romanians carried number one Gravitsa Redoubt, the only one of the Turkish works which was stormed and permanently held. For such service, Romania looked for an adequate reward but the results were below her expectations and her deserts. The Congress of Berlin did, indeed, recognize her complete independence, but with territorial changes which deprived the gift of much of its charm. That part of Bessarabia which Russia had ceded to Moldavia under the Treaty of Paris was restored to the Russian Empire, though it had a large Romanian population. As compensation, Romania received the bulk of the Turkish province of the Dobrudja, whose treeless steppes and riverine swamps seemed a poor exchange for the rich Bessarabian plains. The result was an abiding grudge against Russia, her old ally in the field. In 1881, Prince Kara was proclaimed king, and in spite of the secular grievance of Transylvania, the country began to trend towards a rapprochement with Austria-Hungary. The common people were vehemently anti-Hungarian, and among the politicians the extreme right was Russophile, and the extreme left Francophile. But the bulk of the aristocracy and the middle classes were in favor of the policy of the king. In 1883 a meeting took place with Bismarck and the Austrian Count Kalnoki, and a secret agreement was concluded, under which the Romanian army and certain contingencies was to be at Austria's disposal. Romania had become a real, if publicly unacknowledged, member of the Triple Alliance. Under the aegis of the king, the Austro-German influence spread and ramified during the succeeding thirty years. To understand Romania's position on the outbreak of the European War, it is necessary to remember her territorial ambitions, her economic interests, and the state of it or internal politics. These three elements conditioned the problem which faced her statesmen and the diplomatists of Europe from August 1914 to the beginning of August 1916. The difficulty of all the small countries of southeastern Europe, as we have already seen, was that their territorial did not correspond to their racial boundaries. The Turkish wars had dislocated the natural frontiers of races, and each state some numbers of her own nationals, under an alien and frequently oppressive rule. The unredeemed areas of Romania were Transylvania and Bessarabia, notably the former. Under the dual monarchy, in the Bukovina, in the Banat of Tensevar, and above all in Transylvania, lived some four millions of Romanian blood. Transylvania had been handed over to Hungary, by Francis Joseph in 1867, and though the government of Budapest, the following year, bound themselves to respect the rights, language, and religion of their Romanian subjects, Hungarian nationalism speedily made the pact a dead letter. The Romanian schools were magyarized, the language proscribed, and the elections gerrymandered. On a base of population, 
the Romanians should have had 69 representatives in the Hungarian parliament. They never had more than 14, and in 1910 were reduced to five. The Romanians of Transylvania, penalized and discontented, appealed naturally to their kinsfolk across the mountains, and the appeal did not fall on heedless ears. A new state is sensitively conscious of its racial affiliations, and the case of the Romanians in Transylvania and the flocks in Macedonia profoundly affected popular opinion. Kings and cabinets may follow a course of enlightened opportunism and make alliances with ancient foes, but the common people think in simpler terms and have longer memories. Leagues were established in the Romanian capital to watch over the interests of their nationals beyond the frontier, and though this popular feeling might remain long quite essent, there was always the chance that at the moment of crisis it might break into flame and destroy the work of a passionless diplomacy. Romania had, therefore, causes of grievance against both Russia and Austria-Hungary. She had, too, a natural ambition to enlarge her territories so as to make them correspond to racial distribution. Finally, as the years passed, she began to realize the strategic value of her geographical position. As the far-reaching policy of the Central Powers slowly took shape, it was obvious that Romania, on the flank of the drank knock Austin, acquired a peculiar significance. Her alliance would safeguard on the north that route to Constantinople, which was the pilgrim's way of German dreams. If Russia again was ever to secure her desires and control the exits, from the Euxine to the Aegean, Romanian friendliness would be an invaluable aid. Finally, whatever course Balkan politics might take, whether in the direction of union or of continued rivalry, the land north of the Danube must play a vital part. At the same time, Romania well understood that her strategic assets were also strategic disadvantages. In a quarrel with her powerful neighbors, she offered too many avenues for assault. It behooved her, therefore, to go warily and take no step without due thought, for only by circumspection could she hope to win her national ambitions and avoid what was never outside the sphere of the possible, national dissolution. These considerations affected Romanian action in the first great crisis that faced her after the War of 1877, the two Balkan Wars. She refused to join the Balkan League, having no particular grievance against Turkey, while on Macedonian question she had never seen eye to eye with Greece and Bulgaria. She contented herself with warning the belligerents that she could not permit any of them to become predominant in the Balkans, and mobilized her army to watch events. When Bulgaria's sudden attack on her former allies precipitated the Second Balkan War, Romania was forced to act. The event had been foreseen, and a provisional arrangement had been made with Serbia and Greece. To the world at large, it looked as if King Carol's conduct was based merely on the desire to fish in troubled waters. But in reality, there were sound reasons of policy behind it. Bulgaria had upset all hopes of a Balkan equilibrium as a result of the First War and her success would give her a Balkan hegemony, most dangerous to Romanian interests. It was Russia who took the severest view of Bulgarian wrongdoing, and King Carol consulted and secured the ascent of Petrograd before he intervened. He crossed the Danube at two points, occupied Silistria, threatened Sofia, and received as his reward a larger slice of the Dobrogea. This meant a rift in the thirty years old Entente with Austria, a rift widened by Hungarian intransigence over Transylvania, which was now deeply concerning the Romanian people. It meant, too, increasingly friendly relations with Russia, and there was talk of a marriage between the Crown Prince's eldest son and the daughter of the Tsar. But King Carol did not allow the estrangement from Austria to affect his friendship with Austria's senior partner. Telegrams were exchanged between him and the German emperor, in which the latter was thanked as the only begetter of peace. The situation, therefore, on the eve of the Great War, was that politically Romania had long leaned 
to the Central Powers and had been a virtual member of the Triple Alliance, but that during 1913 and the early months of 1914, though her friendliness to Germany continued, relations with Austria were becoming strained, while Bucharest and Petrograd were once again feeling their way towards cooperation and understanding. The real center of Teutonic influence in Romania was to be found less in statecraft and diplomacy than in the sphere of finance and commerce. King Carol, in calling upon Germany for aid in developing his land, had, like the housewife in the fairy tale, invoked a sprite which could not easily be laid. From the early 80s, Germany had set herself resolutely to capture Romanian trade. She and Austria soon secured the lion's share of imports. Her agents were in every town. She controlled the chief industries. By long credit and goods exactly suited to the market, she ousted both native and foreign competitors, and she made use of the large German-Jewish section of the commercial community to further her ends. The Deutsche Bank and the Discontal Gesellschaft established themselves and financed all new undertakings, as well as floating government loans. Presently, Romania's public debt was largely in German hands. Germany built the railways and improved the ports. She ousted British and American financiers from the control of the great oil fields. All the electrical industries were in her charge, and the rich forests were largely in her power. These successes were won by genuine enterprise and the most painstaking assiduity. She had consuls to watch her interests in every center, and if a foreign merchant wished a reliable report on some Romanian question, he was compelled to go for it to German sources. Such a condition of things could not have come about had there not been reasons for it in the economics of Romania's position. She was a non-industrial country, whose exports must always be mainly raw materials, mineral and agricultural. She therefore needed a highly industrialized country as her chief customer. She could not find this in Turkey or the Balkan states, or in Russia, who was herself in a like position. The natural trade channels ran westward toward Austria and Germany. Hence, there was a reason for keeping on good terms with the central powers far stronger than any treaty a reason based on the livelihood of the humblest citizen. They represented for Romania her bread and butter. A breach would only come if a crisis arose so tremendous that prudential considerations were forgotten, or an ally was found who could provide her with a more excellent way of life. But the feeling of the people, in which the various problems of foreign policy and economics are reflected, and by which they are ultimately decided, we must look to the condition of Romanian politics from the accession of King Carol onwards. The traditional parties were the Liberals and the Conservatives, the Reds and the Whites, representing respectively the trading and professional classes and the landed aristocracy. At the beginning of King Carol's reign, the National Liberals, under the elder Bretiano, were in power, and it was the Liberal Prime Minister who had played a chief part in affecting the Austrian alliance of 1883. During his 12 years' term of office, he aimed at extending the area of government control and building up a bureaucracy. Among the conservatives, a group of Tory Democrats, called Junimists, arose, including men like Karp, Marcherescu, and Magellanen, who stood for individual liberty and were, on the whole, more democratic than any section of the liberal ranks. From 1891 onward, the opposition between the two tended to become stereotyped and artificial, the ordinary game of the ins and outs. But in 1910, when the younger Bretiano became head of the Liberal Party, the Conservatives woke into life under Taki Janescu, revived the old creed of the Tory Democrats. The cabinet which conducted the war with Bulgaria had a Junimist, Majorescu, as premier, and two others, Taki Janoscu and Marga Lohmann, as members. It fell from power in 1914, largely through its failure to secure any concessions from Hungary on the subject of Transylvania, and the liberals, 
under Bretiano, took office with large majorities in both chambers. So far, there was no serious division between the parties on the question of foreign policy. The national liberals, representing largely the commercial classes, were well alive to the value, and indeed the necessity, of the Austro-German connection. Among the conservatives, the Junimists were mainly pro-German, especially the leaders, Karp, Marga Lohmann, and Marcherescu. Of the old conservatives, men like Philipsku and Loharvery had leanings toward Russia and a deep friendship for France. Taki Janoscu stood by himself. He was convinced that great events were preparing, and he looked further into the future than his colleagues. He envisioned a situation in which Romania's course must be determined on other grounds than the traditional attachments of politicians. On the eve of war, we may say that the general tendency of the politicians was conservative, to cling to the old Teutonic alliance, but that of the Balkan wars and the growing friendliness with Russia had somewhat weakened that alliance. They were for the most part in the mood to judge a new situation on its merits, and followed that tradition of real politics which forty years before King Carol had learned from Bismarck. End of chapter 61, part 1